Dreamscape presents The Secret Lives of Introverts Inside Our Hidden World by Jen Graneman Narrated by Susie Bernice Introduction Dear Introvert One of my earliest memories as a little girl is my dad putting a microphone to my lips and asking me to tell a story. Okay, I thought, this should be easy. I had been telling stories to myself already in my mind each night before I fell asleep, even though I was too young to read or write. I closed my eyes and imagined a horse who played with her friends in a sunny meadow. Like many introverted children, my inner world was vivid and alive. The made-up story seemed almost as real as the actual world around me of toys and parents and pets. The horse and her friends were having a race to see who was the fastest. They dashed through fields of flowers and jumped over a glistening creek when all of the sudden one of them started to flap her tiny hidden wings and fly. Suddenly my dad interrupted my thoughts. You have to say your story out loud, he said, nodding to the microphone, so I can record it. I looked at the microphone, then back at my dad, but I didn't know how to respond. The things inside me had to be spoken? How could mere words describe the striking images I saw in my mind and how they made me feel? Sensing my hesitancy, my dad prompted again. Just say what you're thinking, he said, as if that were the easiest thing in the world. But I couldn't. I continued to stare at my dad in silence. The secret world inside me would not come out. My dad grew impatient, probably thinking his only daughter was being stubborn, uncreative. The truth was I had no idea how to translate my inner experience into words. Somehow, I thought that with my father's supreme intelligence, he would just know what I meant to say. But he couldn't read my thoughts, and the microphone attached to the primitive 80s tape recorder couldn't hear them. Eventually, he gave up and put everything away. This would not be the last time in my life that my silence confused and frustrated someone. I would carry that feeling of disconnect between my inner world and the outer one with me for much of my life. If you're an introvert like me, you may have secrets inside you, too. You have thoughts that you don't have the words to express and big ideas that no one else sees. Maybe your secret is you feel lonely even when you're surrounded by other people. Perhaps you're doing certain things and acting a certain way only because you think you're supposed to. Maybe your heart longs for just one person to see the real you and to know what's really going on inside your head. This is a book about secrets. It's about seeing what's really going on with introverts. It's about finally feeling understood. Thank you for joining me in this journey. If you have a secret like the one I just described, I hope you will feel less alone about it after listening to this audiobook. Quietly yours, Jen. Chapter 1 This is for all the quiet ones. When I was in sixth grade, I was lucky enough to be scooped up by a great group of girls who would become my lifelong friends. We slept over at each other's houses and whispered secrets in the dark. We spied on the boy who lived in the neighborhood and his friends and giggled over who we had crushes on. We filled notebook after notebook with our dreams for the future. We even promised to reunite every 4th of July as adults on a hill by our high school so we would always have a place in each other's lives. Anyone looking at us would have thought I was just one of the girls. We did almost everything together. People even said we looked like sisters. But deep down, I felt different. 
I wasn't one of them. I was other. While they read Seventeen magazine and chatted about celebrities, I sat silently on the edges, wondering if there was life on other planets. When they were relieved that another school year was over and that summer vacation had begun, I was catapulted into a deep existential crisis about growing older. When they wanted to hang out all night, and then the next day, and then the next, I was desperately searching for an excuse to be alone. Mom, tell them I'm sick, or that I have to go to church. In so many little ways, I was the weird one. My friend group was the center of my teenage world. I loved them. So I did what anyone does when they feel like they're an alien dropped into this world from another planet. At times, I pretended. I kept my secret thoughts to myself. I didn't let on when I wished I could be alone in my bedroom instead of at the mall surrounded by people. I tried to be the person I thought I should be, fun-loving and always ready to hang out. All that pretending got exhausting. But I did it because I thought that's what everyone else was doing, pretending. I figured they were just a lot better at hiding their true feelings than I was. There must be something wrong with me. As an adult, I still couldn't shake the feeling of being different. I worked as a journalist for a few years, then went back to school to become a teacher, thinking this would be more meaningful work. My graduate program was full of outgoing would-be teachers who always had something to say. They sat in little groups on breaks, bursting with energetic chatter, even after we'd just spent hours doing collaborative learning or having a group discussion. I, on the other hand, bolted for the door on breaks as quickly as possible. My head was spinning from all the noise and activity, and my energy level was at zero. Also, talking in front of our class or answering a question on the spot was no problem for them. I, however, avoided the spotlight as much as possible. Whenever I had to present a lesson plan, I felt compelled to practice exactly what I was going to say until I got it perfect. Even then, I usually couldn't keep my hands from shaking. I had also gotten married. My husband, now ex-husband, was a confident, life-of-the-party guy who could talk to anyone. His large family was the same way. They loved spending time together in a loud gaggle of kids, siblings, and friends of the family. Often they'd drop by our small apartment, letting me know they were coming only when they were already on their way. They'd pass hours crammed into the living room, telling stories, cracking jokes, and volleying sarcastic remarks back and forth with the professional finesse of Venus and Serena Williams. I, once again, sat quietly on the edges, never knowing how to wedge myself into these fast-moving conversations or what to say. As the night wore on, I often found myself slipping into an exhausted brain fog, which made it even harder to participate. Most nights, what I really wanted was to read a book alone, play a video game, or just be with my husband. When comparing myself to my extroverted in-laws and classmates, I never seemed to measure up. My disparaging thoughts returned. Why couldn't I just loosen up and go with the flow? Why did I never have much to say when I was in a big group, but had plenty to talk about during a one-on-one? -on -one? Why was my idea of a good time so different from what other people wanted to do? I was broken. I had to be. Things didn't look like they would ever get better. At one point, I had a complete breakdown. I found myself awake in the middle of the night, frantically crying, typing everything that was wrong with me and my life into a Word document. I just couldn't take it anymore. I was too different, too messed up. The world was too much, too loud, too harsh. I think finally expressing all the secret feelings that had built up inside me, in a raw, unfiltered way, saved me. When I reread what I had written, I realized I couldn't keep living this way. Somehow I made it through that terrible night. Soon after, 
I discovered something about myself that changed my life. One Magic Word Introvert One afternoon in the psychology self-help section of a used bookstore, I came across a book called The Introvert Advantage by Marty Olson Laney. I bought it and read it cover to cover. When I finished, I cried. I had never felt so understood in my life. That beautiful book told me there was a word for what I was. Introvert. It was a magic word because it explained many of the things I had struggled with my entire life. Things that had made me feel bad about myself. Best of all, the word meant I wasn't alone. There were other people out there like me. Other introverts. Say what you will about labeling. That little label changed my life. I went on to read everything about introversion I could get my hands on. I read Quiet by Susan Cain, Introvert Power by Lori Helgow, The Introvert's Way by Sophia Dembling, and others. I became interested in personality type and high sensitivity, too. Turns out I'm not just an introvert, but also a highly sensitive person. But I'll leave that topic for another time. After reading dozens of books about introversion, I turned to the Internet. I joined Facebook groups for introverts and pored over blogs. My friends got sick of me constantly talking about introversion. Did you know it's an introvert thing to need time to think before responding? I'd say. Or, I can't go out tonight. It's introvert time. I couldn't shut up about being an introvert. It was like I had been reading the wrong script my entire life, trying to play the role of the person I thought I should be not the person I truly was. Don't get me wrong. Learning about my introversion didn't fix all my problems. It would take several years of hard inner work, along with consciously deciding to make real changes in my life, before things got better. But for me, embracing my introversion and stopping myself from trying to pretend to be an extrovert was the first step. As I learned more about introversion, I became more confident in who I was. I started accepting my need for alone time. I saw my quiet, reflective nature as a strength, not a liability. I also started working on my social skills, seeing them as simply that, skills I could improve and use to my advantage. But most important, for the first time in my life, I started to actually like myself. I was no longer an other. I was something else an introvert. Now I'm on a mission. Today I'm the voice behind Introvert Dear, the popular online community for introverts. I never set out to be an advocate for introverts, but when something changes your life, you want to tell other people about it. I started Introvert Dear as my personal blog in 2013. At the time, I was working as a teacher living with roommates, and truly dating for the first time in my adult life. I decided I would chronicle my life as an introvert, living in a society that seems geared toward extroverts. I kept my blog anonymous so I could write whatever I wanted without fearing what other people would think. So very introverted of me. For my bio, I used a picture of just my shoulder that showed off a tattoo of five birds I had just gotten. My face was mostly hidden. Staring at my computer screen, alone in my bedroom one night, I named my little blog Introvert Dear. I imagined a wise, older, introverted woman counseling a younger, introverted woman. The young woman was lying on a chaise lounge, and the older woman was sitting in a chair nearby. The kind of setup you see in movies when someone goes to a therapist. The older one began her advice to the younger one by saying, Now, introvert, dear. The first blog post I wrote got more comments about my tattoo than anything actually related to what I'd written. But I kept writing, mostly just for myself, and people kept reading. I didn't know it then, but Introvert Dear was another step in my journey toward healing. Once again, expressing myself honestly relieved some of the pain I was feeling. And connecting with other introverts made me feel less self-conscious about my weird ways. Today, Introvert Deer is less of a blog and more of an online publishing platform. It features not just my voice, 
but hundreds of introvert voices, and it brings together introverts from all over the world. My writing about introverts has been featured in publications like the Huffington Post, Thought Catalog, Susan Cain's Quiet Revolution, The Mighty, and others. Now I'm on a mission to let introverts everywhere know it's okay to be who they are. I don't ever want another introvert to feel the way I did when I was younger. Are you an introvert? What about you? Have you always felt different? Were you the quiet one in school? Did people ask you, why don't you talk more? Do they still ask you that today? If so, you might be an introvert like me. Introverts make up 30 to 50 percent of the population, and we help shape the world we live in. We might be your parent, friend, spouse, significant other, child, or co-worker. We lead, create, educate, innovate, do business, solve problems, charm, heal, and love. Introversion is a temperament, which is different from your personality. Temperament refers to your inborn traits that organize how you approach the world, while personality can be defined as the pattern of behavior, thoughts, and emotions that make you an individual. It can take years to build a personality, but your temperament is something you're born with. But the most important thing to know about being an introvert is that there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken because you're quiet. It's okay to stay home on a Friday night instead of going to a party. Being an introvert is a perfectly normal thing to be. Are you an introvert? Here are 22 signs that you might veer toward introversion on the spectrum. How many do you relate to? These signs may not apply to every introvert, but I believe they are generally true. 1. You enjoy spending time alone. You have no problem staying home on a Saturday night. In fact, you look forward to it. To you, Netflix and chill really means watching Netflix and relaxing. Or maybe your thing is reading, playing video games, drawing, cooking, writing, knitting tiny hats for cats, or just lounging around the house. Whatever your preferred solo activity is, you do it as much as your schedule allows. You feel good when you're alone. In your alone time, you're free. 2. You do your best thinking when you're alone. Your alone time isn't just about indulging in your favorite hobbies. It's about giving your mind time to decompress. When you're with other people, it may feel like your brain is too overloaded to really work the way it should. In solitude, you're free to tune into your own inner monologue rather than paying attention to what's going on around you. You might be more creative and or have deeper insights when you're alone. 3. Your inner monologue never stops. You have a distinct inner voice that's always running in the back of your mind. If people could hear the thoughts that ran through your head, they may in turn be surprised, amazed, and perhaps horrified. Whatever their reaction might be, your inner narrator is something that's hard to shut off. Sometimes you can't sleep at night because your mind is still going. Thoughts from your past haunt you. I can't believe I said that stupid thing five years ago. 4. You often feel lonelier in a crowd than when you're alone. There's something about being with a group that makes you feel disconnected from yourself. Maybe it's because it's hard to hear your inner voice when there's so much noise around you. Or maybe you feel like an other, like I did. Whatever the reason, as an introvert, you crave intimate moments and deep connections. And those usually aren't found in a crowd. 5. You feel like you're faking it when you have to network. Walking up to strangers and introducing yourself? You'd rather stick tiny needles under your fingernails. But you know there's value in it, so you might do it anyway. Except you feel like a phony the entire time. If you're anything like me, you had to teach yourself how to do it. 
You might have read self-help books about how to be a better conversationalist or exude more charisma. In the moment, you have to activate your public persona. You might say things to yourself like, smile, make eye contact, and use your loud, confident voice. Then, when you're finished, you feel beat and you need downtime to recover. You wonder, does everyone else have to try this hard when meeting new people? 6. You're not the student shooting your hand up every time the teacher asks a question. You don't need all that attention. You're content just knowing that you know the answer. You don't have to prove it to anyone else. At work, this may translate to not saying much during meetings. You'd rather pull your boss aside afterward and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or email your ideas rather than explain them to a room full of people. The exception to this is when you feel truly passionate about something. On rare occasions, even shy introverts have been known to transform themselves into a force to be reckoned with when it really counts. It's all about how much something matters to you. You'll risk overstimulation when you think speaking up will truly make a difference. 7. You're better at writing your thoughts than speaking them. You prefer texting to calling and emailing to face-to-face -face meetings. Writing gives you time to reflect on what to say and how to say it. It allows you to edit your thoughts and craft your message just so. Plus, there's less pressure when you're typing your words into your phone alone than when you're saying them to someone in real time. But it isn't just about texting and emailing. Many introverts enjoy journaling for self-expression and self-discovery. Others make a career out of writing, such as John Green, author of the best-selling young adult novel, The Fault in Our Stars. In his YouTube video, Thoughts from Places, The Tour, Green says, Writing is something you do alone. It's a profession for introverts who want to tell you a story, but don't want to make eye contact while doing it. 8. Likewise, talking on the phone does not sound like a fun way to pass the time. One of my extroverted friends is always calling me when she's alone in her car. She figures that, although her eyes, hands, and feet are currently occupied, her mouth is not. Plus, there are no people around. How boring. So she reaches for her phone. Remember to practice safe driving, kids. However, this is not the case for me. When I have a few spare minutes of silence and solitude, I have no desire to fill that time with idle chit-chat. 9. You'd rather not engage with people who are angry. Psychologist Marta Ponari and collaborators found that people high in introversion don't show what's called the gaze-cueing effect. Normally, if you were to view the image of a person's face on a computer screen looking in a certain direction, you would follow that person's gaze. Therefore, you'd respond more quickly to a visual target on that side of the screen than when the person's gaze and the target point in opposite directions. Introverts and extroverts both do this with one exception. If the person seems mad, introverts don't show the gaze cueing effect. This suggests that people who are very introverted don't want to look at someone who seems angry. Ponari and her team think that this is because they are more sensitive to potentially negative evaluations. Meaning, if you think a person is mad because of something related to you, even their gaze becomes a threat. 10. You avoid small talk whenever possible. When a coworker is walking down the hall toward you, have you ever turned into another room in order to avoid having a hey what's up conversation with them? Or have you ever waited a few minutes in your apartment when you heard your neighbors in the hallway so you didn't have to chat? If so, you might be an introvert, because introverts tend to avoid small talk. We'd rather talk about something meaningful than fill the air with chatter just to hear ourselves make noise. We find small talk inauthentic, and frankly, many of us feel awkward doing it. 11. You've been told you're too intense. This stems from your dislike of small talk. If it were up to you, mindless chit-chat would be banished. 
you'd much rather sit down with someone and discuss the meaning of life, or at the very least exchange some real, honest thoughts. Have you ever had a deep conversation and walked away feeling energized, not drained? That's what I'm talking about. Meaningful interactions are the introvert's antidote to social burnout. 12. You don't go to parties to meet new people. Birthday parties, wedding receptions, staff holiday parties, or whatever. You party every once in a while. But when you go to an event, you probably don't go with the goal of making new friends. You'd rather hang out with the people you already know. That's because, like a pair of well-worn sneakers, your current friends feel good on you. They know your quirks, and you feel comfortable around them. Plus, making new friends would mean making small talk. 13. You shut down after too much socializing. A study from Finnish researchers Sointu Laikas and Ville Johanna Ilmarinen shows that socializing eventually becomes tiring to both introverts and extroverts. That's likely because socializing expends energy. Not only do you have to talk, but you also have to listen and process what's being said. Plus, you're taking in all kinds of sensory information, such as someone's tone of voice and body language, along with filtering out any background noises or visual distractions. It's no wonder people get drained. But there are some very real differences between introverts and extroverts. On average, Introverts really do prefer solitude and quiet more than their extroverted counterparts. In fact, if you're an introvert, you might experience something that's been dubbed the introvert hangover. Like a hangover induced by one too many giant fishbowl margaritas, you feel sluggish and icky after too much socializing. Your brain seems to stop working, and in your exhaustion, you cease to be able to hold a conversation or say words that make sense. You just want to lie down in a quiet, dark room and not move or talk for a while. That's because introverts can become overstimulated by socializing and shut down. More about the introvert hangover later. 14. You notice details that others miss. It's true that introverts especially highly sensitive introverts, can get overwhelmed by too much stimuli. But there's an upside to our sensitivity. We notice details that others might miss. For example, you might notice a subtle change in your friend's demeanor signaling that she's upset. But oddly, no one else in the room sees it. Or you might be highly tuned into color, space, and texture, making you an incredible visual artist. 15. You can concentrate for long periods of time on things that matter to you. I can write for hours. I get in the zone and I just keep going. I don't need anyone or anything else to entertain me. As I write, I enter a state of flow. I block out distractions and hone in on what I need to accomplish. If you're an introvert, you likely have activities or pet projects that you could work on for practically forever. That's because introverts are great at focusing alone for long periods of time. If it weren't for introverts and our amazing ability to focus, we wouldn't have the theory of relativity, Google, or Harry Potter. Yes, Einstein, Larry Page, and J.K. Rowling are all likely introverts. Dear Society, where would you be without us? You're welcome. Love, introverts. 16. You live in your head. In fact, you may daydream so much that people have told you to get out of your head or come down to earth. That's because your inner world is rich and vivid. Not all introverts have strong imaginations. That trait is correlated with openness to experience on the big five personality scale, not extroversion-introversion. But many of us do. 17. You like to people watch. Actually, you just like to observe in general, whether it's people, nature, etc. Introverts are natural observers. They can often be found hanging out along the edges of a party or event, just watching, rather than in the thick of things. 18. You've been told you're a good listener. 
you don't mind giving the stage to someone else for a bit and listening. You're not clamoring to get every thought out there because you don't need to talk to think or vocalize everything that crosses your mind the way some extroverts do. Listening, truly listening, means you get to learn something new or better understand what makes someone tick. 19. You have a small circle of friends. You're close with just one, two, or three people, and you consider everyone else to be an acquaintance. That's because introverts only have so much people energy to spend, so we choose our relationships carefully. It's about budgeting. 20. You don't get high off your environment. There's a reason why crowds, parties, and networking events aren't your thing. Introverts and extroverts differ in how their brains process experiences through reward centers. Neurobiologists Yu Fu and Richard Depew demonstrated this phenomenon by giving Ritalin to introverted and extroverted college students. Ritalin is a drug used to treat ADHD that stimulates the production of the feel-good neurotransmitter dopamine in the brain. They found that extroverts were more likely to connect their feelings of bliss with the environment they were in. However, introverts did not associate the feeling of reward with their surroundings. This suggests that introverts have a basic difference in how strongly they process rewards from the environment. More about introverts and rewards later. According to the researchers, the brains of introverts may weigh internal cues more strongly than external ones. In other words, introverts don't feel high from their surroundings. Instead, we're paying more attention to what's going on inwardly. 21. You're an old soul. Introverts tend to observe, process information deeply, and reflect before they speak. Analytical by nature, we're often interested in discovering the deeper meaning or underlying pattern behind events. Because of this, Introverts can seem wise, even from a young age. 22. You alternate between being with people and being alone. Introverts relish being alone. In our solitude, we have the freedom to tune into our inner voice and tune out the noise of the world. As we do this, we gain energy and clarity. But introverts don't always want to be alone. As human beings, we're wired to connect with others, and as introverts, we long to connect meaningfully. So introverts live in two worlds. We visit the world of people, but solitude and the inner world will always be our home. Still not sure? Still not sure if you're an introvert? Here's a quick test. Answer these two questions honestly. One. If you had to choose between two options for a dream vacation, which one would you pick? A. A relaxing vacation by yourself or with just one other person, a good book, and a secluded cabin. B. A group vacation with your friends or family, doing exciting things like gambling in Las Vegas or partying on a cruise ship. Don't think about what you should do or what's expected of you. Which one would you pick if you didn't care what anyone else thought about you? As you probably guessed, if you chose the secluded cabin, you're more of an introvert. If you picked the second option, you're probably more extroverted. 2. Imagine your dream day. What activities would you do? Who would you want to hang out with? If your perfect day consists of doing something low-key with just one or two people, or alone, you're probably an introvert. If you imagine yourself surrounded by lots of people doing something active, you're probably more of an extrovert. Keep in mind that introversion and extroversion are not all-or-nothing traits. Imagine a spectrum with introversion on one end and extroversion on the other. Everyone lands somewhere on that spectrum, with some falling closer to the introverted end and others nearer the extroverted end. Nobody is a pure introvert or extrovert. Such a person would be in the lunatic asylum, wrote Carl Jung, the famous Swiss psychologist who first coined the term introvert. In other words, we all act extroverted in some situations and introverted in others. For example, when I'm with my close friends, I talk, 
laugh, argue, and sometimes even dance. It's because I feel comfortable with them, but I'm still an introvert who needs plenty of alone time. When writing this book, I talked with hundreds of introverts. True to introvert fashion, many of those conversations happened in writing, via email, and social media. In a few instances, I was lucky enough to be able to sit down with someone and interview that person face-to-face. -face. Throughout this book, I share comments from the introverts I interviewed, as well as research studies, my own experiences, and stories that have been published on introvertdear.com. As an introvert, you may find yourself identifying with some parts of this book, but not with others. Let me be clear, that's perfectly okay. Just because you don't relate to everything doesn't mean you're not an introvert. There's no wrong way to do introversion. Tips for extroverts Do I spy an extrovert? Don't think I didn't see you, hanging out in my introvert audiobook. Most extroverts love being wherever there are people. But don't worry, you're welcome here too. In fact, I've included tips in most chapters just for you to help you understand introverts better. Whether you're an extrovert in a relationship with an introvert, the co-worker of an introvert, the family member of an introvert, or the friend of an introvert, there's something in this audiobook for you, too. Why I wrote this audiobook For too long, introverts have been misunderstood. We may have been the ones who were bullied on the playground as kids for being too different. We may have great ideas, but lack the self-confidence to say them out loud. We've been told we're too quiet, too sensitive, or too shy. When we say we're staying in tonight, pained looks from our friends tell us there's something wrong with us. Conversations whispered by the adults of our childhood told us we are seriously broken. Kia, for example, is an introvert who feels like an outsider at work. People always seem to think I'm upset or that I don't want to be bothered. And in some instances, it's true, she tells me. I don't mind chatting every once in a while, but I feel as though I do my best work when I'm silent and focused. Her co-workers don't understand her need for quiet. In fact, things have gotten pretty tense with them at times. They say things to her like, you're so quiet, or you need to open up more. This really frustrates Kia because, like many introverts, she's at work to, well, work, not make friends. She wonders why she needs to talk more. She does her job well. She doesn't dislike her coworkers. I just enjoy being by myself, she says. I enjoy thinking and being in my own little world. It relaxes me and I feel free. Sometimes people make me feel like I'm some sort of criminal for being an introvert. I wish that work environments were more supportive of people like us. We don't mean any harm. Amanda is another introvert who feels out of place. When she started college, she hadn't yet identified as an introvert. However, it quickly became obvious that she was different from the other students. After class, instead of going back to the dorms, and cramming herself into someone's tiny room with a dozen other co-eds to hang out, she'd sneak off by herself. She discovered a little park near campus, and she'd spend hours there, studying or reading. I didn't know why I did this or what it did for me, she tells me. I just needed to be by myself. I wasn't shy or antisocial. I certainly didn't know my time in the park was replenishing my energy, or why I craved time alone when my friends didn't. After spending time in the park, she could head back to the dorms and survive the never-ending social interaction that awaited her. But in the back of her mind, she knew other students weren't doing this. Why was she so different? And finally, there's Justin. In college, he took a communications course. He knew, of course, that communication is so much more than just talking. But right away, he felt out of place. His class seemed to be full of extroverts who knew how to do only two things, talk loudly and a lot. Everyone seemed to fit in chatting here and there, he tells me. When someone noticed me being the only quiet person in the room, he asked me why. I told him, 
Hey, I'm an introvert. I don't feel the need to always talk. The classmate looked at him like he was an alien from another planet and asked him in a snarky tone why he bothered to enroll in a course about communication. Justin just smiled and never said another word to him. Why did I write this audiobook? I wrote it for Kia, Amanda, and Justin. I wrote it for my introverted 12-year-old self who got drained after hanging out with her friends and didn't know why. I wrote it for all the members of the introvert dear community. Most important, I wrote this audiobook for you. This is for all the quiet ones. It's time to change how the world sees introverts. It's time to change how we introverts see ourselves. And I'll tell you a secret. It all starts when you begin working with your introversion rather than fighting against it. I'll show you how. Listen on. Chapter 2. The Science of Introversion Has something like this ever happened to you? You're at a party or some get-together. The room is full of people, music is playing, and it's loud. You do your best to be friendly, making small talk, even though you'd rather be at home binge-watching your latest Netflix obsession. Everyone around you looks like they're having a good time, so you smile and laugh, too. You don't want to stick out. But after a while, all the noise and chatter become too much. So you retreat to an empty couch in a deserted corner of the room where you take a break by sitting quietly. From back here, you watch everything. It kind of becomes fun to be a silent observer. You notice little things you didn't notice before, and your mind analyzes it all. Sitting quietly, you feel your energy returning. If you're an introvert, you probably know what happens next. It doesn't take long for someone to spot you sitting alone. Usually it's an extrovert. They plop down next to you, invading your quiet sanctuary. Then comes the dreaded question. Are you okay? You pause, unsure of how to answer. You could be honest, explaining, I'm an introvert and I needed to take a break from socializing. But more likely, since you're caught off guard and now feeling self-conscious, you release a panicked, yeah, everything's fine. The extrovert gives you a strange look. They may raise an eyebrow in confusion. You sigh internally and head back to the crowd. This sort of thing has happened to me many times. And when it did, I didn't understand it. At parties, happy hours, and group dinners, everyone around me seemed to be having a good time. In fact, they seemed to be getting more energetic as the night went on. Why was I the only one showing signs of burnout? Today I know a secret. It has to do with the way introverts are wired. In this chapter, we'll explore the science behind introversion. I'll answer the question, why do introverts get drained from socializing? And several other questions about the nature of introverts. I hope learning about the science behind your quiet temperament helps you understand yourself better and inspires you to further love who you are. The Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Molecule The reason introverts and extroverts react to things differently, like partying, has to do with a chemical found in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine is sometimes called the sex, drugs, and rock and roll molecule because it helps control the brain's pleasure and reward centers. That's a catchy description, but it's not entirely accurate. Dopamine itself doesn't guarantee that you'll feel pleasure. What it does guarantee is you'll be excited by the possibility of pleasure. In a restaurant, when a server shows you a tray of tantalizing desserts and you get excited about eating one, that's dopamine at work. Introverts and extroverts both have dopamine in their brains. The difference is extroverts have a more active dopamine reward system than introverts, according to Scott Barry Kaufman, the scientific director of the Imagination Institute. In other words, simply put, when extroverts see potential rewards, they get more excited about them than introverts. Rewards are things like social attention, social status, money, food, and sexual opportunities. And yes, what you've always suspected is true. 
Research from a university in West Germany shows that extroverts really do tend to have more sex than introverts, though whether or not the sex is as good or as fulfilling is the second part of the question. If you're excited about the possibility of something, you'll have more energy and motivation to pursue it. In other words, dopamine helps reduce your cost of effort. This is why extroverts are often found chatting enthusiastically with strangers, calling attention to themselves in groups, and making bold moves without getting as worn out as introverts would. Introverts, on the other hand, just aren't as energized by potential rewards in their environment especially social rewards. The possibilities of making a new friend or becoming popular just aren't as exciting to us. This also explains why introverts feel drained after socializing. Unlike extroverts, we don't get a cost of effort reduction. A study conducted in 2005 by Michael Cohen and his colleagues found a link between extroversion and dopamine. For the study, they asked participants to perform a gambling task while they were in a brain scanner. It will probably come as no surprise to you that the imaging data showed that brain activity differed between extroverts and introverts. When a gamble paid off, the extrovert showed a stronger response in two brain regions, the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. The nucleus accumbens plays a key role in the brain's reward circuitry and is part of the dopamine system. The amygdala processes emotional stimuli. Cohen's results provide evidence for the theory that introverts process rewards differently than extroverts. Too loud, too many people. Another way to understand introversion is to think about it in terms of stimulation. Simply put, stimulation is anything registered by your senses. Things you see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Because introverts are not as energized by potential rewards, they may find levels of stimulation that are rewarding for extroverts to be simply tiring or annoying, according to Colin DeYoung, a psychology professor at the University of Minnesota. Think. A loud rock concert with tons of people. A crowded bar on a Saturday night. Or a busy casino with lots of flashing lights. If you're an introvert like me, you can probably put up with these environments for a short period of time. You may even have fun for a while, but eventually you become overstimulated and feel drained. That's when you want to run for home, where it's calm and quiet. Stimulation can also come in the form of socializing. Think about everything that happens during a conversation. You make eye contact with the person who is talking, and you listen to what they say. Their words are incoming stimulation that you have to process, reflect on, and respond to. You're probably also using brain power to monitor your tone of voice and body language, as well as paying attention to theirs, trying to read what it means. If you're in a group, there are even more people to pay attention to. No wonder cocktail parties and happy hours get tiring for introverts. For extroverts. It's all about dosage. If your introverted friend or partner wants to leave a party, or not go in the first place, they're not doing this just to be difficult. Because introverts respond differently to rewards, we don't gain as much energy from socializing as you do. Simply put, the big social event isn't as fun for us. So cut your introvert some slack and see if the two of you can compromise. Can you go to the party but let the introvert decide when it's time to leave? Or can the introvert sit this one out, leaving you to party as long as you want? Better yet, can the two of you drive separately, so you can stay as late as you want, but the introvert can leave when they feel burned out? Introverts can enjoy socializing, but it's all about dosage. Too much noise and too many people, and introverts get overstimulated. How Introverts Feel Rewarded Introverts may not get high on shaking hands with strangers, but that doesn't mean we don't feel rewarded in other ways. I asked introverts to tell me what types of activities energize and reward them. Not surprisingly, they all said they like doing something alone or with just a few other people whose company they really enjoy. A reward I enjoy is dinner alone. 
I even dress up nice, or a bike ride around the city. Alleyways are my favorite, because there are so many interesting things in alleyways, and they are quieter. Joe. I like socializing with one or two people I like in a low-pressure environment. Marissa. I always feel rewarded when I finish a good book. Being given a chance to peer into somebody else's mind is a wondrous thing. Austin. I love to go on a run where I can listen to my favorite tunes and observe my surroundings. Shanna. I love just wandering my city with my headphones on and a camera. Piper. Surprisingly, I like doing the dishes. It may seem monotonous, but it's very therapeutic to have time to myself where I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I can just daydream. Hannah. Hiking. Nothing better than a good 12-mile hike through the White Mountains by myself. Chris. I like sitting in my bedroom listening to a good album, enjoying food in an empty restaurant, and being able to shop in peace in an empty mall. Tina. The Introvert's Origin Story If you're an introvert, your dopamine reward system is not as active as your extroverted friends or partners. Why? Were you born this way? Or did something happen to you at some point in your life that made you like this? It's the old nature versus nurture question. Is it your DNA or your life experiences that make you who you are? I see introverts discussing this topic often. In comments on an Introvert Dear article or in the Introvert Dear Facebook group, introverts hypothesize about the origin of their introversion. They write things like, I was an extrovert until I was bullied in elementary school. I lost my confidence and turned into an introvert. Or, I was raised by introverted parents who always wanted things to be quiet. I got used to not talking much. Or even, after my girlfriend broke up with me, I turned into an introvert who didn't want to leave the house. Is it true? Did circumstances turn these people into introverts? To answer that question, let's take a look at the introvert's origin story. Every superhero has an origin story. Superman was rocketed to Earth as an infant by his scientist father, moments before his home planet's destruction. When a young Bruce Wayne's parents were killed, he swore an oath to rid Gotham City of evil and became Batman. What's the introvert's origin story? To understand our origin story, first you need to understand the difference between temperament and personality. Dr. Nancy Snidman, a research professor in the Child Development Unit of the University of Massachusetts, told me in an interview that your temperament is made up of genetic and biological factors that influence how you view and respond to your environment. Remember, introversion and extroversion are temperaments. Personality, on the other hand, is a mix of both your temperament and environment. When I use the word personality in this book, I'm not talking about your Myers-Briggs personality type, your Enneagram, or anything like that. Instead, I mean the combination of qualities that form your unique character. It's your introversion with your life experiences piled on top. You were probably born an introvert. From day one, you had the seed of introversion encoded in your DNA. When you were born, your dopamine reward system was less active than your extroverted peers. As you grew, you reacted to your surroundings as an introvert. You may have been more cautious than other children, clinging to your parents' leg instead of running excitedly toward the playgroup. Snidman and her colleagues see this when they study babies. About 40% of babies are what she calls behaviorally uninhibited, meaning they don't react strongly when presented with unknown lights, sounds, objects, or people. They remain calm and are not disturbed by novelty. Another 15 to 20% of babies do the opposite. When presented with novel stimuli, they thrash their arms and legs, cry, or show other signs of behavioral arousal. The way individuals react whether they react strongly or not to new things, doesn't really change over time, according to Snidman. 
The babies who calmly soak up stimulation are likely to continue to do so as adults. The ones who are extremely reactive to stimulation will likely grow up to be shy or socially anxious. This provides evidence for the theory that we're born with a certain temperament, and that temperament follows us into adulthood. Why does it matter that you were born an introvert and that you'll likely stay an introvert for life? Because you don't want to spend your life pretending to be someone you're not. As an introvert, it's important to recognize that your needs are always going to be slightly different from the needs of extroverts and learn how to work with your introversion rather than fight against it. What introverts are like as kids. When you ask introverts what they were like as kids, the picture is clear that introversion is something that shows up early on. Jessica, an introvert I interviewed, tells me that she never consistently had large groups of friends. Instead, she liked doing things alone, such as playing with her dollhouse, reading, and playing dress-up. When she did spend time with other children, it was usually in small groups. I only had one or two close friends for most of my childhood, she says. Richard was obsessed with books. I didn't want to be bothered with anyone, he tells me. I didn't really fit in with folks when I was younger. Nobody really talks to you if you didn't keep up with basketball, go to the same school, or talk about the latest sneakers. Thankfully, things got better as he grew older. High school was better because I usually hung out with the goths and gamers, he says. Nicole was the child that no one knew was in the room because she was so quiet. I almost always played by myself, she says. I never really was into having friends over or anything like that. Even as a baby, her parents could put her on a blanket with a few toys and turn their backs. When they came to check on her, I was still in the same spot, quietly playing alone, she says. Lori, who is 50 years old, says she is definitely the same as when she was a child. I was content by myself, even happier that way most of the time, she tells me. I knew I was different and still do. I love being alone. Temperaments don't change, but personalities do. There's another piece to the puzzle of who you are, your personality. Remember, personality and temperament are different. Your personality is shaped by your circumstances and experiences. Your temperament is encoded in your DNA from birth. Turns out, both your personality and temperament work together to create who you are. It's both nature and nurture. For example, let's say you were an introvert who was lucky enough to grow up in an environment that supported your quiet nature. Parents and teachers praised you for being thoughtful and analytical. They understood your need for alone time and helped you socialize in a way that worked for you. They encouraged you to seek opportunities that played to your strengths, and most important, they didn't make you feel less than for not being like the extroverted kids. If they did this, you probably grew up to be a fairly well-adjusted introvert who feels comfortable in your own skin. Unfortunately, this isn't always the case. Instead of being praised for being thoughtful, many introverts are told they're too quiet. Parents order them to stop spending so much time in your room, and teachers tell them to participate more. Introverted kids get the message that there's something wrong with them because they'd rather do an activity quietly and alone rather than hang out with friends every weekend. If this is the kind of childhood you had, you may have grown up to be an adult who feels broken. The good news is it's not too late to change that. So when people say that bullying or a nasty breakup transformed them from an extrovert to an introvert, is that right? Not exactly. People are born being more introverted or extroverted, and circumstances won't change that. But here's the catch. Circumstances can change your personality. Snidman tells me, personality can become modified over time as environmental events occur. Our perceptions of the world and responses to it can change to a greater or lesser extent, depending on experiences in our life. Sadly, if you were bullied as a kid, or if the love of your life broke up with you, you're going to be negatively impacted. 
you may become more withdrawn, more cautious, and less confident overall. For a time, you may want to stay home more and interact with fewer people. It may seem like you've suddenly become an introvert. However, it isn't your temperament that has changed. It is a personality shift. This shift could be temporary or last for a while. Why Your Personality Changes There's good news about personality changes. According to Christopher Soto, a member of the executive board of the Association for Research in Personality, when people's personalities change over time, it's usually for the better. Several studies, including some of Soto's, show that most adults become more agreeable, conscientious, and emotionally resilient as they get older. These changes don't happen overnight. Rather, they happen gradually, unfolding across years or even decades. We still don't fully understand all the causes of personality change. However, researchers have identified some potential reasons. Social Roles Research by Brent Roberts and others shows that the social roles we invest in can change us. In other words, as our lives change, so do our personalities. For example, you may become more conscientious and responsible when you become a parent for the first time. I experienced a slight personality change when I became a teacher. Over time, I became more comfortable with public speaking, being the center of attention, and making small talk. But I didn't become an extrovert. I'm still truly an introvert. Trauma Sadly, traumatic events can change your personality, too. As humans, we tend to be more profoundly altered by highly unpleasant experiences than by highly pleasurable ones. In other words, our brains overlearn from negative experiences, especially as children. For example, if you were bullied as a child, your personality may have suffered. This is because traumatic experiences can produce changes in the brain. This can lead to shifts in intelligence, emotional reactivity, happiness, sociability, and other traits. The good news is you can actively work to erase some of the effects of trauma. For a great resource on how to do this, check out Rick Hansen's book, Hardwiring Happiness, The New Brain Science of Contentment, Calm, and Confidence. Intentional Changes You may be able to intentionally change your personality through sustained effort and careful goal-setting, according to a 2015 study by Nathan Hudson and Chris Fraley. Other studies by Christopher Soto and Jules Specht suggest that you're more likely to experience positive personality changes if you're leading a meaningful, satisfying life. Your introversion doesn't have to doom you. Andre Solo is an introvert who made intentional personality changes. He grew up a self-professed nerd. You know the type. Pimply, clumsy, and one who likes to read lots of sci-fi. Andre wasn't just an introvert. He was awkward, too. As an adult, he wanted to change his blundering ways. He wondered if there was a way to stop appearing so socially awkward and maybe even enjoy talking to people. So he set out to try. True to nerd form, he started with a spreadsheet. He listed all the changes he wanted to see, the steps it would take to attain them, and a designated challenge to reach each one. His first challenge was to start conversations with five strangers. But these conversations couldn't be with just anyone. Andre created some rules. Servers didn't count. They're paid to be nice. And a friend of a friend was too easy. And the interaction had to be real, not just, Hi, how are you? Andre's first victim was in an art museum. As she stood quietly contemplating a painting, Andre asked what she thought of it, by practically shouting his question from across the room. To his surprise, she didn't seem annoyed. As she poured her heart out about the painting, Andre mentally made a check mark on his list. One out of five conversations? Done. Then he said, thanks, and ran for it. Clearly, he had a long way to go. These conversations weren't easy. I didn't want to do them. Andre tells me, I was completely out of my element. He had to accept the fact that he was going to put himself in a situation where, at some point, he would get embarrassed. 
You look like a fool at first, Andre says. That's the cost of doing it. But he found that stepping out of his comfort zone was like lifting weights at the gym. It's hard at first, but it gets a little easier each time. His next conversation was with a man in a restaurant. Andre asked him about the book he was reading, and they actually had a little back and forth. Andre went on to improve as a conversationalist. Each day he chose three topics he could talk about before he left the house. One was, did you hear about a recent news story? One was, did you know that an interesting new discovery? And one was, what if an imaginative, fun scenario? And, true to the advice found in self-help books, Andre discovered that everyone enjoys talking about themselves. He learned to ask a lot of questions about the other person. He made it a rule that the question, what do you do for a living, would never be one of them, because he didn't enjoy that kind of small talk. Today, Andre is a lot better at talking to people, and this has paid off in many ways. His boss and co-workers started to like him more, and he felt more confident striking up conversations with women he wanted to date. Andre made meaningful friendships, too. Soon after improving his conversation skills, he met a new friend in a bar, the kind of place he used to hate going to. She remarked that Andre was one of those special people who was just born with the gift of gab. When he explained that being charming didn't come naturally to him, she was shocked. But the best thing to come out of improving his conversation skills wasn't that he could make more friends and go on more dates. I actually started to enjoy talking with people, he says. Instead of dreading it, it was fun. Similarly, when a stranger strikes up a conversation with him now, he no longer feels like it's an assault on his private mental state, at least most of the time. Andre is still an introvert. Now an author, he spends most of his days writing alone. He dreams up fantastical worlds and makes them come to life through his stories and he's choosy about the social events he attends. Andre says it felt good to conquer a weakness of his. I think this is the best thing introverts can do for themselves, he says. That and accept yourself. If you want to get better at making friends or holding conversations, your introversion doesn't have to doom you. Like Andre, you can learn and practice the skills you need to make these things happen, and reap the benefits as you improve over time. The Four Types of Introverts No two introverts are exactly alike. Andre was methodical about improving his social skills, e.g. by using a spreadsheet, but your approach might be different. Similarly, we're all sensitive to different things. Some introverts are extremely bothered by noise and big groups, while for other introverts, crowds aren't a big deal. An hour of socializing might be too much for one introvert, while another can do a few events before feeling drained. Psychologist Jonathan Cheek, along with graduate students Jennifer Grimes and Courtney Brown, wanted to explore these differences. They hypothesized that there are different types of introverts, or in other words, different ways in which a person's introversion can be expressed. They surveyed about 500 adults of various ages, asking them about their preferences for spending time alone, how likely they were to daydream, etc. They came up with four types of introverts. Social, thinking, anxious, and restrained. They named their model STAR after the first letter of each type. According to their model, a person can be predominantly one type. For example, you could be solely a thinking introvert, or you could be a blend of two or more types. Listen to the following descriptions. Which type or types sound like you? Then, if you want to dive deep, take Cheek's star quiz that follows. Social. Don't be fooled. This isn't what it sounds like. A social introvert in Cheek's model isn't an introvert who is so outgoing that they can pass for an extrovert. A social introvert is someone who is introverted in a social way. It means you have a preference for hanging out with just a few people at a time. Or sometimes you prefer not to hang out with anyone at all. People who are high in social introversion like being alone. 
Instead of partying on a Saturday night, you'd rather stay home and play your favorite video game or watch Netflix. Of course, this assumes that you're staying home because you have a preference for low-key activities and not because you're shy or have social anxiety. Shyness and social anxiety are not the same as introversion. Thinking. Like the term sounds, a thinking introvert is someone who is introspective, thoughtful, and self-reflective. This person daydreams and enjoys losing themselves in their inner fantasy world. We're not talking about neurotically losing a grip on reality, though. This is about imagination and creativity. Unlike social introverts, thinking introverts don't share the same aversion to social activities that people usually associate with introversion. So a thinking introvert might hang out with their friends all weekend, but then spend Sunday night alone journaling, daydreaming, or working on their graphic novel. Anxious. While social introverts seek solitude because they prefer low-key activities, anxious introverts avoid socializing because they feel awkward and painfully self-conscious around other people. These are people who are likely not very confident in their social skills. Unfortunately, their anxiety doesn't lessen when they're alone, because this type of introversion is defined by a tendency to ruminate. An anxious introvert may turn things over and over in their mind, wondering what could have, or what already has, gone wrong. They may have trouble shutting off their obsessive negative thoughts. They may even stay awake late at night, playing events over and over in their mind. That embarrassing thing they said five years ago? It still haunts them today. Restrained. Do you jump out of bed ready to seize the day? Do you like to keep busy as much as possible? Is your motto, I'll try anything once? If so, you're probably not a restrained introvert. Restrained introverts tend to operate at a slightly slower pace. They may take a while to get going. They prefer to think before they speak or act. To relax, they like to slow down and take it easy, as opposed to seeking out new or exciting experiences and sensations. They may sometimes feel sluggish and lacking energy. The STAR model is a work in progress, and not all introverts fall neatly into its categories. Nevertheless, it's an important step forward in expanding the definition of introversion. Interestingly, Cheek and his colleagues believe that the term introversion should never be used by itself. Instead, they argue that we should put a specific modifier in front of the word, like social or anxious, for example, by explaining to a curious extrovert, yes, I'm an introvert, but I'm a thinking introvert, which means large groups don't bother me, but I like having plenty of time alone to think and reflect. Quiz. Which of the four types of introverts are you? To find out where you stand on each of the four meanings of introversion, answer the following questions by deciding to what extent each item is characteristic of your feelings and behavior. On a piece of paper, score yourself by choosing a number from the following scale. 1. Very uncharacteristic or untrue, strongly disagree. 2. Uncharacteristic. 3. Neutral. 4. Characteristic. 5. Very characteristic or true. Strongly agree. Social introversion. Number 1. I like to share special occasions with just one person or a few close friends, rather than have big celebrations. Number 2. I try to structure my day so that I always have some time to myself. Number three. My ideal vacation involves lots of time to relax by myself. Number four. After spending a few hours surrounded by a lot of people, I am usually eager to get away by myself. Number five, I usually prefer to do things alone. Number six, 
Other people tend to misunderstand me, forming a mistaken impression of what kind of person I am because I don't say much about myself. Number seven. I feel drained after social situations, even when I enjoyed myself. Thinking introversion. Number one. I enjoy analyzing my own thoughts and ideas about myself. Number two. I have a rich, complex inner life. Number three. I frequently think about what kind of person I am. Number four. When I am reading an interesting story or novel, or when I am watching a good movie, I imagine how I would feel if the events in the story were happening to me. Number five. I generally pay attention to my inner feelings. Number six. I sometimes step back, in my mind, in order to examine myself from a distance. Number seven. I daydream and fantasize with some regularity about things that might happen to me. Anxious introversion. Number one. When I enter a room, I often become self-conscious and feel that the eyes of others are upon me. Number two. My thoughts are often focused on episodes of my life that I wish I'd stop thinking about. Number three. My nervous system sometimes feels so frazzled that I just have to go off by myself. Number four. I don't feel very confident about my social skills. Number five. Defeat or disappointment usually shame or anger me, but I try not to show it. Number six. It takes me some time to overcome my shyness in new situations. Number seven. Even when I am in a group of friends, I often feel very alone and uneasy. Restrained introversion. Number one. I have a hard time getting moving when I wake up in the morning. Number two. For relaxation, I like to slow down and take things easy. Number three. I am often slow to speak, thinking carefully about what I say before I say it. Number four. It's very hard for me to step out of my comfort zone. I rarely seek new experiences and sensations. Number five. Being busy stresses me out. Number six. I need plenty of time to think before I act. Number seven. I usually stop and think things over before making a decision. How did you do? To find out your score, add together all of your answers for each set of seven items to come up with a total score for each kind. Here's a guide of how you scored compared to others in the general population. Social introversion. If you scored below 17, you are low in social introversion. If you scored around 21, you are average in social introversion. If you scored above 25, you are high in social introversion. Thinking introversion. Low, below 18. Average, around 21. High, above 24.
anxious introversion. Low, below 15. Average, around 19. High, above 23. Restrained introversion. Low, below 15. Average, around 20. High, above 25. Why introverts might struggle to put their thoughts into words. No matter what type of introvert you are, I bet you've experienced a scenario like this. A coworker barges into your office or a friend puts you on the spot. They ask a question, their tone of voice saying they want an answer now. Their request is easy, but your mind feels momentarily paralyzed. You start sentences, then stop them. You say words that are close to what you mean, but not exactly. You backtrack. The other person looks at you almost like they are saying, Come on, spit it out. You think, If only my brain would cooperate. Trying to think of exactly the right words to say is called word retrieval, and it's something many introverts struggle with. In social situations, this may translate to us not being able to keep up with fast-talking extroverts. At work, we may come off sounding like we don't know what we're talking about, even when we do. In the classroom, we may shrink from raising our hand because we know it will be hard to put our thoughts into words while our classmates stare at us. One reason word retrieval can be difficult for introverts is we process information deeply. We chew on ideas, turning them over and over in our minds and often analyzing them from every angle. When you're in reflecting mode, it's hard to talk. Introverts don't think out loud like many extroverts do. We do our processing inwardly. Another reason has to do with long-term memory, argues Dr. Marty Olson Laney in The Introvert Advantage. Information stored in long-term memory is mostly outside our conscious awareness. Like the name sounds, long-term memory contains information that is retained for long periods of time. In theory, it's saved indefinitely. Some of this information is fairly easy to access, while other memories are more difficult to recall. For example, do you remember what your first day of kindergarten was like? Compare this with working memory, sometimes referred to as short-term or active memory, which is limited and retains information for mere seconds. Working memory puts information on the tip of your tongue. It's easy to access, but you don't store the information for long, unless you move it to long-term memory. Laney suggests that introverts favor long-term memory over working memory. If that's the case, this explains why word retrieval can be difficult for us. It's harder to access the information stored in long-term memory. The right association or key is needed to pull up the information you're trying to recall, something that reminds you of the stored memory. For example, if you tried to recall your first day of kindergarten, perhaps you looked around the room and noticed a pair of sneakers. This made you remember that someone spilled milk on your shoes on the first day of kindergarten, and bam, suddenly you start remembering more about that day. And if you happen to be even the slightest bit anxious when you're trying to speak, like someone putting you on the spot, it may be more difficult to articulate the right words. Not all introverts have social anxiety or are shy. But it's not unusual for an introvert to experience some level of anxiety in a social situation. Anxiety is mentally draining and can make it harder to recall information. That's because the stress hormone cortisol is released in large amounts during times of anxiety. Cortisol affects the brain and can lead to memory loss and problems with recall. As an introvert, you may feel that you express yourself best when you can write out your thoughts. For example, you may prefer text messages and emails to phone calls and in-person meetings. Similarly, many introverts journal to process their experiences better. The reason for this preference, again, has to do with how our brains are wired. According to Laney, you use different brain pathways when writing than when speaking, and these writing pathways 
seem to flow more effortlessly for introverts. When your mind goes blank, to yank something out of long-term memory, you need to locate the right association or key. The good news is most pieces of information in long-term memory were stored with several keys for unlocking them. A key might take the form of a thought, emotion, or sensory association, such as a smell, image, sound, or even a feeling in your body. If you can find just one key, you might be able to pull up the whole memory. Here are some ideas to help you do that. Be still and relax. Give yourself permission to be quiet for a few moments. Don't let the other person rush you. Buy yourself time by saying something like, Let me think about that. Or, Hmm, let me see. Or give a nonverbal signal that shows your thinking, like looking away and furrowing your brow slightly. Let your mind wander, jumping from memory to memory. One thought may lead to another, and one of those thoughts may hold the key to unlocking the words you need. If all else fails and words escape you, don't feel embarrassed. Your brain is doing what comes naturally to it, and that is to pause and reflect. If you're being quiet, you're in good company with other deep-thinking introverts. The brilliant physicist Stephen Hawking once said, Quiet people have the loudest minds. Try breezing over any awkwardness by using humor to make light of your tongue-tied state. Or say you're a little distracted right now, but you'll get back to them later by sending an email or a text. In closing, introverts may not naturally have the gift of gab or have as much energy for socializing and meeting new people as extroverts do. But the introvert's mind is a powerful force. We'll explore just how powerful it is later in this audiobook. I hope learning about the science behind introversion has given you an aha moment, like it did for me many years ago, and has helped you understand and appreciate your temperament more. Chapter 3 Introverts are Rude and Other Misconceptions I recently attended a blogging workshop. Seated at a table with three other writers, we introduced ourselves by saying what we wrote about. There was a food writer, a political junkie, and a parenting blogger. Then it was my turn. I'm Jen, and I write about introverts, I said, reminding myself to use my loud, confident voice while smiling and briefly looking each person in the eye. Don't laugh. I bet you say things like this in your head, too. Talking to strangers is hard. The food blogger perked up. She had been chatting up the table from the moment I sat down. She would later tell me that she identifies as an extrovert. Oh, that's great, she cooed. So you teach introverts how not to be introverted? I stared at her. A dozen thoughts exploded in my head at once. I wanted to tell her that introverts don't need to be fixed, that there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. I could feel myself tensing up as I opened my mouth to speak. But I didn't say any of that. I didn't have to. Suddenly, the political junkie chimed in. I'm an introvert, and I don't want to change that, she proudly declared. I think you're misunderstanding what it means to be introverted. I swear, I almost shouted amen. Unfortunately, this sort of thing happens all the time. Like the extroverted blogger, people have the wrong idea about introversion. Even some introverts don't understand it. Once, someone told me they liked spending time alone, were not into big social events, and listened more than they spoke. But there was no way they could be an introvert because they didn't get nervous when talking to people. Similarly, I see a lot of misconceptions about introversion online. Google's definition of an introvert is a shy, reticent person. Not all introverts are shy, and I think reticent misses the mark. Even in my own Facebook group for introverts, people confuse introversion with depression, anxiety, or mental illness. Likewise, while writing this audiobook, I came face-to-face -face with misconceptions about introversion. 
When I told others that my audiobook was about introverts, they'd often get a funny look on their face. Are you an introvert? They'd usually ask next. It seemed as though they were surprised to find out that a self-professed introvert could even hold a conversation. Oh, you must feel way out of your comfort zone talking to me then, one very extroverted woman I had just met exclaimed. I didn't. But you're not an introvert, another said. I've seen you talk to people. And there's another reason to debunk misconceptions about introverts. Research by Aaron W. Siegman and Theodore M. Dembrowski suggests that acting falsely extroverted can lead to burnout, stress, and cardiovascular disease. More research into this area is still needed, but this effect is likely caused by the overstimulation and anxiety that can result from introverts overextending themselves socially. Turns out, embracing your introverted nature isn't just a feel-good axiom. It's actually good for your physical health. But we can't embrace our quiet nature until we understand what it truly is, and that starts with clearing up misconceptions about it. Has someone ever had the wrong idea about you? Listen on. In this chapter, we'll address some common misconceptions about introversion. Misconception number one. Introversion is simply rudeness. It was my first year of college, and the sophomore in the dorm room across the hall from me had invited me to dinner. She was outgoing, loud, and blunt the kind of person who would say anything to anyone. In hindsight, she was probably an extrovert. At the restaurant, we ordered appetizers, and she asked me where I was from, Minnesota, and what my major was, writing. All the usual get-to-know-you small talk. I thought our first friend date was going well, as well as it could for a socially awkward introvert like me. But then she said something that shocked me. You're actually a really cool person. When I first met you, you hardly said anything, so I thought you were kind of a bitch. Kind of a bitch? She tossed off the words as coolly as if she had just informed me that my mozzarella sticks had arrived. In some twisted way, I think she meant it as a compliment. I didn't know what to say. I froze, then uttered a weak, Ha ha, thanks. I tried to pretend like everything was okay, but in reality, her words wounded me. Sure, I was quiet. I kept to myself on campus. I often spent Friday nights lying in bed reading books from my classes that I found interesting. I had a boyfriend and a few close friends, and they were all I needed to fill my social quota. I'd never thought my introverted ways were seen as bitchy. I was just doing my own thing. Turns out being called bitchy, rude, or aloof is a common introvert problem. I've been accused of being an arrogant prick for avoiding small talk and favoring solitude, Leilani tells me. I've been called Ice Queen, Anne says. Also, many people have told me, you scared me when I first met you because I didn't smile all the time. Allison adds, after high school, when I would happen to meet someone I hadn't seen since high school, it inevitably would be said that they thought I was stuck up or bitchy. She would ask them if she had ever said something rude to them, and it would turn out that, no, I didn't. But because I often sat alone and read or had headphones on, people assumed I thought I was superior to them. That baffled me. I certainly didn't want to be in with the in crowd, but I also didn't actively dislike most people. Mostly I was just busy with my books and music and such. To this day, I can't think of a time when I had been outright rude to my dorm mate. I'd never insulted her, walked away when she was talking, or anything of the sort. What had probably happened was I'd passed her several times in the hallway, before we were friends, and hadn't said much. I definitely didn't stick my hand out and exclaim, Hi, I'm Jen, how's your day going? I didn't see this as being rude. I was simply keeping to myself. And herein lies the problem. Our reserved nature gets us in trouble. We don't bubble over with pleasantries, so we get accused of being unfriendly. We don't blab our life story to people we've just met, so we get accused of being aloof. But introverts don't see life as one big cocktail party. We're content with just a few meaningful relationships. We're not constantly scanning the environment, 
looking to add more adoring fans to our entourage. As we go through the day, we're likely in our heads. Shalima, another introvert who has been accused of being rude, tells me, When your mind is screaming at you, with thoughts and ideas coming at you all at once, it's hard to be loud. Or we're simply observing our surroundings, as introverts tend to do. Amy says, Quiet doesn't equal mad, sad, rude, bitchy, arrogant, or stuck up. Quiet does equal people watching, observing, and enjoying life, quietly. When my extroverted dorm mate called me a bitch, I wish I'd spoken up. I wish I would have told her not to make assumptions about someone who is quiet. A person can be quiet for many reasons. They might be an introvert who needs time to warm up to new people. They might be turned inward at the moment, enjoying the thoughts in their private inner world. Or that quiet person may simply be content with silence. Don't be too quick to judge. Today I make a point of saying hello when I pass neighbors in the hallway of my apartment building. When I'm in the right mood, I even engage in some back and forth. Hey, I like your coat. Where'd you get it? But I probably won't hang around having a 15-minute conversation that started with, how about this weather? Unless it's snowing, of course, which, in that case, is the only thing we Minnesotans want to talk about. And I probably won't spontaneously invite anyone in for tea. I'm okay with that. Misconception number two. The introvert's need for solitude is antisocial. When Jill was in high school, she felt exhausted and drained all the time because she didn't know how to work with her introversion like she does now. As a result, she got in a lot of trouble with her parents. They never seemed to understand why I wanted to be on my own all the time, and I'm pretty sure they worried I was depressed or into something I shouldn't have been into, since I like to just sit at the computer all night, she tells me. Thus, I was antisocial and had a problem. It got to the point where Jill couldn't even handle the social stimulation from being in class. I completely shut down and tuned out during the day at school, she says. My teachers sat me down with my parents and basically told me to participate or else. I felt like I was defective or a bad kid. I was just waiting for them to send me off to therapy or something so I could be fixed for not wanting to participate. Now Jill knows she felt drained because she was overstimulated from being around people and not being able to fully recharge afterward. There was always so much pressure to participate in clubs, and then friends wanted a lot of my attention, too, once we got out of class, she tells me. If I didn't give it to them, that caused a whole other slew of problems, because if I wasn't 100% devoted to them, I was a bad friend. I basically had to fake being an extrovert to get through it, and as a result, I was crabby and a stuck-up bitch. This was a direct quote from an old classmate. Connie had a similar problem. I have a good friend whom I will call Nikki, she says. She is incredibly extroverted, funny, creative, well-spoken, and caring, but loud. She is loud in every single way. She talks loudly, she mothers loudly, she creates loudly, and in her relationship, she needs loud face-to-face -face time. She needs that intense outside stimulation. So when we became what she considered to be close friends, she took to calling me antisocial at every opportunity, due to the fact that I don't share her need for outside stimulation. According to Connie, Nikki is a psychology major, so she feels like she gets everyone. Maybe she understands that people have differing personalities and quirks. But as far as truly understanding, I beg to differ, Connie says. She would tease me about not wanting to go out with her and her friends, and for having a clean home and an orderly life, from her perspective. Connie thinks this is due to them having opposite personalities. Just ten minutes with Nikki and I would start to check out. I would become completely overstimulated by all her loudness and her need to dominate the conversation. Hey, I'm as introverted as they come, but I do enjoy contributing to the conversation once in a while. Introversion does not equate to being antisocial, though I used to think so. 
That is, until I truly came to understand and accept myself as an introvert. Jill and Connie are the victims of another nasty misconception about introversion. Our need for alone time is seen as unsociable, unhealthy even. Extroverts can't fathom why we want to be alone often. They figure there's no way it can be good for us. What they don't understand is there's a tiny, invisible battery inside introverts. This metaphorical battery contains all our juice for social interaction. When a chatty coworker goes on and on about her weekend and you're forced to listen, your battery drains a little. When you do a group lunch with everyone in your office and polite chit-chat is mandatory, your battery drains more. When you attend your second cousin's wedding and play nice with relatives who last saw you when you were only this tall, your battery becomes depleted. It's not that introverts have an unhealthy need to be alone. Solitude is our sanity. In their own words, I asked introverts to tell me about the misconceptions they face that are related to their introversion. Here's what they said. A misconception about us that I've run into is even after you explain what introversion is, a lot of times an extrovert still tries to give you advice on how to be more extroverted. What's frustrating is that this implies that introversion is an inferior personality type. It's like they think introverts just need to hear how to be extroverts, as if we haven't been told that our entire lives. This is frustrating, but I think introverts have a responsibility to show the world that the way we approach the world is valid and doesn't need to be fixed. Shelby I think the biggest misconception is that all introverts have social anxiety and don't enjoy socializing. My extroverted coworker knows that I'm an introvert. There have been times when she's assumed that I wouldn't be interested in things that involve socializing or presenting because I'm an introvert. If I mention I went to a party or something over the weekend, she will respond, Are you sure you're an introvert? I've explained that being an introvert doesn't mean that I dislike people or socializing or that I'm shy, just that I need more alone time to recharge my batteries. Megan when I was explaining introversion to someone, they asked, aren't you on medication for that? I asked, what medication? And they said, oh, you know, antidepressants. Chuck. I once had an extroverted roommate who could never understand the hour of quiet alone time I needed after work to decompress from taking phone calls all day. I told her I was going into my room and shutting the door and that, no, I wasn't mad at her, and no, I wasn't depressed. I just needed some alone time. Almost every day she would knock on my door, then open it. Are you mad at me? What's wrong? Let's go out. Ah! I had to ask her to move out after a couple of months. She just didn't get it, and she told all of our mutual friends how stuck up and moody I was. Amy. I am a teacher, and I know how to turn myself on to teach and interact and lead others. But then I need to turn off to recharge. Once I was introduced to a group of my peers that I was about to present a training to as a shy person. I hated being called shy because I am not shy. I just prefer not to speak if I have nothing to say. Jennifer. It's been my experience that people have often thought that I'm not as intelligent as I am. They assumed because I didn't contribute to the conversation and chose instead to listen and observe that I was dumb. Bonnie. The biggest misconception I've faced as an introvert is that people think I'm not one. Most people in my life really struggle to understand that I have a lot of social anxiety, and it actually makes me perform in public like I'm extroverted. I can be chatty, loud, engaged, but all of it comes from fear, anxiety, and pressure. When I'm really being myself, I'm actually very quiet and reserved. Aiden. We don't hate people. We just like to save our energy for certain things, and shallow interaction doesn't cut it. But we are capable of small talk, though I can list about a thousand other things I would rather be doing. Kamiko. I don't like the misunderstanding that introverts are necessarily hermits. We are human and have social needs as well. Nelia. 
People say there's no way you're an introvert. You're so good at talking to people. I've worked in many jobs where I have to be on most of the time. Because of this, I know how to do small talk and can do it well. But others don't see what happens when I get home. I have to totally shut down, sometimes for up to an hour, to recharge enough to do tasks at home. It has taken me quite some time to realize that just because I'm able to chat doesn't mean I'm an extrovert, like people told me, and to realize I need alone time to recharge. Now that I know this, I can begin to change my work habits and have a healthy inner life. Rebecca. The problem I run into frequently is the lunch break scenario. I like people and make friends easily, but I don't like mindless socializing. Consequently, I prefer to eat lunch on my own. I find the noisy chit-chat exhausting, and I need my lunch break time to clear my mind for the afternoon's work. Most of my colleagues understand, but there are some who just don't get it. Lawrence. People constantly underestimate me because I'm quiet and I don't talk a lot. They don't realize I like to stay out of the limelight and observe. I like to work behind the scenes and fly under the radar. I know so much more than they think I know, and I prefer it that way. Emily I think the worst part of growing up introverted was that people assumed I wanted to be otherwise. If you sit in a tree with a book at recess, people assume you wish you were braiding hair with the pretty girls or smoking pot with the badass kids. But really, you're happy with what you're doing. Allison Misconception number three. Introverts lack passion. People often accuse Leanne Chapman of being unemotional. In an Introvert Dear article, she writes, Have you ever been to a workshop where the speaker bounds onto the stage and shouts, Are you excited? Or maybe someone gleefully asks you the same question at a party or social gathering. If you're an introvert like me, you might find this question daunting. I can be excited about something, but I won't show it outwardly, although the people who know me well can tell. I'm introspective and quiet by nature, so my response to the question can simply be, yes, said with a smile. I can relate to Leanne's problem. There have been many times in my life when my lack of outward enthusiasm has created issues. For example, a few years ago when I was dating for the first time as an adult, Guys would tell me they thought I didn't like them. Sometimes they were right. After a first date, I wanted nothing to do with them. But other times I'd be swooning and planning our future together as paramours the only exception played in my head. But I didn't show my feelings in the typical extroverted way. I didn't gush, sigh, or giggle. In fact, it seemed like the more I was into someone, the more I clammed up. Talk about counterproductive. Although Leanne and I would probably get cut from the pep squad, that doesn't mean we lack passion. Just because we don't look excited doesn't mean we're not into something. Introverts can be just as emotional as extroverts. But we usually keep the bulk of those feelings hidden inside. Even if we're having a bad day and a coworker asks, how are you, we may not want to talk about it. As Michaela Chung author of The Irresistible Introvert, puts it, That's the thing about introverts. We wear our chaos on the inside, where no one can see it. At least until you get to know us really, really well. Eventually, Leanne learned not to care about what other people thought of her lack of enthusiasm. If anyone says I don't look excited enough or I'm too quiet, I will smile and point out that it's just my nature, she writes. I don't feel the need to defend myself or to spend a lot of time with those people because it doesn't do me any good to be around anyone who inadvertently triggers my old beliefs about myself. What many fail to see is that deep within the introvert, there is a lot going on, she continues. But rather than giving it a voice directly through talk and chatter, the introvert expresses it through activism, journaling, painting, creating music, planting a flower garden, fighting for some special cause, or even well-placed silence. Misconception number four, introverts hate people. 
in his semi-autobiographical screenplay, Barfly, Charles Bukowski penned a line that, decades later, would go on to become the introvert's anthem. This line gets passed around a lot in introvert circles. Perhaps you've heard it. In the screenplay, Wanda, a woman who has shacked up with the main character, Henry, asks him if he hates people. Henry, a lonely alcoholic, answers that no. Despite appearances, he doesn't. He simply feels better when there aren't any people around. Unfortunately, like Henry, many introverts get accused of being misanthropes. Our friends and loved ones think we dislike people because we like spending time alone. However, for most introverts, this is simply not true. In fact, some introverts like people so much that they've chosen extroverted careers that force them to interact with people every day. Their jobs drain them, but they feel the sacrifice is worth it in order to serve humankind. Many introverts are social workers, teachers, counselors, doctors, project managers, and so on. For example, Karen has been an IT project manager in the healthcare industry for over 35 years. She tells me that what she likes the most about her job is being able to help people use technology. There's also Vanessa, who has been a social worker for 10 years. She likes that her job lets her really get to know people and hear their stories. She gets to skip the small talk and jump right into meaningful conversation. Finally, Mary, a manufacturing consultant, feels that helping people by sharing her gifts is worth the sacrifice of becoming overstimulated. She says she loves seeing clients grow their businesses and fulfill their dreams. Misconception number five. All introverts are shy. Another misconception about introverts is that we're all shy. But that's simply not true. Introversion and shyness are two different things. If you're shy, you fear being judged negatively by others. You may frequently feel bashful, timid, nervous, and insecure in social settings, as well as experience physical sensations such as blushing or feeling shaky and breathless. If you're an introvert, you simply prefer calm, low-key environments. For example, a shy person might skip a dinner party because the thought of making small talk with strangers makes them scared and anxious, while an introvert might skip the party because relaxing at home is more enjoyable. You can be an introvert who is not shy or an extrovert who is shy. For example, Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, is an introvert who's not the least bit shy. He's described by Susan Cain in a Psychology Today blog post as nerdy and quiet, but also unruffled by anyone's opinion of him. On the other hand, Barbara Streisand, the larger-than-life music icon, is likely a shy extrovert. Most people don't know that she struggles with stage fright. After panicking during a performance in Central Park in 1967 and forgetting the words to one of her songs, Streisand avoided live performances for decades. Of course, you can be both shy and an introvert. As one might predict, psychologists have found that shyness and introversion overlap somewhat, meaning that some introverts act shy and that some shy people are introverted. There are several possible reasons behind this. One reason is some people are born with high reactive temperaments that make them inclined to both shyness and introversion, according to Kane. Also, shy people may become more introverted over time. Because social life is a source of anxiety, they may be inspired to discover the joy of being alone. Also, introverts may become shy after repeatedly receiving the message from peers, teachers, and parents that there's something wrong with them. It's important to know the difference between shyness and introversion, because if you're painfully shy, you can work to overcome your shyness. I did. I grew up horribly shy, but these days I worry a lot less about what people think of me, and it's freeing. But the more significant takeaway is that there's a bias in our society against both traits. According to Kane, studies show that we rank fast and frequent talkers as more likable, capable and intelligent than slow, quiet ones. This is the real misconception that needs to be squashed. 
Just because someone is shy or introverted does not mean they are any less competent and smart. Misconception number six. Introverts make poor leaders. Managing others, being in the spotlight, taking risks. These are qualities we associate with leaders and with extroversion. Does this mean introverts make poor leaders? Not at all. Introverts play a crucial role in every sphere of society, from business to politics to technology. In fact, USA Today reported that 40% of top executives are introverts, and some of the most notable leaders of our time are introverts, such as Bill Gates. He believes that introverts can make strong leaders. Speaking at an engagement in 2013, he said that there's a benefit to being introverted. Introverts have the unique ability to separate themselves from others for a few days, which allows them to think deeply about a problem, read everything they can about it, and consider angles that others haven't. Another introverted leader is Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo. Meyer told Vogue magazine that she gets the urge to run and hide during parties, even parties held at her own house. Her secret to dealing with her social avoidance tendencies? She looks at her watch and tells herself that she can't leave until a certain time. And she promises herself if she's still having a terrible time at X, she can leave. However, she usually finds that if she makes herself stay for a certain length of time, she gets over her social awkwardness and ends up having fun. Finally, there's Barack Obama, the former U.S. president. According to the New York Times author Michael D. Scheer, Obama spent four or five hours alone almost every night of his presidency. After having dinner with his wife and daughters, he withdrew to his private office, where he worked on speeches, read stacks of briefing papers, and read letters from Americans. But it wasn't all work. Obama indulged in his own version of introvert recharge time by watching ESPN, reading novels, or playing words with friends on his iPad. Like other introverts who have been accused of being stuck up or rude, Obama, too, was criticized for his aloof personality. But it was also his introspective nature and capacity for communication that made him a powerful leader and that gave him the reputation for having a different style than many on Capitol Hill. Misconception number seven. Introverts don't know how to have fun. Virginia Miel lives in Mexico, where big and frequent get-togethers are the norm. A quiet introvert, Virginia is often accused by family and friends of not knowing how to have fun. When a friend announced an upcoming birthday party, Virginia swore that this time would be different. She hated how she always became bored, tired, and irritable at parties. It was a reminder that being me was wrong, and that my level of fun was practically nil, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. But this time she would be ready. It took me a whole week to prepare for the party. She writes, I did internet research on different ways to start a conversation. I imagined myself dancing around, talking to strangers and laughing loudly. I swore I would make myself have fun and be like the rest. I was going to enjoy this freaking event. When the day of the party arrived, everyone was in their element, but once again, Virginia found herself shrinking back to a corner of the living room. Later in the night, a friend who always seemed to delight in alienating Virginia approached her. She pointed out to as many people as possible that I wasn't enjoying myself, Virginia writes. I responded that I was, but that I don't enjoy places with this much noise. Immediately, she regretted saying those words, because they weren't really true. She wasn't having fun, and it was obvious. Her friend remarked cattily that she knew how to have a good time. When I get older, the friend said, twisting the knife, I want to remember that I knew how to have fun when I was young. Virginia suffers from a common introvert misconception. Extroverts think that if something is fun for them, it should be fun for us, too. Although introverts can and do enjoy the occasional party, we generally have a different definition of fun. Our ideal Saturday night probably involves staying home, snuggled in our pajamas, and watching Netflix while eating takeout. Or maybe online gaming, reading a book, working on our graphic novel, coloring or composing songs. Or getting dinner with one of our favorite friends and talking about everything that is on our minds. 
Virginia doesn't worry anymore about what people think of her boring ways. I can be as fun as any other person, but in a different way, she writes. I love Saturday nights at home. Even if someone invites me to the most amazing party, I will thank that person for the invitation, but probably decline. And yes, that's okay. In closing, I hope you now have a better idea of what introversion is, and perhaps more important, what it's not. If someone is surprised to learn that you're an introvert, it could be because they don't understand what introversion truly is. Fight those misconceptions. Introverts are not disturbed recluses who hide away in dark bedrooms. Introverts have fun, laugh, and love, too. Chapter 4 Yes, the introvert hangover is real. Everyone wanted to talk to Shauna Corder, the newest addition to her fiancé's family. She was introduced to what felt like hundreds of people, one after the other, in quick succession. As the night wore on, the people around her became louder and more energetic, but Shauna, an introvert, became so exhausted that she could no longer keep a smile on her face. She couldn't take it anymore. I slipped away like a thief, skulking about the house, searching for a place where it was quiet, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. Eventually, she found that place, a half-lit room, empty except for her future brother-in-law, who was sitting alone, staring out the window. Knowing he was an introvert, too, Shauna figured this was her best option for escape. She sat down on the opposite side of the room, wrapping her arms around her knees. I remember hoping he wouldn't think I was intruding upon his own solitude before I allowed myself to zone out, letting my thoughts drown out the raucous laughter from downstairs, breathing deeply and feeling the tension drain away, she writes. I don't know how long it was before my now husband came looking for me, but I remember him laughing at finding the two introverts seeking refuge together. To this day, Shauna and her brother-in-law have not spoken of that night. There's no need, Shauna figures, because they both inherently understood what the other was experiencing. An introvert hangover brought on by too much socializing. I become physically unwell if I overextend. When Shauna wrote about her experience in an article for Introvert Dear called Yes, There Is Such a Thing as an Introvert Hangover, it went practically viral. Major media outlets like Inc. Magazine and New York Magazine chimed in, commenting on hangover symptoms and exploring the triggers behind this phenomenon. In the latter publication, Jesse Single describes his version of the introvert hangover in an article in the Science of Us section titled, Introvert Hangovers Can Be Really Rough. It's more about a general sense of anxiety and impatience. I find it harder and harder to make small talk, and more and more driven to be alone. The mind shutdown resonated, too. It gets harder and harder to fake genuine social interaction, though more so at a party with people I don't know than when in a small group of people I know and like. It wasn't just other writers who weighed in. The comment section of Shauna's article blew up. I might need a whole day to myself to recharge after a party, and I really feel like I was hung over. Headache, nausea, fatigue, the whole shebang, one reader comments. Another agrees. I often need the next day to recover, which is why I try really hard to never schedule two days of socializing back to back. And I definitely become physically unwell if I overextend. When Shauna wrote about her experiences, she had no idea she would hit on a topic that resonated so deeply with many introverts. It turns out Shauna was not alone in her introvert hangover. The introvert hangover is real. What an introvert hangover feels like. The introvert hangover could also be called social burnout or a social hangover. No matter what we call it, an introvert hangover can be rough. Some introverts experience physical symptoms. For Shauna, it starts with an actual physical reaction to overstimulation. Your ears might ring, your eyes start to blur, and you feel like you're going to hyperventilate. Maybe your palms sweat. 
Also, you may become irritable. This is what happened to Kayla after she spent the day at the Universal Studios theme park with her soon-to-be husband and his family. Even though the outing was fun, she quickly developed an introvert hangover. I got tired, not just physically tired, but mentally tired, and I got grumpy, she tells me. You know how a little kid gets fussy when they need a nap? It's the same for me. I needed a mental nap. On top of that, your mind may shut down. This happens to Brenda Knowles, an introvert blogger. On her blog, Space to Live, found at brendanoles.com, in a post called Introvert Explained, Why We Love You But Need to Get Away From You, she writes that introverts are not all recluses hanging out in dusty homes with cats and classic books. Not that there's anything wrong with cats and classic books. Introverts get out and rock it, but then we need to withdraw. If we don't, we will feel like an overdone steak. No life, no juice. Our minds will be zapped and cottony. Our speech may come out slowly, with pauses between words. There may be tears or swearing or both. Most important, when you experience an introvert hangover, you get an overwhelming desire to be alone. Contrary to popular belief, we introverts do enjoy socializing, writes Michaela Chung, creator of the blog Introvert Spring. In a post called Introvert, How to Cure a Social Hangover, she writes, We have our playmates and our passions, just as extroverts do. Some of us like to dance. Some of us like to drink. Some of us like to flirt and laugh and chase sunsets. Some of us have a habit of cramming all of the above into one day. And then, of course, we pay. When this happens, you don't want to talk to anyone. You just want to close the door and be alone for a while. Not for too long, just until the season turns or reality TV goes out of style. Every introvert experiences the introvert hangover a little differently. You may not get sweaty palms like Shauna or feel grouchy like Kayla. You may get an introvert hangover after 20 minutes of socializing or after two days, and it may last for a few minutes or a few hours. Your symptoms and the duration of the hangover will depend on several factors. The social situation itself, your own level of introversion, how much energy you had going into the social event, and the quality of your downtime afterward what everyone else does. Unfortunately, when you have an introvert hangover, your problems don't stop at mental and physical exhaustion. When other people notice you're getting burned out, they often make the situation worse, not better. They ask, Are you feeling okay? Or, Why are you being so quiet? They have good intentions. They want you to have a good time at the party or get-together, and they're worrying that you're not. What they don't know is being called out doesn't help. In fact, it probably just makes you feel self-conscious, which likely results in you doubling down on your extroverted efforts. This expends more social energy and ultimately makes your hangover worse. Worse yet, people accuse you of being a boring party pooper. Come on, just relax and have a good time. Or, don't you know how to have fun? An introvert hangover happens because introverts have a less active dopamine reward system than extroverts, as you learned in Chapter 2. If your friends knew you're an introvert who feels drained by socializing, they would probably understand. They might even help you find a quiet place to recharge, or not make you feel guilty for wanting to leave early. The problem is, when you're experiencing an introvert hangover, your feelings seem irrational. Everyone around you is having fun. They're not showing signs of social burnout, so why are you? Another problem is, when you feel exhausted and grouchy, the last thing you want is to summon what's left of your energy to give a lengthy explanation. Sure, other people would benefit from knowing about introverts and dopamine, but who wants to give a science lecture when your head is spinning? So you keep your feelings to yourself and end up snapping at others or glowering. You're accused of being no fun. Worst of all, you feel exhausted and unwell. For extroverts, recognizing the signs of an introvert hangover. If you have an introvert in your life, 
It's important to know the signs of an introvert hangover. Every introvert experiences social burnout in a different way, so they may have symptoms like these or different ones. Here are general signs to watch for. Zoning out, daydreaming or glazing over, becoming quiet, irritability, crankiness, grumpiness, speaking more slowly and having long pauses between words, appearing tired or low in energy, getting flustered when having to make decisions, feeling physically unwell, feeling anxious, down, or depressed, wanting to withdraw and be alone. Introverts tend to be highly self-aware, but surprisingly, this doesn't always translate to being aware of our own feelings and bodily sensations. Sometimes we don't recognize when we're getting burned out. Seemingly out of nowhere, we become combative, lethargic, and indecisive. Especially if we're used to overextending ourselves, an introvert hangover may just be our norm. You can do your introvert a favor by noticing when they're getting burned out. Check in with them and see if they need to get away and be alone. Your introvert will appreciate that you're looking out for them. The only way to cure an introvert hangover. There's only one cure for the introvert hangover. It's the same cure prescribed for actual hangovers induced by alcohol. No, I'm not talking about taking aspirin or eating a greasy burger. But hey, if it soothes your soul, then why not? The cure I'm talking about is time. In the case of the introvert hangover, it's time spent alone. When it comes to solitude, every introvert has a prescription that works for them. Jonathan Rausch, author of the popular Atlantic article, Caring for Your Introvert, has his need boiled down to a precise formula. After an hour or two of being on socially, he finds himself fading. That's when he needs to get away from the crowd and recharge. Roughly, for every one hour spent with people, he spends two hours in solitude. To him, this isn't a symptom of depression or antisocial behavior. Rather, being alone feeds him on a mental and emotional level, just like eating and resting sustain the body in a physical way. Not all alone time is the same. You can be alone while answering emails in your private office or driving by yourself in rush hour traffic. Your environment may not even be quiet. But this type of alone time probably won't restore your energy. Although there is no one else around, you're not really relaxed. True restorative alone time allows your mind to wander. You stop paying attention to things in the outside world and instead turn inward. You don't think about what's coming next on your schedule or what other people want you to do. You do whatever you want in the moment whether it's watching a show on Netflix, listening to music, or reading. Remember Kayla, the introvert who spent the day at Universal Studios with her soon-to-be in-laws? Although she had an introvert hangover, she couldn't leave the park until the outing was over, because the whole family had come together. At one point, when she felt really overloaded, she did something that likely saved the day. She went off on her own for a while. Thankfully, her fiancé, now husband, is an introvert too, so he understood. One more thing. Alone time doesn't have to be spent completely alone. As Kayla walked through the park, there were swarms of people around her. Nevertheless, she received an energy boost because she got to spend time not interacting with anyone. Similarly, for many introverts, downtime with their significant other counts as being alone. This is time when you're just hanging out and relaxing, with no real demands on you to act a certain way. You might lounge around the house in your pajamas or read a book on the couch while your significant other sits nearby playing a video game. Though you're not talking, you're in each other's presence. You're being alone together. This can be just as restorative as actually being by yourself. Being alone can be glorious. When you have an introvert hangover, finally getting to be alone is a glorious thing. It's quiet. No small talk. No one is demanding anything from you. When I was a teacher, I relished the moments of quiet at the end of the school day when I could finally close my classroom door and be alone. It was even better when I didn't have any plans after school 
and could go straight home to an empty apartment. On days when I was really overloaded, I would lie on the couch, just staring off into space. Watching Netflix, reading, or listening to a podcast would have been too much mental stimulation at that point. I needed to just be. One of my most vivid memories of being alone was in college. I had signed up to study abroad in Spain for a semester. As a shy introvert who at the time had never lived anywhere else but Minnesota, this was a big step for me. The first two days of the trip were grueling. Traveling from St. Paul to Madrid, I was surrounded by new people 24-7. What made it worse was everyone seemed to become friends with each other instantly, even though they had never met before. While I was trying to soothe my feelings of overstimulation, they were laughing and having fun. I felt simultaneously bombarded by people and left out. When we finally arrived at our hotel, my classmates quickly put together a plan to go bar hopping. One of them invited me. Here was my chance, I thought. I could finally break into their friend group. But that thought was quickly replaced with another. I was so exhausted I could barely think straight. I was overwhelmed by so many new things, new people, new food, a new language, and new experiences. I became anxious at the thought of adding one more thing to my already overloaded system. I didn't go. I just didn't have it in me. I knew staying in meant missing an opportunity to make friends. It also meant I'd have to wait to explore a new city. But I made up my mind that I would have to live with those facts. So I crept back to the hotel room I was sharing with two other women. I crawled into bed, but I didn't fall asleep. Instead, I lay there, relishing the silence and the fact that I was finally alone. Slowly, I could feel my body coming back to life. My mind relaxed, and I started to process all the new things I'd experienced. It was like my thoughts, which had been stuffed away in a jar those last two days, were suddenly released as the jar opened. As my thoughts flew out, I finally made sense of them. I'd like to say I didn't feel any regret when I saw my classmates the next day, but that wouldn't be true. They were worn out, but they looked closer than ever. They kept referencing things that had happened the night before, and I had no idea what they were talking about. I was left out of their inside jokes. As the trip went on, I never really made it into their inner circle. But ultimately, I believe I did the right thing. Looking back, high-energy people who partied often probably wouldn't have been the right friend fit for this low-key introvert anyway. Plus, the next day, as we toured an art museum, a church, and other places, I actually had the energy to enjoy these experiences. When the choice of solitude isn't clear. Introverts have to make difficult choices all the time, like the one I made in Madrid. Should we snatch up an opportunity to experience something new, potentially have fun, and make social connections, even though the trade-off is exhaustion and overstimulation? Or should we stay home and protect our energy but risk missing out? Sometimes the answer isn't clear. Rachel Ginder is another introvert who had to make a tough decision. During a trip to Europe with about two dozen other 20-something-year-olds, the group stopped in Germany for Oktoberfest one of the world's craziest and most renowned parties. As Rachel headed to the festival, she started to worry. She was someone who rarely got tipsy, even at home, and her idea of fun was relaxing quietly with a book. But she told herself she was overreacting. She was young and on the trip of a lifetime. Plus, she had forked over a good chunk of her hard-earned savings to be here. She shouldn't let it go to waste. As she joined the crushing crowd of Oktoberfest partiers, Rachel felt herself kicking into sensory overload. The noise was deafening, and I had to nearly scream into the ear of my friend next to me to be heard, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. I clung to the sleeve of her shirt so we wouldn't be separated in the throng of people, but I found it nearly impossible to keep my grip as I was jostled on all sides. It took what felt like hours for Rachel to make it several hundred feet to the closest beer tent. Even after shoving our way inside, where the throng was slightly less dense, I felt agitated, shaky, and a little bit dizzy, she writes. These were not happy, adrenaline-fueled responses. 
Her gut was telling her to leave. Rachel had a difficult decision to make. Should she give up on this experience of a lifetime? Or should she tough it out in the hope that she'd eventually have fun? After all, she had chosen to come on this trip. She was looking for a little excitement. In the end, Rachel decided to leave. Another introvert in her group, who was also not having fun, left with her. Rachel didn't even know the person's name until later that night, but in the chaos of Oktoberfest, their social exhaustion united them. They worked together to find the nearest exit and found their way back to their rooms. At the hotel, Rachel felt better. However, she also realized that leaving Oktoberfest came with a trade-off. I would like to tell you I felt empowered by my decision, got a full eight hours of sleep and had no regrets about my choice for the rest of the trip. Unfortunately, that's not wholly the truth, she writes. The next morning, my friends were full of stories about dancing on tables and meeting cute guys from foreign countries. Once again, I felt an inner war between the part of me that wishes to be spontaneous and the part that knows that just being in another country was already far beyond my usual comfort zone. Ultimately, Rachel believes she made the right decision. For me, it's a big deal to make it through a trip without giving in to exhaustion. In order to make it, I need to say no to certain activities to conserve my mental health, even if part of me wants to say yes just for the experience, she writes. The struggle might be mental rather than physical, but for me, it's no different than refusing a piece of cake that might give me a stomachache, or a liter of Oktoberfest beer that might induce a hangover. No one would judge a person for making decisions based on their physical health. So please don't judge me for attempting to maintain my mental health. Unfortunately, there aren't any hard and fast rules for maintaining your mental health, like there are for, say, healthy eating or exercise. Everyone needs to figure out what works for them based on their own levels of introversion or extroversion. One person's party might be another person's worst nightmare, Rachel writes. The key is not trying to be wild and spontaneous as someone else understands it, but being wild and spontaneous for who you are as an individual. I'm still finding that balance. The more I test my comfort zone, the closer I come to finding where my boundaries lie. Perhaps next time I might consider dancing on a few tables. Or maybe I'll just dance at home by myself where the lighting is perfect and the music is at just the right level. Should I stay or should I go? Like Rachel's experience in Germany and mine in Spain, the choice between staying in and going out isn't always obvious. Maybe you're not on a once-in-a-lifetime trip but are simply trying to decide whether you should attend a friend's birthday party. You don't want to let your friend down. What if the night ends up being fun and you miss it? However, if you go, you'll likely become exhausted and overstimulated. Often, we don't really know how an event will affect us until we're there. My personal rule is if I think I'll be able to tolerate the social drain and there seems to be a potential for meaningful interaction, I'll go. If I'm already exhausted because it's been a long work week or I've already had too many social obligations, I skip it. If the event doesn't promise meaningful interaction, that's another reason to stay home. All of this assumes that it wouldn't be incredibly rude of me to decline, meaning it's not my grandpa's 90th birthday party or my best friend's wedding. In cases like those, you probably have to suck it up and make an appearance. It's not always easy to determine if a get-together promises meaningful interaction. Once I went to a friend's birthday party that involved a huge group dinner followed by hanging out at a nightclub, which was also an arcade. Talk about sensory overload. There were flashing lights, crowds, and noise everywhere. Halfway through the night, I ended up meeting a fellow introvert who wasn't sure if he wanted to be there either. We spent the night talking, just the two of us. Later, from a safe distance, we made jokes and sarcastic comments as we watched the crowd writhe on the dance floor. Needless to say, it unexpectedly ended up being a fun, memorable night. There have been other times when something I thought would be fun didn't turn out that way. There's just no guarantee how a social event will go. 
The important thing is to accept that no perfect decision exists. There will be trade-offs no matter what you decide, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Often you have to just make your decision and deal with whatever happens. And if you end up wanting to go home 30 minutes after you arrive, give yourself permission to do just that. How to prevent an introvert hangover. Sometimes you really, really do want to go to something, even though you're certain you'll get slapped with an introvert hangover. Jax is an introvert who's into cosplay. She faces this conundrum every year when she attends Dragon Con in Atlanta, which is a five-day sci-fi convention that boasts more than 70,000 people in attendance. The crowds are unbelievable, Jax tells me. The partying and panels and contests are nonstop. It can be an emotional meat grinder for even an extrovert. Thankfully, Jax and her friends have discovered some strategies that allow them to enjoy the conference and avoid introvert hangovers. For starters, they make sure their group has an equal mix of introverts and extroverts. That way, the extroverts always have other extroverts to talk to, and the introverts can find support among their fellow introverts if they need to sidestep the crowd and not talk for a bit. They book several hotel rooms so everyone has a safe, quiet place to retreat to. And they come prepared. They keep crockpots and coolers in their rooms so anyone who needs to escape can relax and make a snack. This also helps them avoid lengthy food lines, which can be torture for a hungry introvert. Most important, when the convention is over, Jack schedules plenty of alone time to recover. Every introvert has their own tricks for dealing with overstimulation. Here are some more ideas from fellow introverts to help you avoid an introvert hangover, no matter where you are. I always make sure I'm in my own vehicle. I leave once I've had enough. Brandon. I always have an escape plan, as in I will figure out ahead of time what my legitimate excuse is for leaving early. If needed, I will deploy it. Kayla. What helps me with events is doing as much advanced preparation as possible. If I haven't been to the event site before, I'll Google the directions. I'll iron my outfit the evening before, and I'll give myself plenty of time to get there. Once I decide to attend an event, I'll decide at that point how long I'll stay. I also make sure to get alone time before and after the event. Francis I check my phone. It's my companion when I feel like I'm out of place, and it's the best weapon to ignore people around. Angie. I take mini breaks to people watch. I'm fine being around people if I'm not having to socialize. So if I can find a place to sit and have a drink and just watch people for a little while, it lets me recharge. Shannon. I take five-minute breaks about every 20 minutes. I go where it is completely silent and just soak in the silence. Noah. I set my phone alarm to sound after one hour of company to remind me to slip away and check in with myself. Preventatively, I take one whole day per week off from the world. I stay at home and avoid overstimulation. It is a sacred day of rest. Sunny. I focus on finding one person who will talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Maria. In closing. Shauna who first wrote about the introvert hangover, went on to attend more family gatherings with her now husband's gregarious, if slightly overwhelming, family. Obviously, I knew that was part of the deal by the time I married him, she writes, but things are getting easier. She now listens to her body's signals and makes her introvert needs clear. I make my own clear demands for personal time and space, she writes, because as introverts, if we want to avoid a hangover, moderation is key. Chapter 5 Introverts aren't unsociable. We socialize differently. Introverts don't hate socializing. It's that we do it differently than extroverts. For example, although I avoid big parties like the plague, one of my favorite things is to get dinner with my best friend, a fellow introvert. We talk about everything that's on our minds. Something incredible happens after these conversations. Even though I've been socializing for hours, I leave the restaurant feeling energized 
not drained. That's because these conversations are inner world to inner world. My friend and I share reflections, insights, and ideas, the secrets of our mental landscape. The focus is on the internal. Extroverts discuss ideas, too, but the ideas are usually less important than the interaction itself, and they emerge as the conversation takes place. For them, the focus is more external. In this chapter, we'll explore how introverts socialize differently from extroverts. And if your life is missing that soul-nourishing inner world talk, listen on. Later in this chapter, I'll give you ideas for starting meaningful conversations and making friends who actually get you. Breadth versus Depth When it comes to friendships, extroverts want the variety of the buffet, whereas introverts want the quality of the chef special. In other words, the general rule is this. Extroverts seek breadth while introverts crave depth. For example, I know two young stand-up comedians with very different temperaments, Misha the extrovert and Austin the introvert. After a show, they both hang out in the lobby to talk with friends and fans, but they take very different approaches. Misha, full of energy, works the room. He bounces from one person to the next, rarely talking with anyone for more than a few minutes. And because of this, he's the most socially connected person I know. He invited over 300 people to his birthday party. He had to rent a theater to hold them all. Austin, on the other hand, stays mostly in the same location, talking with the few people he's developed a meaningful relationship with. Of course, there are times when these two break their normal patterns of behavior, and Austin can be found going from group to group, while Misha talks at length with just one person. But in general, it's breadth versus depth. It's not that Austin is a misanthrope. He's a caring, warm person who volunteers as an English instructor. But if he had to switch places with Misha, schmoozing with all those fans, he'd probably find himself succumbing to an introvert hangover. Like Austin, introverts tend to keep their social circles small because they want to dive deep. Daniel Pinckney, writing on his blog Mr. P. Inc., calls this all-or-nothing syndrome. He writes, In order to develop that degree of closeness, intimacy, and freedom, a lot of time-slash-energy needs to be expended. And therein lies the problem. If I have a friend or partner, I want to be able to give them my all, so anyone outside that small circle usually gets relegated to acquaintances. If I can't give my best to any one person, I'd rather not give it all. Despite what society might tell you, it's perfectly okay to have just a few close friends. There's nothing wrong with saving the bulk of your energy for the people you truly click with. As introverts, we only have so much people energy to give. When we invest in a relationship, we want it to be exceptional. It's about balance. Introverts keep their social circle small, and that's okay. Just make sure your social circle isn't zero. Interestingly, research shows that everyone, both extroverts and introverts, can feel happier after socializing. Researcher William Fleeson and his colleagues tracked a group of people every three hours for two weeks, recording what they did and how they felt during each chunk of time. They found that those who'd acted talkative and assertive were more likely to report feeling positive emotions such as enthusiasm and excitement in the moment. It didn't matter whether the subject identified as an introvert or an extrovert. Everyone reported a happiness bump after acting outgoing. Does this mean that introverts should rent theaters and throw birthday parties to the tune of 300 people? Not exactly. Introverts really do get worn out by socializing, and the quality of our interactions matter. But it does mean we need some socializing. It's all about balance. We can't party all weekend. But we also shouldn't shut ourselves away in our homes for years, a la the poet Emily Dickinson. Find what works for you. Dinner with your best friend, writing a thoughtful email to your sister to catch her up on your week, or messaging with online friends. The important thing is to be social on your own terms. You may find that if you initiate the interaction, you'll have more control over it. And ultimately, this can help prevent social brain drain.
Rules for being friends with an introvert. Introverts need friends too, but let's face it, navigating a friendship can be tricky. You have expectations for how the relationship should go, and so do they. And those expectations don't always match up. That's when feelings turn sour. So in the interest of introverts everywhere and the people who become friends with them, I'm going to lay down some ground rules. Suggested use. Mention these points casually to your friends and talk about which rules resonate with you and which ones don't. Highly discouraged. Hanging this section of the book where your friends will see it and handing out citations to rule breakers like a traffic cop. Here are 14 rules for being friends with an introvert. 1. If you want to get to know us better, hang out with us one-on-one. -on -one. Have you ever wanted to make an introvert disappear? Put them in a large group. They'll quietly fade into the background. And pretty soon it's like they're not even there. But when you get introverts alone, it's a different story. Introverts thrive in more intimate settings because when we're talking to just one person, it drastically reduces our stimulation level. We only have to pay attention to the words, body language, and tone of voice of one person. Plus, during a one-on-one, -on -one, it's easier to talk about more meaningful things. Group talk tends to revolve around safe topics like the news, jokes, and only the parts of your spring break trip to Cancun that are clean enough to tell your grandma. Introverts want to share ideas and talk authentically about things that matter. 2. Likewise, if you say it's just going to be the two of us, don't invite other people. It's a little hurtful if we feel like we're just another warm body in your extrovert entourage. We want to mean something to you, because if we're friends, you mean a lot to us. Plus, we were probably looking forward to talking to just you and we didn't mentally prepare ourselves to interact with people whom we may not be comfortable with. Before you invite other people, check with us. We might be totally up for it if we've got the energy, or we might not. Either way, we'll feel like you've respected our preferences. 3. We'd rather have a tiny moment of real connection than hours of polite chit-chat. How are you really? What's really on your mind? Don't just tell us that you had a good weekend. Tell us it was good because you finally sorted out your complicated feelings about your ex. Or that you're having an existential crisis over the fact that you're getting older and that you haven't accomplished the things you thought you would have accomplished by now. We'd rather know what's going on inside you, what's really going on, than just see the polished facade that you display to everyone else. How are your ideas, thoughts, and feelings evolving? 4. Sometimes we need encouragement to open up about ourselves. As much as introverts enjoy meaningful, authentic conversation, we can struggle to get there. In fact, we tend to keep our thoughts, opinions, and feelings to ourselves, especially around people we don't know well. For example, there have been many times when something was bothering me and I wanted to talk to someone about it. But because I worried I was inconveniencing the people around me, or I just didn't know what to say to steer the conversation my way, I didn't bring it up. I've gotten better at advocating for myself as I've gotten older, but sometimes it's still hard. If you notice that your new introvert friend looks particularly distracted, maybe there's something that's weighing heavily on their mind that they don't know how to talk about. Try asking them good-natured, non-prying questions. You don't seem quite like yourself today. Is there something on your mind that you'd want to talk about? Of course, if they say they don't want to talk about it, don't push too hard. But showing a little interest in us and directly inviting us to talk can go a long way. 5. We may have a hard time confronting you about something. In the same way that we may struggle to open up, we may also shy away from conflict. This isn't true of all introverts. I know introverts who are just as blunt and confrontational as some extroverts. But in general, introverts don't like to rock the boat. Remember the study that said introverts saw an angry person's gaze as a threat? It's like that. 
Angry, harsh words can be overstimulating. And we're likely to brood on hurtful comments, making the matter worse. But if a friend crosses a boundary, they probably won't hear about it right away. We likely won't erupt on the spot, unless it's really bad. Rather, we'll go home, think about what was said or done, and bring it up a day or two later. Or send you an email. It's easier to write our thoughts than speak them. 6. We may get lost in our own little world. The introvert's inner world is vivid and alive. It's as real as the world around us that we can see, smell, touch, taste, and feel. This means we're prone to daydreaming and getting lost in our thoughts. While we're hanging out, if we drift off for a moment, don't say things like, Hey, where'd you go? Or, Hello, come back to Earth. This will probably make us feel self-conscious. Don't worry, we're just taking a short trip to the realm of our thoughts, and we'll be back with you in a few moments. 7. Our silence means we're processing. Likewise, if we're having a conversation with you and we're quiet for a moment, we're probably thinking about what you said. Give us a beat to collect our thoughts. We like to think before we speak. And then we'll lay some introvert wisdom on you. 8. We like talking, too. I have an extroverted friend who will go on and on about her life if given the chance. Suddenly, twenty minutes have gone by, and I've barely said anything. I like to listen and be supportive of her, but even I have my limits, as all introverts do. Please remember that, although introverts are good listeners, we still like to talk, too. Unfortunately, many people interpret our silence and our lack of interrupting as an invitation to keep talking. Make sure your quiet friend gets their turn, too. 9. We may not call or text you as much as your extroverted friends. That doesn't mean we're not thinking about you. On the contrary, you probably float through our busy mind quite a bit when we're apart. But we know we'll soon see each other again, and we'd rather catch up in a way that's meaningful. In person, over coffee, one-on-one. -on -one. 10. Give us time to mentally prepare to hang out. Spontaneity can be fun, and it has its place. But as a general rule, don't text us and ask us to be ready to hang out in ten minutes. We need time to mentally prepare for socializing, even if it's with a close friend. Every introvert is different, but I prefer to be asked to socialize at least a day in advance. 11. As much as we love you, please don't show up at our house without asking. Our home is our sacred space where we can, hopefully, quietly recharge. This goes back to the whole, we need to be mentally prepared to see people thing. 12. If we don't answer your text, email, or Facebook message right away, don't think we're ignoring you. We might want to think for a while about how we'll respond. I often read messages and don't answer right away because I want to think of the best way to answer. Or we may be in introvert recharge mode. No people, no messaging, no phone. For our own mental sanity, sometimes we need to completely disconnect from people in every way. 13. Please know that as much as we had fun hanging out with you yesterday, we probably don't want to hang out again today. You may feel energized from hanging out the day before, but we feel tired, even if we enjoyed ourselves. Give us some time to be in introvert mode, and we promise we'll want to see you again soon. 14. If we say we want to stay home, we really do just want to stay home. We're not trying to hide from you. We're not sending you the passive-aggressive message that we don't want to be friends anymore. We likely just need some downtime to recharge. If you want more friends... What if you're staying home every weekend, not because you need to recharge, but because you don't have anyone to hang out with? Shauna Corder, yes, ironically the same person who wrote about the introvert hangover, understands this problem. One of my biggest regrets about the past decade of my life is that I didn't make more of an effort to make friends of my own, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. 
I got caught up in work, in my marriage, in taking care of my family. It wasn't until she was packing to move away from her home in Los Angeles that she realized that she hadn't gotten to know many people in the five-plus years she'd lived there. Why didn't I go out and do more things, meet more people? Honestly, it was because I was afraid, she writes. I was plagued by what-ifs. What if I showed up at an event and no one talked to me? What if I said or did something embarrassing? What if, what if, what if? I allowed those fears to stop me. As Shauna drove across the country to her new home, she realized she didn't want to let fear control her anymore. She challenged herself to step out of her introvert comfort zone and meet more people. She's been in her new city for over two years now, and she feels like she's finally created the kind of life she wants to live. Finding your people is hard. As an adult, where do you go to meet new people? And how do you start a conversation with someone you barely know? Hanging out with people you don't know well can be draining. Also, you don't want to be friends with just anyone. That means the chatty extrovert who parties every weekend probably won't become your BFF. You're looking for a friend who understands you, someone you truly click with. So what's an introvert to do? Here are nine ideas to help you make friends with people who truly get you. One, think about the people you already know. You don't have to head to the nearest party or networking event to make new friends. Chances are there are already people in your life whom you'd like to get to know better. Ask yourself, which of your acquaintances seem interesting? Make it a point to talk to these people more. Two. It's okay to make the first move. Many introverts, myself included, are guilty of waiting for other people to come to them. We worry about rejection. What if I ask her to get coffee after class and she says no? Or worse, what if he gets to know me better and he doesn't like who I am? As Shauna experienced, the process of making new friends can fill a person with self-doubt. And if you're an introvert who has experienced significant rejection, as many of us have, you may feel so discouraged you don't even want to try anymore. In college, I learned a hard lesson about being passive about making friends. When I moved away from home and left my childhood friends behind, I quickly found myself alone and lonely. I looked around and wondered how everyone had become friends with each other so quickly. Eventually, I realized I wasn't making an effort to get to know anyone. I was skipping social mixers and dorm events that were designed for freshman mingling. I saw classes as an opportunity to, well, learn something, when they could have been an opportunity to both learn and meet new people. I had wrongly assumed that making friends would just happen without any action on my part. I'm not saying you have to turn yourself into an extrovert, but you can give yourself permission to go first. 3. Peel off the mask. Some introverts keep their thoughts and preferences hidden because they worry about others judging them. They don't reveal who they really are, fearing what others may think. But this can lead to having hollow relationships and becoming friends with people who don't really get you. Instead, when you meet someone you want to connect with, be brave and show them who you really are. Say what you really think and feel, even if you worry they'll disagree or won't be able to relate. You can do this bit by bit. It doesn't have to be a flood. And you can do it tactfully. When you peel off the mask, you make yourself vulnerable. And this is how true connection is created. 4. Ask questions. Introverts have a superpower. Listening. Ask the other person questions about themselves. What's new in their life? If they could have any career they want, what would it be? Use your powerful listening skills to learn more about them. Plus, when you get them talking, it takes the spotlight off you. 5. Notice how you feel. Do you feel energized after hanging out with your new friend? Or are you so exhausted that you want to hide in your bedroom for days? As an introvert, it's normal to feel tired after spending time with someone new. After all, 
Peeling off the mask takes precious energy. But overall, your friend should make you feel good, not drained. It's okay to listen to your feelings. Use them to guide your interactions with your new friend. 6. Watch out for potentially toxic relationships. It's not uncommon for introverts to get stuck in one-sided or toxic relationships. During an interview with me, Adam S. McHugh, author of Introverts in the Church, says, We give people space to express themselves, which is our gift and our curse. People feel safe around us and share openly with us because they know we won't interrupt them or compete for attention. We are often content letting other people shape how conversations go. In other words, when you're the calm one who listens sympathetically, you can end up on the losing end of a relationship with a toxic person. That's because emotionally needy people usually lack self-awareness. They may not even realize that they're dominating the relationship. They may often try to turn the conversation back to them and their problems, and their pain can become a controlling factor in the friendship. That's why it's important to set boundaries. If you don't, you may feel like you're losing yourself in unhealthy relationships. No matter what your temperament, the key to avoiding toxic relationships is a strong sense of self, Adam says. If you lack that, you will probably find yourself in one-sided relationships with unhealthy people. One of the most helpful changes he has made is making sure that he's not the only one initiating in a relationship. By initiation, he means not only whether people text or invite him to coffee, but also whether people ask questions about his life and show genuine interest in his responses. Those are the people worth investing in, he tells me. 7. Remember that the awkwardness will go away with time. Introverts tend to keep their best stuff inside, quirky, fun personalities, and only let their true selves out once they feel comfortable around someone. If being with your new friend is somewhat awkward at first, don't beat yourself up. The more you hang out with them, the more comfortable you'll feel. Keep at it. 8. Plan a regularly scheduled meetup. Ask your new friend and maybe a few others to hang out once a week. Have brunch every Saturday morning or get a drink after work every Thursday. Having a standing friend date means you don't have to exert as much energy to plan something. The details are already taken care of. Plus, routine tends to make us introverts feel more comfortable because then we know what to expect. 9. Go slowly. Genuine friendship takes time to develop. If you bow to the pressure to start collecting groupies, you'll likely end up with shallow, unsatisfying relationships that fall apart because there was never a true connection. Allow relationships to develop naturally. How to Ditch Small Talk As an introvert who craves meaningful interaction, this will probably come as no surprise to you. Psychologist Matthias Mell and his team discovered a link between happiness and substantive conversation. His study, published in the journal Psychological Science, involved college students who wore an electronically activated recorder with a microphone on their shirt collar that captured 30-second snippets of conversation every 12 and a half minutes for four days. Effectively, this created a conversational diary of their day. Then researchers went through the conversations and categorized them as either small talk, talk about the weather, a recent TV show, etc., or more substantive conversation, talk about philosophy, current affairs, etc. Researchers were careful not to automatically label certain topics a certain way. For example, if the speakers analyzed a TV show's characters and their motivations, this conversation was considered substantive. They also found that some conversations didn't fit neatly into either category. These were discussions that focused on practical matters, like who would take out the trash or what the homework assignment was. Ultimately, the researchers found that about one-third of the college students' conversations were considered substantive, while one-fifth consisted of small talk. The researchers also studied how happy the participants were, drawing data from life satisfaction reports the college students completed themselves 
as well as feedback from people in the students' lives. The results? Mel and his team found that the happiest person in the study had twice as many substantive conversations and only one-third of the amount of small talk as the unhappiest person. Almost every other conversation the happiest person had, about 46% of the day's conversations, were substantive. For the unhappiest person, only 22% of this person's conversations were substantive. Similarly, small talk made up only 10% of the happiest person's conversations, while it made up almost three times as much, about 29%, of the unhappiest person's discussions. Further research is still needed, because it's not clear whether people make themselves happier by having substantive conversations, or whether people who are already happy choose to engage in meaningful talk. However, one thing is evident. Happiness and meaningful interactions go hand in hand. Mel, in an interview with the New York Times, discusses the reasons why he thinks substantive conversations are linked to happiness. For one, humans are driven to create meaning in their lives, and substantive conversations help us do that, he says. Also, human beings, both introvert and extrovert, are social animals who have a real need to connect with others. Substantive conversation connects, whereas small talk doesn't. Want to have more substantive conversations? Here are five ideas to help you ditch the small talk. One, get the other person to tell a story. Small talk can be boring because we often ask questions that can be answered in just one or two words. For example, how are you? Fine. Or how was your day? Pretty good. To ditch the small talk, try asking more open-ended questions like, what was the most interesting thing that happened at work today? Questions like these invite the other person to tell a story. Here are some more ideas. Instead of, How are you? How was your weekend? Where did you grow up? What do you do for a living? Try, What's your story? What was your favorite part of your weekend? Tell me something interesting about where you grew up. What drew you to your line of work? 2. Be curious. As an introvert, you're probably naturally curious. You wonder how the world works or what makes a person tick. When talking with others, channel your instinctive curiosity. Put yourself in the mindset of being curious to learn more about the other person. You'll probably find that you listen more intently, your body language will show that you're engaged, and you'll more easily think of questions that move the conversation forward. Plus, being curious about others is a highly attractive quality, and it creates immediate interest and intimacy. 3. Ask why instead of what. This is a twist on asking open-ended questions. Instead of asking about the facts, what questions, ask people why they made certain decisions. For example, after you've asked, what college did you go to, follow up with, why did you choose that college? 4. Share details about yourself and see what sticks. This can be hard for introverts because we tend to dislike talking about ourselves. It puts the spotlight on us, and we may feel exposed. As a result, we get stuck in cycles of mind-numbing small talk in which we don't reveal anything about ourselves, and in turn we don't learn anything meaningful about the other person. This prevents the relationship from growing in a satisfying way. To avoid this, share a few details about yourself and see what sticks. If you work in an office or go to school, you probably get asked, how are you, several times a day. Instead of giving the typical response, I'm fine, how are you, expand on your answer and give a few details about your day. You might say something like, good, I got up early this morning to get coffee from my favorite coffee shop. Then notice how the other person reacts. Do they keep the conversation going by asking a follow-up question? Nice. What's your favorite coffee shop? Or do they give a disinterested nod? If the other person doesn't seem interested, try revealing another detail about yourself until you hit on a topic that gets the two of you talking. I had a really hard time with last night's assignment. I couldn't figure out what the professor wanted. Did you understand what we're supposed to do? 5. Dare to be honest. 
We often sacrifice expressing our true thoughts and feelings for the sake of politeness. But there's something very authentic and surprisingly charming about being completely honest. In The Irresistible Introvert, Michaela Chung writes that you can quickly take conversations to a deeper level by saying things like, To be honest, I don't go to parties very much. I feel pretty overwhelmed being here. I'm not a big talker, but I like listening. I don't like camping, like, at all. I'm really proud of that. This feels awkward. That hurt my feelings. No, I don't want to go. I'd rather stay home and have some me time. Be careful not to take this to the extreme. You risk alienating your conversation partner if you overshare or insult. However, if done right, even one authentic disclosure can quickly build intimacy, because honesty draws people in. When friends drift apart, it can be hard to make meaningful connections. It can be even harder when you lose a close friend. That's what happened to Mallory Severe, who became friends with someone unexpected. A fellow classmate in graduate school, her new friend was one of those people whom everyone liked. In Mallory's own words, she was a force in the world. Mallory, on the other hand, is a quiet introvert. To her surprise, they spent hours together studying, sharing stories, and enjoying deep conversation. Mallory opened up to her in ways she had never expected. After graduation, the two moved to different cities, and that's when they drifted apart. During their last conversation, Mallory accused her friend of treating her as though she were not a priority. She admits that she was harsh with her words, but she was desperate to hold on to a relationship that meant so much to her. The two women have not spoken since that argument, and she worries that the friendship is beyond repair. The loss was extremely painful for Mallory because it's not often that she finds someone who truly gets her. In those rare instances when a real friendship develops and I feel truly understood by the other person, it is nearly impossible to let go of them, Mallory writes in an Introvert Dear article. Finding someone who is willing to indulge my interests, as obscure as they sometimes are, as freely as I am willing to indulge theirs, is a gift. It is rare to feel so truly accepted. Have you ever lost a good friend? You may find yourself ruminating on what happened, feeling like you can't get your thoughts to change tracks and move on. Mallory writes that she spent hours going over the different scenarios for how things could have gone differently with her friend, but this was not productive because she couldn't change the past, and brooding drained her energy. Mallory found it helpful to write about her feelings and to talk about the situation with another close friend. Getting her thoughts out of her head helped her to process them better and to break free of the rumination cycle. If you have recently lost a friendship, you may want to take this time to appreciate your other relationships. While you may not have as deep of a relationship with your other friends, you likely have a group of people around you who love you. Those friends who were there for me during my friendship grieving process have endeared themselves to me in ways they will never know, Mallory writes. The sense of trust their actions have engendered have allowed me to be more open with them and to be more willing to trust them with the deeper parts of my being. To prevent a devastating loss from happening again, ask yourself if you're seeking relationships with reciprocity. Relationships require reciprocity in order for both parties to be fulfilled. If a relationship becomes too one-sided, you may begin to resent one another. Of course, we all go through waves of needing more at certain times in our lives, and these waves are a normal part of life. But if your relationship is constantly out of balance, you may not be as good friends as you think. If you're always the one initiating contact, setting up times to meet, sending the first text, etc., the relationship may be one-sided. Likewise, both parties need to get something out of the relationship. This means one person is not doing all the talking, asking for all the favors, or always leaning on the other for emotional support. The amount of give and take should be roughly equal. Finally, recognize that it's normal to be close to certain friends for a time, even if you drift away later. 
Often friendship is born when we have things in common. We attend the same school, work in the same office, or live in the same neighborhood. When we lose our common ground, for example, when you get a different job and no longer see your co-worker turn friend every day, the friendship may change. You may not have done anything wrong. Of course, just because your life or your friend's life is changing doesn't mean you have to lose the relationship, but you may have to put in extra effort to maintain it. The introverted best friend I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter was my college roommate. Today our lives are very different from the way they were in college, and although we live an hour's drive away from each other, we meet once a week in between our two cities for dinner. In Closing Introverts may balk when they get invited to parties. They may wish their friends would stop texting for a while and leave them alone. It's true that certain types of socializing drain us, but introverts need friends too. Because of our limited people energy, we don't let just anyone into our lives, but we treasure the relationships we do have. If you're in our inner circle, know that you're very special to us. Chapter 6 Please Just Leave Me Alone Rachel Ginder, yes, the same Rachel who fled Oktoberfest, decided she would finally build the social life of her dreams. She created an account on the social networking site meetup.com, joined some groups, and for several months committed to being as social as possible. I went to anything I could find on Fridays or Saturdays, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. I even went to the occasional outing on a weeknight, and if nothing else was going on, I forced myself to go out to a movie by myself, with the continued hope that I might make myself approachable to friendly strangers. There was one particular meet-up group she joined that consisted of women in their twenties and thirties. It wasn't uncommon for them to get together several nights a week. They thought nothing of hosting a game night on a Thursday evening that stretched well past 11 p.m., and then organizing a brunch two days later and or a possible shopping trip that promised to last well into the evening, she writes. In theory, this was exactly what Rachel had been looking for. She gained lots of friends and was getting out of the house often. In reality, it turned out to be her worst nightmare. She quickly found herself exhausted. After coming home in the evening, I typically need a couple of hours to unwind before I can go to sleep, she writes. Although being around people often leaves me physically tired, my brain will not shut off unless I've had enough time to mentally process all that's just happened. Unfortunately, staying up after midnight, mentally processing, isn't a very good excuse for coming into work late on a Wednesday. No matter how well organized or scheduled these group parties were, they left me feeling drained. Plus, in a group of 15 or more people, it was impossible to get quality one-on-one -on -one time to engage in meaningful conversation. Missing that conversation was keeping me from gaining any emotional fulfillment from the evening, she explains. Rachel lasted with this dream group of friends for about two weeks. One night, as the last of the wine was being drunk, someone asked Rachel if she was going to the next happy hour. She said no, offering a vague excuse about having a lot of work. Secretly, she was planning to stay home, watch Netflix, and recharge. Rachel then deflected by asking the woman if she was planning to go. She replied, yes, I don't have anything else to do. This struck Rachel as odd. And there was the problem, because I had discovered that whenever I was socializing, I always felt like I had something else I could be doing. In her attempts to live the dream life of an extrovert, she found herself neglecting the fulfilling things she really enjoyed. My home was full of overdue library books, unfinished writing projects, and the ingredients for at least a half dozen Pinterest recipes I didn't have the time to make. I was even beginning to miss the boring things, like watching the news while folding laundry. In Rachel's attempt to be more social, she found herself living a more unbalanced and unhappy existence than ever before. She wasn't getting enough alone time to recharge, and because of this she was suffering. She realized that she needed to stop prioritizing meaningless social events that she was just using to keep busy. 
She already had a half dozen hobbies and interests that kept her busy every night of the week. A person who is truly busy doesn't have time to go out for dinner every night and bar crawl every weekend, because that person is already going to the gym, working on a craft project, or making themselves dinner, she writes. It's perfectly okay to turn down social events for any of those reasons. It's healthy, even. It means you are living a balanced life. These days, she usually spends her Friday nights going grocery shopping. Then she comes home, makes dinner, and binge watches Friends while she folds laundry. Sometimes I do this because I want to get the chores out of the way before I spend Saturday with some of the new people I've met, or curl up at the local coffee shop with only a book for company. She writes, No matter which one it is, I consider myself to be having a pretty busy weekend. It's no secret that solitude is the introvert's fuel for life. In this chapter, we'll explore the introvert's love of solitude, including why downtime makes your life better and how to get more of it. Introvert's Favorite Things to Do Alone Whether it's reading a book, playing video games, or just quietly daydreaming, introverts gain energy from solitude. I asked introverts what activities they like to do when they're alone. Here's what they told me. Read, watch movies, surf the internet, or just relax. Sophia. Painting, playing with my cats, reading, sometimes just laying down and thinking for hours. Also, I like to organize if I have something messy around the house. Kadisa. I usually watch TED Talks. It's nice hearing opinions from others on how they live their lives, react to things, and solve their problems. Grant. I always dive into the world of the Internet. I can see how people are doing, send a few emails, catch up on the news and whatever else. This way I can go at my own pace, and I don't have to make eye contact, deal with annoying small talk, or really interact with anyone unless I choose to. Kayla. Zone out, drink tea, and listen to good music. Emily. Play games on the computer or watch Star Trek. Basically any escapist behavior. I recharge ten times faster if I'm engaged in something fantastical. Steve. Gardening, swimming alone, meditating in the corner, making a scrapbook in a locked room. Orola. Solitude is prime writing time when there's no danger of the real world unceremoniously yanking me out of my imaginary world every five minutes. Eric. If I'm alone, you can guarantee I'm binge-watching one of my favorite TV shows. Courtney. I love to read, go on Facebook, watch movies, spend time with my cats, and think about life. Thomas. Solitude really does make your life better. It's also no secret that our society values doing over being. If you're not actually producing anything, aren't you just wasting time? It's not like staring out the window, deep in thought, checks anything off your to-do list. Other people don't help, either. They play into the idea that downtime is unproductive. You haven't done anything all afternoon, your spouse may ask, or your friend may say, you're just going to stay home tonight and do nothing? But for introverts, nothing really is something. The truth is, downtime isn't a waste of time. Solitude can actually make your life better. For one, it can help you solve problems. See if this sounds familiar. You have a big decision to make, say, whether you should quit the job that's making you crazy and take a new gig that promises more sanity but less pay. You can't seem to make up your mind, so you talk to friend after friend. Each time someone makes a convincing argument, you change your verdict. Ultimately, you end up more confused than when you started. Eventually, you get some time to yourself. After sitting with the problem alone, thinking over all the advice you've been given, you finally know what to do. That's because the unconscious mind needs time alone to process and unravel problems, according to psychologist Esther Buchholz, who writes about solitude in a Psychology Today blog post. Getting away from other people and distractions can clear your mind and help you focus better. For this reason, when Buckholtz's patients are faced with a problem, she gives them advice that seems counterintuitive. 
spend time alone, and don't focus on the issue head-on. Once alone, their mind often solves their problem for them. Solitude can also help improve your relationships. Like Buckholz's advice to her patients, this may seem counterintuitive, since being alone means you can't spend time with other people. But when you get time away from the people in your life, you may find that you appreciate them more the next time you see them. It's like the old saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Plus, when your introvert battery is recharged, you can show up better for everyone. Also, when you are alone, your brain can finally stop multitasking. Research from Harvard professor Daniel Gilbert and graduate student Bethany Burham suggests that simply being around another person sucks up a certain amount of the brain's attention, making some tasks harder. In the study, which Leon Nafach wrote about in a Boston Globe article called The Power of Lonely, the researchers had two people sit in a room back to back, each facing a computer screen that the other person could not see. In some instances, they were told they'd be doing different tasks. One person would be identifying images, while the other person would identify sounds. In other instances, they were told they'd both be identifying images. The computer showed pictures of everyday objects like a clock, log, or guitar. A few days later, when the participants returned, they were asked to name the objects they were shown. Burham found that the participants who had been told that the person behind them was doing a different task did a better job of recalling the images than the participants who believed that the other person was doing the same task. In other words, they formed stronger memories when they thought they were the only ones doing the exercise. Burham believes this happened because sharing an experience with someone is inherently distracting. We have to spend energy thinking about what the other person is going through and how they're reacting to it. The results are preliminary, but they suggest that other people actually steal your brain power. It may come as no surprise, then, that being alone may help you think more deeply. It's nearly impossible to have nuanced, rich thoughts when you're engaging with others. As the deep-thinking poet Rumi once noted, a little while alone in your room will prove more valuable than anything else that could ever be given you. And when it comes to learning and studying, being alone can help. If you're a student with a big test coming up, consider studying alone. According to research by sociology professors Richard Aram and Josipa Roxa, Students who study by themselves are more likely to succeed and to retain knowledge than those who study in groups. That's because students who spend time in solitary reflection likely have improved concentration. You don't necessarily need other people around to have a good time. A study conducted by professors Rebecca Ratner and Rebecca Hamilton found that people can have an equally good time partaking in fun activities on their own as they would if they were with others. They asked people on an American college campus, people who were alone or in pairs, how interested they'd be in visiting a nearby art exhibition. Often, the people who were alone weren't enthusiastic about going, but the researchers encouraged them to go anyway. After visiting the exhibition, they surveyed both groups, the singletons and the people in pairs, and found that everyone enjoyed themselves. So, if your favorite band is in town but you can't get anyone to go with you to the concert, consider going anyway. The not-so-fun part comes in when you worry about how others will perceive your aloneness. Do they think you're a loser who has no one to hang out with? If you can get over worrying about what others think of you, doing things alone can be a blast. And Burham's study shows us that those experiences may become some of your most vivid memories. When you're alone, you get to have things your way. Being in the company of others means you will always have to compromise on some level. They want Italian for dinner, but you want Chinese. You want to shop, but they want to hike. You can't always get what you want, and only one of you will get their way. However, when you're alone, you can eat sweet and sour chicken in bed while shopping online, if you want. Most important, if you're an introvert, Solitude invigorates you. So there shouldn't be any shame in turning yourself into a blanket burrito and lounging at home. Your energy levels depend on it. Solitude can help you discover yourself. 
Another powerful benefit of solitude is that it can help you discover yourself. That's what solitude did for André Solo. Yes, the same André who made a plan to work on his social skills. When he was young, he dreamed of living a life of travel. But his ever-practical parents told him to forget about it. Travel was just too expensive. Eventually, he realized he didn't have to buy a plane ticket. He could travel across the continent by simply using his own strength. So, in his twenties, he quit his unfulfilling office job and started bicycling. He started at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, and to date has gone all the way to the southernmost point of Mexico. And, being an introvert, he did it almost entirely alone. He says the trip pushed him out of his comfort zone, forcing him to learn new skills like wilderness survival and bike repair. It was also physically demanding. He biked for six to nine hours almost every day. Being alone meant he had to rely completely on himself. There was no safety net of relying on another person. Andre found that within the first few weeks of the trip, he learned more about himself. I changed some of my religious views and life philosophies, he tells me. It also changed the way I view myself in relation to others. I started to see the good in people wherever I went and became more friendly and open whenever I met new people. Rather than listening to music or podcasts, he made a point of spending the time alone with his thoughts. As a result, the trip was very meditative. It put me in a state of deep reflection, he says. Traveling alone did something else, too. It helped him clarify his life's purpose. Andre had been writing marketing copy for clients for quite some time. It was how he supported himself while he biked. Over the course of the trip, he realized he wanted to do more with his writing. I realized I wanted to create great literature, he says. He has since gone on to write short fiction and has published the novella Lunasa Days. Going on a 4,700-mile bike trip isn't the only way to learn more about yourself. You could take a weekend retreat, go to a restaurant or movie alone, or do anything that you wouldn't normally do by yourself. You may find that you make very different choices when you're on your own. You may discover that rap music does not actually appeal to you, or that you're more capable than the people around you make you feel. When you have a firm sense of self, it impacts all aspects of your life and changes how you relate to the world. Faces, Flowers, and the P300 Response The powerful benefits of solitude aren't exclusive to introverts. Extroverts can reap the benefits, too. But while extroverts generally just tolerate being alone, introverts crave it. As we've already seen, one of the reasons introverts like being alone has to do with our less active dopamine reward system. When we spend time alone, we lower our stimulation level to one that is just right. A study suggests another reason why introverts are less motivated to seek the company of others. Inna Fishman of the Salk Institute for Biological Studies and her colleagues recruited a group of 28 participants of various ages, both introverts and extroverts. As they showed them pictures of both people and objects, like flowers, they recorded the electrical activity in their brains through an EEG and evaluated their brain's P300 activity. P300 activity happens when a person experiences a sudden change in their environment, and it gets its name from the fact that it lasts 300 milliseconds. Interestingly, Fishman and her colleagues found that Extroverts and introverts' brains responded to the pictures differently. The higher subjects had scored on a test for extroversion, the greater their P300 response was to human faces. Introverts, on the other hand, had very similar P300 responses to both human faces and to objects. These results could mean that extroverts place more significance on people than introverts do, which may help explain why introverts are completely fine with hanging out at home in their pajamas on a Friday night watching Netflix. Introverts and Alone Time by the Numbers As I researched solitude, I started to wonder, how much alone time do introverts get on average? Are they getting enough? And if they aren't, what's stopping them? 
To find out, I created a survey and asked people who self-identified as introverts to respond. These were mostly readers of Introvert Dear. I got 499 responses. First, I asked, in an average week, how much restorative alone time do you get? This would be time spent by yourself, relaxing, doing enjoyable hobbies, etc. The results were less than one hour, 2%. One to three hours, 11%. Four to six hours, 18%. Seven to 10 hours, 17%. 10 to 14 hours, 17%. More than 14 hours, 35%. Turns out many introverts, 35%, get more than two hours a day of restorative alone time. However, some introverts, 13%, get three or less hours a week, which translates to only minutes each day. Ouch. Next, I asked, overall, do you feel like you get enough restorative alone time? The results were as follows. No, I wish I got more alone time. 44%. Yes, the amount of alone time I get is about what I need. 46%. I get too much alone time. 10%. Interesting. About half of the respondents said they get the right amount of alone time, while almost another half wish they got more. Surprisingly, a few introverts feel they spend too much time alone. Yes, you really can have too much of a good thing. If introverts responded that they wish they got more alone time, I asked them one more question. What prevents you from getting enough alone time? They could choose as many options as they wanted. Here's how they answered. My schedule is too busy for alone time, 60%. I feel guilty telling friends, family, or my significant other that I want to be alone, 49%. My obligations get in the way of alone time. 62%. I don't have a quiet space of my own to retreat to. 28%. I don't make enough of a conscious effort to spend time alone. 16%. They could also write in their own answers. Here's what some of them wrote. Living or hanging out with other people nearby draws me to them, even if I'm socially exhausted. As a family caregiver, I can't be away from the person I care for to have the solitude I need. My husband doesn't like it when I retreat to my quiet space. Family members come to my quiet space unannounced and uninvited. I have a roommate and don't feel completely alone unless she's out of the house. Even if I'm in a different room, I still don't feel completely alone. I need more alone time than is actually possible when you have a job. I'm constantly wasting the time I have worrying about things. I typically need more alone time than I think I need. Some friends will guilt me into doing things. If you're an introvert who doesn't get enough alone time, you're not alone. In fact, what you experience is pretty common, so listen on. We'll take a look at some common problems introverts face when it comes to alone time and how you can start taking back your solitude when you have too many obligations. J. Lee Hazlitt has always had a strong sense of commitment. In high school, she was on the student council and was an active member of several student organizations and the founder of another. When she wasn't busy with her various societies, she took evening courses at the local community college and worked 20 hours a week. In between all that, she had homework for numerous advanced placement classes. Her life was scheduled down to the quarter hour, a choice she made for herself. The main reason I said yes to such a laundry list of tasks was my sense of obligation, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. No model UN meeting was going to result in peace in the Middle East, but discussing world politics was what good citizens were supposed to do. It would also look good on college applications, and it seemed that everyone who was anyone had gone to a top university. I promised myself that I would join their ranks, and thus compounded my already overburdened sense of obligation. You can imagine how little time Jay had for herself. She snatched at the few seconds of solitude she could find, 
reading between classes, and volunteering for solitary tasks at work. Not even home was a refuge. Instead, it was another obligation where she had chores and family commitments. I was miserable, tired, and desperately in need of some peace and quiet, she writes. Nevertheless, she pressed on. I had to, she writes. I'd already agreed to all the things I was doing. When I wanted to drop something, I thought of my parents' disappointment, or of how that one extra activity might be what got me into an Ivy League. I attended club meetings and work shifts with bronchitis and little sleep. Not even spraining her ankle was enough to sideline her. The crutches she should have used for weeks were tossed after six days so she could help prepare for homecoming. I don't remember who won that game or what my oh-so-essential tasks were. But every time my improperly healed foot twinges, I remember limping down the halls as fast as I could to get to my next commitment. Saying no is the first step. Jay's overscheduling problem followed her to college and then to graduate school. She continued to fill her time with societies, extra classes, and a full-time job. She didn't want any of the balls she was juggling to drop. As a result, she remained stressed and burned out. Eventually, Jay realized that something had to change. She made a mental list of all the things in life that were important to her. Then she cut and slashed and deleted until there were only three things left. Work, pursuing her dream of writing, and spending time with her husband. Now those three things are the only commitments she puts on her daily calendar. She's found that she has more time for herself and she's happier than she could have ever dreamed possible. It's still not easy to muster the self-discipline to say no. When an opportunity to do more comes up, be it volunteering or attending a gathering at the home of a friend, my first impulse is to say yes, she writes. My sense of obligation tries to commandeer my tongue. I still feel like I should fundraise and letter campaign and go to my extroverted friend's fets, even when I know I won't enjoy it. It still feels like my duty, and I still feel guilt when I finally manage to say no. If she's learned anything from all this, it's that the guilt of saying no is much less painful and more short-lived than the guilt of backing out is. Saying no is also the first step to clearing your overbooked calendar. Given time, everything that doesn't really matter to you will fall away. If you keep filling that empty space with new commitments, though, you'll never be free to focus on your true cares, your true calling, or yourself. And when it comes down to it, Taking care of yourself is the most important obligation you'll ever have. The Misplaced Guilt of Saying No If you're anything like me, you feel guilty when you say no. But turning someone down isn't necessarily something you should feel guilty about. Guilt is an emotion we experience when we've done something wrong. If you harm someone, it's fitting to feel guilt. Saying no to the neighborhood chili cook-off isn't actually damaging someone. Your neighbors may have to re-envision the night, minus you, but you're not bringing them harm. Likewise, when you tell someone you can't do them a favor, such as babysit their kids, that's not a form of harm either. They'll likely recalibrate and find help elsewhere. We may feel guilty not only because we think we're hurting the other person, but also because we expect retaliation. We mistakenly think, he's going to hate me or she'll get mad. Our minds automatically jump to the worst-case scenario. Instead, take a step back and look at all the other, much more likely possibilities your brain skipped over. The more likely scenario is the person will be momentarily disappointed, but will later understand. It won't be the end of the world. Just think about what you do when someone tells you no. You probably don't fly into a rage and cut that person out of your life. So why are you holding yourself to a different standard? You should expect others to react as you do. That is to say, sensibly. Improve your no game. Steve Jobs once said, focus is about saying no. I'd argue that no is also a key to getting enough alone time. Here are six tips to improve your no game. One, say it fast. 
Don't leave people hanging on for days or weeks and then tell them you won't be donning reindeer antlers at the holiday office party or joining the committee. The sooner the better. When you say it fast, it gives the other party time to recalibrate. They can get someone else to bring eggnog or fill your role as treasurer. Plus, the sooner you give a firm answer, the sooner you can stop overthinking about it. 2. Turn it into a compliment. Soften the blow of no by prefacing it with something like, Thank you so much for thinking of me. That's so nice of you. Or, I appreciate the opportunity. It was so sweet of you to ask me first. 3. Explain why you won't be attending, but be brief. I have a really busy weekend. Or, I promised myself I would take some time to relax tonight. Sometimes no explanation is necessary. But if you're turning down someone close to you, an explanation is a nice touch. 4. Show empathy. Affirm that they're working hard or dealing with a challenging task. For example, you're working so hard to help your sister plan her wedding. I wish I could take organizing the shower off your hands, but I just can't do that right now. 5. Propose an alternative. The huge birthday party may be overwhelming, but perhaps you'd like to catch up over coffee just the two of you. Or you can't help them write their resume, but you do have time to proofread it when they finish. Just make sure the alternative is something you actually want to do. If it's not, you may find yourself looking for excuses to back out when the day arrives. 6. Don't budge. Some people will pester you or ask more than once, hoping to wear you down. If this happens, it's okay to sound like a broken record. You don't have to be soulless about it. You can still empathize with them and propose an alternative. But don't let your no slide into a maybe and then a fine go ahead. Put solitude on your calendar. It's what rock and roll stars do. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with introverted indie rocker Jeremy Messersmith. He's appeared on Late Show with David Letterman and has performed for former U.S. President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden. Time magazine named him one of 14 artists to look out for in 2014. He has a quiet yet powerful presence on stage, and his thoughtful lyrics are evidence of his deep-thinking nature. Like all introverts, Jeremy relishes alone time. And like many introverts, his love of solitude began at a young age. When he was a kid, he tells me, he channeled Superman and tacked a sign on his bedroom door that read, Fortress of Solitude, in an attempt to keep his siblings from intruding. As a teenager, he found himself alone at home for several days when the rest of his family went on vacation. His first move? He headed for the video store and rented dozens of movies, which he then binge-watched. There was no Netflix back then. It was blissful, he tells me. Today, Jeremy travels with his band and performs for huge crowds of fans but he still likes being alone. He uses his solitude to write new songs, play with new ideas, relax, and just be himself. When you're by yourself, you don't have to do anything for anyone, he tells me. You don't have to run any mental constructs. You don't have to run your spouse algorithm, your American citizen algorithm, or your musician algorithm. You can just be yourself. His wife, an extrovert, used to feel hurt when he wanted to be by himself. But Jeremy has come up with a solution. He schedules regular, reoccurring alone time on their joint calendar. This prevents hurt feelings because his wife knows when he'll be missing in action. But it also ensures that he gets time to himself because he and his wife can work together to protect his solitude by not scheduling other obligations at that time. His advice to other introverts? Communicate about what you need. For the longest time, I didn't know I could say I wanted to be alone, he says. I didn't even know that was what I wanted. Alone time is not personal rejection. Brenda Knowles had just told her daughter that she would not be helping out with her third grade Valentine's Day party. My daughter's eyes widened with hurt and confusion, she writes on her blog, Space to Live. But Brenda just couldn't do it. I had stayed home with her four out of five days last week when she was ill. There had been lots of bonding and mutual enjoyment. 
I had also been home for two days this week with her brother and his turn with the flu. I was taking them to History Day at the middle school the next day. Evenings are almost exclusively devoted to their homework and needs. I wanted the afternoon to myself. What I was failing to relay was the fact that my need for time alone was not a rejection of her company, but a desperate need to explore my own essence. Sometimes saying no to a loved one, like a child or a spouse, is the hardest of all. They may see your need for alone time as a personal rejection, even though you don't intend it to be. As a result, you may get in the habit of skipping solitude so you don't hurt anyone. But when you do that, both parties lose. You miss out on the recharging benefits of alone time, while your loved ones have to put up with a frazzled, half-present version of you. Brenda has gotten better at explaining her need for alone time to her children. She makes sure they know it isn't about them. I tell them it's how I'm wired, she tells me. I told my children it's like being sleepy. If I don't get enough solitude, I crave it like an insomniac craves sleep. I can't help it. She also reassures her significant people, close friends, family, and her significant other, of a return time. When I return after resting in solitude, I show them with my patience and renewed energy how beneficial that time away is. She says, if I do not return energized, I know there is more than introvert depletion going on. For example, there may be conflict that needs to be resolved with a particular person. Here are some more phrases to help you explain your need for alone time to your friends and loved ones. I really need some me time tonight. It's been fun, but I think I've had all that I can handle tonight. It's been a long day. I need some time to veg in front of the TV. Can we do it another time? I'm really due for a quiet night in. Would you hate me if I get out of here? I'm in desperate need of some time to unwind. I promise I'll be better company if we can save this for a day when I'm feeling livelier. I love when we get to spend time together but I just don't have the energy today. For extroverts, solitude is self-care. To the extroverts listening to this audiobook, I get it. I get why you'd feel rejected when your best friend wants to stay home alone rather than going out with you on a Friday night. I understand why it hurts when your partner would rather play a video game than talk with you. It feels like personal rejection. I want to take a moment to absolutely assure you that it's not. It's simply self-care. Just like you may have needs to have new experiences, meet new people, and socialize, your introvert has a need to regulate their stimulation. Give your introvert some alone time, and you may be surprised at how attentive and energetic they are when they return. Solitude is not hikikomori. In Japan, there's a word used to describe young people who withdraw from society, hikikomori. These youths quit their schooling and jobs, hole up in their homes for months or even years at a time, and cut off all contact with their friends and families. They often describe themselves as feeling tormented. They want to do normal things like hang out with friends and date, but they're paralyzed by profound social fears. Hikikomori spend all their time inside, often within the small confines of their bedroom. They pass the time by watching TV, surfing the internet, or sleeping the day away. I'm telling you about the hikikomori because I want to make a distinction between restorative alone time and reclusion. The introvert's need for alone time is not hikikomori. Healthy alone time involves withdrawing from others for a little while for the purpose of getting re-energized. After a few hours, or at most a few days, it means returning to the world of people. If you find yourself withdrawing for very long periods of time and or cutting off all contact with others, I encourage you to reflect on why you're doing this. Consider reaching out to someone you trust who can help. You can live a better, happier life. When your solitude becomes loneliness. For a few years after my divorce, I lived alone. On one level, it was wonderful. 
I had an apartment all to myself and more time than I'd had in over a decade. I would often lie on the couch for hours just reading, or I'd spend the night binge-watching my favorite shows in my pajamas. In moments like these, being alone was glorious. However, there were other times when I was alone but didn't want to be. Because I divorced in my late twenties, most of my friends were busy with careers or were in serious relationships. I didn't have a lot of friends who wanted to casually hang out on a Saturday night. I was dating then, but as anyone who has dated can tell you, finding good company is hit and miss. On nights like these, I was painfully lonely. As introverts, we champion our love of solitude, and we boast that we don't need anyone else to entertain us. But there's a shadow to this. For many introverts, solitude often becomes loneliness. Remember the 10% who responded to my survey saying they got too much alone time? Along with making you feel miserable, loneliness can harm your physical health, too. Mounting evidence suggests that it can create high blood pressure, erode your arteries, and make learning and remembering things more difficult. Some research suggests that loneliness is even a predictor of an early death. That's because, whether introvert or extrovert, human beings are social animals. We evolve to need relationships to survive. We function at our best when our social need is met, whether that's having one close friend or 300. In fact, numerous studies have found that having strong relationships is crucial to living a happy, healthy life. According to Live Science, people who have high-quality friendships may cope with difficult situations better, like battling cancer or being picked on in school, have lower levels of inflammation in their bodies, and have a lower risk of high blood pressure than those who don't have quality friendships. For older people, having friends may protect against dementia. A 2012 study of people aged 65 and older living in the Netherlands found that the lonely participants were 1.64 times more likely than the participants who didn't report feeling lonely to develop dementia during the course of the study. And having strong social ties may actually make you live longer. A 2010 review of research found that the boost you get from having quality friendships is twice as strong as the health benefit you get from exercising and equal in size to the health benefit you would get if you quit smoking. If you're an introvert who feels lonely, you're not alone. I encourage you to reach out to one person today. Just one person. If you're not comfortable having a face-to-face -face conversation, send them a text. You could also go back to Chapter 5 and re-listen to the tips about making more friends and having deeper conversations. Your health and happiness depend on it. In closing, when you're an introvert, solitude matters. It's the fuel for your mind and your very life itself. Without it, you feel worn out, mentally drained, and exhausted. You may lose touch with who you are and what you believe. Solitude isn't just about you, though. It's important to get enough of it so you can show up and be present for the people in your life. Most important, it creates the energy you can use to give back to the world. Chapter 7. Let's be awkward together. Dating for introverts. I walked into the noisy bar and immediately found the face I was looking for. He didn't look quite the same as he did in his dating profile. A little shorter, a little less muscled. But no one ever did. He recognized me right away, too, and I quickly became self-conscious. In what ways did I not measure up to my pictures? He bear-hugged me and smiled warmly. Then came the small talk. How was your day? What do you like to do for fun? Where did you grow up? He fired off the questions, one after another, in rapid succession. I tried my best to keep up, answer quickly, and match his level of enthusiasm. The night went on like this, and soon I became exhausted. My brain was no longer working. I tripped over my words. My sentences came out like molasses. My date didn't miss a thing. You've only had one drink, he laughed when my speech slurred ever so slightly. And that was true. It wasn't the alcohol that was making me dumb. I was on the verge of an introvert hangover. 
I was overstimulated by his high energy, along with the newness of the situation, a bar I had never been to, and a person I wasn't yet comfortable with. Eventually, we said an awkward goodbye and left the bar. Soon after, I got a text. It got a little awkward at the end, didn't it? But I know you were tired. Let's get together again this Friday. Still feeling self-conscious about his awkward comment, I flounced into the coffee shop on Friday wearing a short pink dress. I was determined to be flirty and fun. This guy was everything I wanted, wasn't he? He was creative, interesting, and fun. He was a filmmaker who had built a successful business from scratch. And let's be honest, he was cute, really cute. I wasn't going to let my introvert tendencies sink my chances with him. We went to a nearby park, hiked around, and got ice cream afterward. I was having a good time, but just like on our first date, social burnout struck. When he dropped me off at my apartment, I bolted from his car and into the quiet solitude of my apartment, where I lay on the couch in silence, recharging. This went on for several weeks. He wanted to hang out four to five times a week, and always at noisy restaurants, bars, or concerts. I love being out of the house and doing things, he told me. Often we met right after work and our dates stretched well into the evening. Then I had to get up early the next morning for work and do it all over again. Each time we got together, I was always the one to call it quits and head home because I was tired. He started to tease that I didn't know how to have a good time. Once, I got him to agree to a low-key dinner date at home. But he acted bored as if he was just doing it to oblige me. The relationship lasted for about two months before it fizzled out. In retrospect, I was never my best self on those dates, because I was almost always overstimulated. The way my mind and body reacted on our first few dates should have been a clue to me that as much as I liked the idea of a relationship with him, it wasn't right. I needed someone who would not just tolerate a night in, but relish it. Someone who would understand that we don't need to chatter constantly to stay connected. Someone whose words and presence would energize me, not drain me. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that introverts and extroverts shouldn't be in relationships together. I've dated some extroverts whose company I really enjoyed. I chose to share this story with you because it taught me a lesson I'll never forget. Whether introvert or extrovert, the right person for me is someone I feel good being around. If you're a single introvert who is dating, you hold a special place in my heart because I know what you're going through. I've suffered years of awkward first dates, flings that went nowhere, unrequited love and serious heartbreak. On one hand, being single and dating was one of the most exhilarating and personally meaningful times of my life. I found myself growing and changing in ways I had never imagined as I met new people and had new experiences. But on the other hand, it was simultaneously the loneliest, most difficult period of my life. I worried that my introversion held me back, that I was too weird or quirky to be loved, that my high standards meant I'd be forever alone. Many of the introverts I talked to when writing this chapter felt the same way. They worried that their introversion was more of a liability than an asset when it came to the dating game. If that's you, listen on. You don't have to change who you are to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright. What Introverts Want in a Partner What gets introverts going? To find out, I asked introverts to describe the qualities they want in a partner. I got over 200 answers, and the responses were as unique as the introverts who gave them. But there were a few things I heard over and over. Introverts want someone who can hold a meaningful conversation with them, listens, respects their need for alone time, understands them and appreciates their quirks, is intelligent, a meeting of the minds. Here's what some of them said in their own words. After being single for nearly three years following the very painful end of a marriage, I'm starting to feel ready to date again. I've dipped my toe into the online dating pool, though I am not particularly hopeful that I will find someone who can truly understand and appreciate me.
The first time around, I felt like I had to present a certain side of myself, the more extroverted, spontaneous side, which is me about 25% of the time, with lots of recharge time in between. My fantasy is to be with someone who can bring out that side of me while also respecting and cherishing my sensitivity and need for quiet and solitude. Claire I find myself being attracted to introverts. One reason is that introverts tend to have a calm energy, a peaceful core that is in sync with my energy. Some extroverts, when I'm around them, seem to have a more restless energy that runs counter to mine. Being around that kind of energy always makes me feel like I'm swimming against it as opposed to flowing with it. If you're an extroverted friend, I can handle it for however long we hang out, but having a potential partner possess that restless, extroverted energy might be too much for me to handle, too much friction. Also, so much of what I value most about life is connected to my introversion, reading, writing, ruminating about various philosophical ideas, preferring a few close friends over many acquaintances, all seem rooted to the essence of who I am. And being with someone who doesn't get any of that and is the complete opposite would be difficult. That being said, I don't want a carbon copy of myself. That would get boring. I want someone to bring me out of my shell and expose me to new ideas and experiences. And certainly, extroverts can enjoy reading, writing, and other seemingly introvert-oriented activities. So I suppose it's just about finding the best match for you. Justin. I'm all about inner qualities. I'm not focused on outward appearance. Since my focus is predominantly inward, I found someone who understands the mystery of my inner world. He has replaced what used to be my alone time with what I now crave instead. Us time. I can be myself and not hide any of my introversion. Angelica. I like deep thinkers, someone whom I could have a next-level conversation with and who would not find it awkward. Taha, someone who puts in genuine effort into the relationship. Effort means a lot. Dean, kindness above all. People who care deeply about others, about their principles, are the most attractive people to me. Jessa, what qualities are on your list? If you're looking for a long-term partner, take a moment to think about what your significant other is like. But don't focus too much on qualities like sense of humor, likes to travel, and is at least five foot eight. Instead, put qualities like emotional stability, integrity, empathy, reliability, and agreeableness at the top of your list. Why? Because research suggests that the most happily married people are those who, regardless of what they think they want in a partner, simply end up with spouses who have excellent personality traits. In the long run, it may not matter that your date is carrying a few extra pounds or doesn't share your obsession with K-pop. If they're stable and cooperative, there's a good chance you'll be happy with your relationship decades later. Why dating can be hard for introverts no matter what qualities you're attracted to, dating can be hard. And it's hard whether you're an introvert, extrovert, or whatever-vert. How do you meet people? What do you say? And what if you get rejected? Introverts face particular challenges when it comes to dating. For one, we probably don't put ourselves out there as much as extroverts. Most nights, we'd rather relax at home or hang out with just a few close friends. When we do go out, we don't have a huge desire to strike up conversations with strangers. Awkward small talk coupled with the fear of rejection? No thanks, I'll just get three more cats and be alone forever. If you're an introverted woman, you face your own set of problems. The biggest one is that you probably don't fit gender stereotypes. Television and movies tell us that women are supposed to be flirty, forward, and fun. Think Rachel from Friends and Gloria from Modern Family. These women are the embodiment of extroverted charm. They chat, they flirt, and because it's TV, they look amazing while they do it. Comparing yourself to extroverts like these, you may feel less desirable and confident. Likewise, if you're an introverted man, you may struggle with our society's expectation that you're supposed to make the first move. I interviewed Stephen Zawilla, 
who writes a dating advice blog for introverted men called Charming Introvert. And he says this is probably the biggest hurdle introverted men face. We may struggle with being confident, he tells me. We're expected to be the initiators throughout most of the relationship. It's up to us to ask her out the first time, to go for the first kiss, to ask her to be exclusive, to say the first I love you, and so on. This can be terrifying because it means risking social rejection by someone whom you really care about. If you're LGBTQ, you may face the above problems plus additional ones. For one, you may have a harder time than extroverts talking about your sexuality. Justin, who is gay, says he is private and tends to internalize everything. As a result, he wasn't open about his sexuality when he was younger. I tend to overthink and overanalyze everything, and when I was younger, being gay was just one more thing I had to figure out and come to terms with on my own, he tells me. And while that teaches resiliency, sometimes it's helpful to have another voice weigh in, especially when yours is self-critical. So while I thought about myself and who I was all the time, I didn't always approve of the conclusions I arrived at. Maybe if I was less introverted and less introspective and just more outgoing, social, and extroverted by nature, I would have found a friend I could confide in a lot sooner than I did. Part of the problem was he didn't want to call attention to himself. I knew this gay thing would make me the center of attention, he says, so I kept it as buried as I could until I couldn't any longer. Being reflective, daydreamy, and introspective are admirable qualities. But when there's something toxic brewing within you, like the self-hatred that brewed in me, sometimes you have to expunge it and open up to someone else. That's not easy to do when you're an introverted kid already taught to hate yourself for who you are, a shy, quiet loner who clams up in front of strangers and prefers reading alone than playing basketball with the other boys. Even today, Justin, who is in his thirties, is choosy about who sees that side of him. Though I'm not in the closet, I don't willingly discuss my sexuality except with close friends, he says. Finally, no matter whom you love, you might know what this feels like. Everyone keeps telling you to try online dating, but you're hesitant because it feels inauthentic. You have an aversion to the superficial social interaction that it is sometimes characterized by. I see online dating sort of like networking for a job, Justin says. There's so much pressure to put your best self forward and to be outgoing, smart, funny, etc. For an introvert like me who craves authenticity in social interactions and only feels connected to people when we're talking about our deepest dreams, hopes, and fears, there's something that rings hollow about online dating. Are introverts too picky? Kate is 29 years old and has never been in a serious relationship. I meet people and realize they're just a little off from what I need, she says. So far, she's only ever met one guy who she really felt could be what she wanted. And, of course, he already had a girlfriend. My family has told me many times that I'm too picky but my best friend was able to put it another way. It's like you're looking for a thumbprint, and you'll just have to keep looking until you find the one that's just right. Someday I'll find the right one. Kat is another single introvert who is looking for a partner. She's picky, and she knows it. Because when I was not, I ended up exhausted and unhappy, she tells me. But she's starting to doubt that she'll ever meet the right person. It has been five years, and I haven't met anyone I'm interested in. There are plenty of men out there, but none have sparked me. Kat, who is in her thirties, says it's kind of painful to see everyone else coupling up and settling down. So occasionally I have self-pity sessions, and I do not appreciate being different, she says. However, I cannot settle for something that does not feel right. Only time will tell. Have you ever been told that you're too picky about who you're willing to date? That you'll never find someone who lives up to your high standards? If so, here's some good news. Being selective about who you get into a relationship with can be a good thing, according to psychologist Ram Brofman. When you're picky, you avoid settling for someone who may not be right for you. When people settle, 
They usually do it for one or all of the following reasons, writes Brofman in a Psychology Today blog post. Loneliness. I want someone special in my life, and I'm tired of spending so much time alone. Time pressure. Everyone else is getting married and starting a family. I'm running out of time. Opportunity cost. If I break up with him slash her, I may never find someone better. Each of these reasons is not a good rationale to date someone because they're all based in fear. And when you begin making decisions from a place of fear, it's no longer about who you're dating, but rather what you stand to lose. When you approach dating with a fear mindset, you snatch up anybody who's interested in you, regardless of how compatible they are with you. I've been guilty of this. It's like drinking curdled milk because you're desperate for anything to quench your thirst. Dating shouldn't be about finding someone who's going to work. Instead, it should be about finding someone who mesmerizes you, someone who excites you, someone who you don't have to convince yourself to go out with. Being picky forces you to value yourself. It takes time and patience to find the right match, but it's one of those times when it's really worth the wait. Debbie is an introvert who heard the you're too picky line over and over. My friends always told me I would end up alone if I didn't give these good guys a proper chance, she tells me. I just couldn't get myself to settle, even though I knew they were great guys. Even when she was lonely, she believed there was someone out there for her. And thank God I did not settle because I found him. Or rather, he found me, she says. He understands me completely, even though he's an extrovert. And he accepts me completely. Now happily in a relationship, Debbie has some encouraging words for other introverts who've been accused of being too picky. I assure you, you are not being unreasonable, she says. What you're looking for is not unobtainable. A caveat to being picky. I'd like to add one caveat to the being picky is a good thing idea. If you haven't done much dating for whatever reason, consider this strategy. You could lower your pickiness shield for a time and go on a date with anyone you're even mildly interested in. That cute guy at your friend's birthday party who wants your phone number? Sure. Why not? The attractive woman in your class who asked you to get coffee? It couldn't hurt. You can give anyone a first or second date. But you don't have to give them a third. There's an important thing you have to do while on the date. Don't mess up this part. I've messed this up and allowed relationships I just wasn't that into to continue for too long. While on the date, notice how you feel around the other person. How does your mind, heart, and body react to them? Do they drain or energize you? Does your mind bubble with interesting ideas when the two of you talk? Or are you bored? Are you physically attracted to them? Use your introvert superpowers to reflect on and analyze the date. Don't ignore the feedback you're getting from your emotions and body. Ironically, we introverts can be both highly introspective and hyper-tuned in to the people around us, but we can have a harder time discerning our own preferences and feelings until we make a conscious effort to do so. If someone doesn't excite you, don't keep going on dates with them. After enough dates with a variety of people, you'll find yourself becoming an expert on what you want and don't want in a partner. Better yet, you'll become an expert on you. And there's a bonus. Going on dates can help improve your social skills. You can treat each date as an opportunity to learn more about how these crazy creatures we call human beings work. See each date as a mini-workshop to refine your social prowess. For example, you might practice strategies to tame your pre-date anxiety, learn how to talk about yourself more comfortably, and figure out how to keep the conversation going by asking interesting questions. At the end of each date, ask yourself, what could I have done to make the date even better? Don't go overboard with analysis, but tap into your natural desire to improve and optimize things. Remember how I wrote at the beginning of this chapter that dating was a time of personal growth for me? That's because I used this strategy. 
there were a lot of horrible, awkward date fails at the beginning of my dating career. But as I added more experience to my dating resume, I found myself becoming more in tune with myself, and my dating game drastically improved. When you feel you've gotten a better picture of the kind of partner you want to be with, raise your pickiness shield again. Start saying yes only to people whom you could really see yourself being with long term. At this stage, you may have to pass over a lot of people. Just be patient. When you get too attached too fast. Liz is an introvert who doesn't do casual. If I don't have a great time with someone immediately, I move on, she tells me. But there have been a few guys whom I really liked. But I become too much, and I think I scared them off. Maybe I get too hopeful? Liz was in a dysfunctional but super connected relationship for nine years. It ended about a year ago, and since then she's dated a few people, but none have stuck. I wish I could just keep things light, as people tell me and not get attached so quickly. Maybe it's because I know that connection doesn't come very often. She's getting to the point where she wants to give up and stop putting herself out there. It's lonely, but at least I don't get hurt or disappointed. Liz isn't alone. Many introverts have told me that they're just not into one-night stands, hookups, and flings. Casual seems too superficial, too meaningless. When they finally do find someone they're into, physically and emotionally, they fall hard and fast. It isn't a bad thing to take dating seriously, especially if you're looking for a partner to settle down with. Everyone has to make their own call about whether one-night stands and hookups are right for them. This is a judgment-free zone, no matter what side of the fence you're on. Personally, I completely understand what Liz means about getting attached too fast because I've been there too. Once I met someone whom I fell for almost immediately, our eyes locked across a crowded room, just like in a movie. He was sitting at a table alone, looking tantalizingly introspective. What followed was a deep, meaningful conversation that lasted well into the night. Finally, someone who got me. It was the first time I'd ever felt such a strong connection with someone, so my thoughts became obsessive. All I could think about was him, even though I barely knew him. I know now that my fantasizing clouded my judgment, and I failed to see that he was not the right person for me. We had a strong emotional connection, but to be blunt, he was flaky and unstable. Even though he wasn't the partner I really needed, when our relationship fizzled out, I was crushed. If you find yourself becoming obsessed with someone you barely know, proceed with caution. It's easy for introverts to idealize a potential love interest. Because we're so in our heads, we can be in danger of filling in the gaps with our imagination and become quickly attached to something that isn't even real. When you put someone on a pedestal. Something similar happened to Stephen Zawilla of the blog Charming Introvert a few years ago. He had a crush on a woman. Let's call her Joyce. She was stunningly gorgeous, and I really liked her, he writes in an Introvert Dear article. She was always really friendly toward me. So Stephen began to imagine the two of them together. He fantasized about being in a relationship with Joyce and having her as his girlfriend. If I saw her and was able to talk to her, it made my whole day, he writes, and if I went a few days without even seeing her, I became depressed, sometimes to the point of having trouble eating. This went on for weeks, then months, and then over a year. They say there are plenty of fish in the sea, but I didn't want to hear it, he writes. In the whole time he obsessed over her, Stephen didn't try to ask her out even once. I knew that if I asked her out, there was a chance she would say no, and that would be impossible to deal with, especially after months and months of having become obsessed with her. It was easier for me to live in my fantasy world where the two of us were together, than to face the reality that she may not actually want that. Then one day, Stephen learned that Joyce was moving away, and that he'd probably never see her again. He finally decided to ask her out. By that time, my expectations had become so high 
that there was no possible way she was going to live up to them. He writes, I had put her on a pedestal and no woman wants that. She said no, and naturally I was crestfallen. That night I shut myself up in my apartment and I cried myself to sleep. Eventually Stephen got over it, but that one rejection was a very tough pill for him to swallow. For months, he had pinned all his hopes on a single woman, which made him desperate around her. Don't do what I did, he writes. Don't put her on a pedestal. For extroverts, what you should know about dating an introvert. Are you an extrovert who is interested in dating an introvert? Here are some things about us that you should know. We take things slowly. If extroverts are the hares, then introverts are the tortoises. Introverts tend to open up to new people more slowly than extroverts. We may not make a move as quickly, i.e. ask you out or get physical right away. Also, we may reach relationship milestones more slowly, i.e. saying I love you for the first time or proposing. That's because we like to think things through and carefully consider all aspects of a situation before we make a decision. We need time to process our experiences and reflect. Relationships are no exception. We may have trouble talking about ourselves. Seriously, if we're on a date with you, especially a first or second date, we may stutter and fumble for words when you ask us about ourselves. Introverts are like onions. Our personality has many layers, and it takes a while to discover them all, especially the hidden layers closest to the core. We're private and we won't reveal the most personal parts of us until we fully trust you. Want to truly connect with us? Talk about ideas or other meaningful topics. When the time is right, try asking some questions to take the conversation deeper. What in your life are you most proud of? Do you have a dream or goal that you've never shared or thought was possible? Have you ever read a book that changed you? Your introvert will probably light up. We flirt differently. Think subtle moves, not bold. We might give you a sly smile, a gaze that lingers, listening intensely and asking thoughtful questions, revealing our secret inner world to you. What we probably won't do, aggressively hit on you or make overly sexual remarks. But I don't want to leave my house. Every time I see this meme on Facebook, I laugh. It says, I found out why I'm still single. Apparently, you have to go outside and let people see you. It gets a lot of likes and shares because there's some truth to it. It can be hard for introverts to meet potential partners because we don't socialize as much. How do you meet people when you don't want to hang out in noisy bars and crowded clubs? The good news is you don't have to. I mean, you'll probably still have to go to places and talk to people. But you can do this in a way that's more your style. Here are three ideas to help you meet potential dates. One, through your hobbies. Pick an activity you enjoy or you would like to try. Then find a place where there are other people doing that activity. For example, if you've always wanted to learn to cook, take a cooking class. Or maybe you're the kind of person who loves helping people. So try volunteering. Volunteermatch.org is a great way to find volunteering opportunities in your area. The people you meet at these events already share a common interest with you, so it will be easier to have conversations. People are more receptive to talking with a stranger at meetups than they are at a bar. 2. Through your friends. Ask your friends if they know anyone you might be interested in. Keep in mind that extroverts, by definition, love to surround themselves with people and tend to be very connected. If you have an extroverted friend, they may have several acquaintances whom you've never met. Having a warm connection helps break the ice and allows you to skip a lot of the initial awkwardness at the beginning of a relationship. 3. Give online dating a chance. I know, I know. Your friends and family have already told you this, and swiping through profiles feels more like shopping than falling in love. But online dating offers some advantages to introverts. It allows you to filter people based on their interests and personality type before you talk to them. 
and you can do it from the comfort of your own bedroom. Introverts, rejoice. But I don't know what to say. Like many introverts, Stephen struggled with talking to the people he was interested in. As introverts, we face a lot of pressure to be more like extroverts, he writes in an Introvert Dear article. Susan Cain, the author of Quiet, calls this the extrovert ideal. For a long time, I always thought that something was wrong with me because of my introverted qualities and that women would never find me attractive. After all, one of my friends who I always saw getting dates had the opposite personality as I did. He loves to surround himself with people all the time. When he talks to women, he is very aggressive and makes the conversation overtly sexual very quickly. That's not Stephen's style at all. He describes himself as introverted, reserved, and gentle. After watching my friend succeed seemingly all the time while talking to women, I started to become afraid that I would have to change my personality to be more like his if I ever wanted to get a girlfriend. For a while, he tried to behave more like his friend. However, he didn't get anywhere, even though he was doing the same things his friend was. I also started to feel like I was an actor by going against my own personality, he writes. What was Stephen doing wrong? He quickly found out. Women could sense that I was being inauthentic, and they were turned off by it. Here are three ideas from Stephen you can consider so this doesn't happen to you. 1. Be your best authentic self, or, in other words, be the version of yourself that your friends and loved ones enjoy being around. How do you behave around the people you are comfortable with, and what is it that they like about you? Try to be this person when you're talking to a potential romantic interest. 2. Listen for what the other person is interested in. Becoming a good conversationalist involves talking in terms of the other person's interests and listening to them when they talk about themselves. This shows you're interested in your date's values, experiences, and beliefs. You're interested in who they are as a person. And listening is something introverts often excel at. Try to find something that your date would enjoy telling you about. Remember to ask open-ended or why questions. 3. Talk about the things that make you interesting. If the other person is interested in you, they would enjoy learning more about you, too, and about what gets you excited. Are they asking you open-ended questions about yourself? This basically means, I want to learn more about you. Tell them what makes you an interesting person. Do you have an awesome job? An adventurous story? Have you read something unusual recently? Introverts typically don't like talking about themselves, but this is one time when you'll have to push yourself out of your comfort zone a bit. You don't have to tell them your entire life story or reveal intimate, embarrassing details, but you should tell them enough to give them a sense of who you are. Don't fake being an extrovert. As you talk to people you're interested in, it's okay to be friendly. It's even okay to step a bit outside your comfort zone and push the limits of your gregariousness. But be careful not to manufacture too much of an extroverted persona. Although it might be tempting to fake being more social than you really are when you're trying to attract a love match, eventually this approach will backfire. You may find yourself involved with someone who would have preferred being involved with an extrovert and feels tricked into a mismatched relationship. Later on, you may find yourself resenting your partner's expectation to go, 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 and talk, talk, talk. Be yourself, and don't hide the fact that you're an introvert. People are drawn to others who are comfortable in their own skin. You may not be everyone's cup of tea, but that's okay. In the end, it will pay off because you'll attract someone who is interested in the real you. How to be quietly intriguing. You don't have to act like an extrovert to attract others. Introverts can be intriguing in their own way. Here are some ideas from Michaela Chung, author of The Irresistible Introvert, to harness your quiet charisma. Express yourself authentically. Say what you really think and feel. Some introverts are afraid to say what's on their mind, so they stick to safe topics, never really revealing things that allow other people to get to know them better. 
Authentic expression provides opportunities for connection with the right people. When it comes to expression, a little goes a long way. Luckily for introverts, this is one of those instances where less is more, Michaela writes. We don't have to be over the top for others to take notice. In fact, our calm demeanor makes any form of expression that much more intriguing. I know a lot of people who go around expressing every passing thought and emotion. After a while, nothing stands out. All the words and revelations melt together like a really long, run-on sentence. Own whatever state you're in. Let's say you are at a party and are tired of conversing. Try politely excusing yourself and stealing a few moments of solitude. As you perch on top of an overstuffed ottoman watching the room and taking a voluntary time out, something interesting happens. People become curious about you. They wonder, Who is this person? What are they thinking about? Michaela calls this the power of the push. When you don't do what people expect of you, it creates intrigue. Own the room. Imagine that you're in a place you feel comfortable being in, like your own home. Notice how your body language, words, and posture changes. Stay present. Introverts' minds tend to leave the present moment and go wandering. This puts a vacant look on our faces, and people know we're not with them. To be more present, try to experience the moment through your senses. Delight in the smell, feel, look, and taste of what is happening right now. When your mind starts to wander, bring it back to the sensations of the moment. Will I ever find love? As I spoke with introverts about dating and love, again and again I heard things like this. I'm ready to give up that love will find me. I can see finding myself at the end of my life, offering the same explanation for never successfully marrying that author Louisa May Alcott did. I never managed to fall in love. All I can seem to manage are unrequited loves for me or from me, but never with the same person at the same time. In the past two years, I have not met anyone who I have been the least bit interested in. What kind of patience do I need to still believe that I will find that someone? Being a single introvert looking for love is hard. Every day you may doubt yourself. Every day you may feel alone. You worry that there isn't anyone out there for you. People tell you, don't worry, it will happen, but you're pretty sure it won't. What you're feeling is real, and it's perfectly okay to feel that way. I felt that way for many years. Eventually, I figured if love was going to find me, it would. But if it didn't, I would have to be okay with that. Spoiler alert, it did. I'm not going to try to talk you out of your feelings. But I do want to share Becky's words with you in the hope that one day the same will be true for you. Becky tells me, I'm an introverted, intellectual, unemotional, cynical woman, which makes it very hard to find a complimentary match. I need someone who is extroverted enough to help me do the talking and occasionally go outside my comfort zone, but not so extroverted that I get burnt out on social activities. I need someone who is intellectual enough to sustain my interest long term and who won't be intimidated by my brain or the way I talk. Someone who is emotional enough to take the lead and share his feelings so that I'm comfortable sharing mine, which is hard to find in a male. Someone who will embrace my cynicism, but also counter it with positivity to keep us balanced. Becky used to think a person like this couldn't exist. But I did find one, and he even came with a dozen extra nice-to-haves, she says. Before him, I found dating frustrating and unfair. It seemed like nothing would ever work out. At times, I became so desperate that I poured time and energy into a clearly dead-end relationship that didn't even make me happy. But now I'm so glad that I went through all that to find him at the end of it. Being alone is not always glamorous, but finding a real connection is worth it. She has some advice for introverts looking for love. Follow your heart, listen to your brain, and it will all be okay. In Closing I'm happily in a committed relationship now. Like Becky, after years of dating, I tripped across a fellow introvert 
who had all the same fears about his relationship fate that I had. After late-night phone conversations that I never wanted to end, and a dinner date in my apartment, I finally felt understood by another human being, and a real relationship was within my reach. The rest was history. I wish the same for you, too. Chapter 8 Let's Be Quiet Together Introverts in Relationships Alex Lidnan immediately regretted her decision to sign up for the accelerated geology course. All around her, people were introducing themselves and, in her mind, forging friendships that would earn them reputations like easily my favorite student, or the cool guy who can talk to anyone. I remember the moment I realized a summer camping trip, also known as an easy credit class, might rank as one of the worst decisions I've ever made, Alex writes in an Introvert Dear article. Those two weeks were some of the most disparaging times of her college career. I was essentially trapped 24 hours a day with 15 people who hiked, camped, bathed, cooked, and most importantly, talked with me, she writes. Despite being terrified at the time, years later she says she's forgotten most of the awkward encounters that she's pretty sure were only awkward in her mind. At least that's what I tell myself when memories of the most embarrassing ones keep me awake at 3 a.m. Then one night, something happened that changed her life. She was sitting near the campfire, trying to ignore the people around her and read, when someone sat in the chair next to her. I reread the same paragraph over and over, and my mind argued with itself about who was being ruder, me for not putting down my book, or him for thinking I would do so, Alex writes. Eventually, for reasons still unknown to her, she put down her book and started talking to her classmate. They ended up talking all night. As the sun set, as the fire died, and as all around them, people returned to their tents. He was an extrovert, so Alex found it easy to hold a conversation with him. Movies, music, books, anything. I only had to mention a topic I enjoyed, and he would fill in the remaining space with excited words I could never seem to string together out loud. As the night went on, Alex found herself growing comfortable with his loud but almost comically kind opinions on everything. When the only voices in the campsite were theirs, they walked to the river and talked until it became absolutely clear they would fall asleep right there if they didn't stop talking and go to bed. Five years later, Alex and that extrovert are engaged. Our home, our cat, our life, all of it built on the mutual understanding that I probably won't put my book down every time he wants attention, she writes. But if he waits long enough, I'll think of something to say. Alex will always be thankful for the extrovert who interrupted her reading. She wouldn't have signed up for that summer course if she had known how much interacting with other students she would have to do. But if she hadn't, she would still be going to concerts alone wondering if there was anyone out there who shared her insanely specific tastes. Like so many of life's struggles, though, I made it through, and maybe even came out on the other side with a little more strength and fight in me, she writes. I'll forever be grateful to myself for trying something I didn't know I would succeed at. But mostly, I'm grateful to my extroverted fiancé, who sat next to the shy girl in class, and just waited for her to speak. Like Alex, many introverts meet their special someone when they are tottering on the edge of their comfort zone. And like Alex, they realize that enduring the stomach-knotting, heart-pounding awkwardness ends up being totally worth it in the end. This chapter will explore the different stages of introverts and relationships. We'll explore why introverts make amazing partners and answer this question. Should introverts be with a fellow introvert or with an exuberant extrovert? The answer may surprise you. Why Introverts Make Amazing Partners Introverts are often stereotyped as closed, withdrawn, and even dull. 
This doesn't sound like it spells passion and romance, right? In truth, introverts can make amazing partners. We bring a lot of strengths to the table. For one, we tend to be excellent listeners. At our best, we try to understand what our partner is saying, and we think about where they're coming from before we respond. This can be helpful, because once words are spoken, they can't be retracted or easily forgotten, if at all. Introverts truly understand the power of words, including well-placed moments of silence. Because we're often comfortable listening and observing in social situations, we're okay with giving our partner the stage. This relationship superpower is especially valuable if our significant other is an extrovert. While our partner holds court, we won't feel compelled to wrestle attention away from them. The list goes on. Introverts can create homes that become sacred spaces to recharge, and we may have a calming influence on our partners. And you know that meaningful interaction thing? Being in a relationship with an introvert means you may experience more depth and intimacy than you ever have before. We're curious creatures. We like to dig deep and really figure out what makes people or things tick. And we'll likely apply our natural curiosity to you. Like an eager scientist studying a once-in-a-lifetime subject, we'll work to decipher your preferences, likes, and dislikes. You may feel more known, seen, and understood than ever before. Finally, we may be the most low-maintenance partner you've ever had. We don't want or need attention 24-7. When you love an introvert, you gain the freedom and space to be yourself. Introvert versus Extrovert by the Numbers Introverts can make amazing partners. But should they be with a fellow introvert or an exuberant extrovert? In other words, are you happier when birds of a feather flock together? Or do opposites attract? To find out, I put together a survey and asked my Twitter followers to respond. I asked introverts if they were currently in a relationship with a fellow introvert or an extrovert or in no relationship. I received 770 responses. The results were, in a relationship with another introvert, 27%, 208 respondents. In a relationship with an extrovert, 26%, 200 respondents. Not currently in a relationship, 47%, 362 respondents. As you can see, about half of the introverts in a relationship were with another introvert, and about half were with an extrovert. Also, almost half were not currently in a relationship, 47% are single, versus the 53% that are in relationships. Then I wondered about how happy introverts are in these relationships so I created a more formal survey. I asked introverts in relationships to rate their happiness level from one to five, with one being miserable and five being amazing, I couldn't be happier. I also asked them to identify whether they were in a relationship with an introvert or extrovert. What would you predict? Would you hypothesize that introverts are happier with a quiet companion or an extrovert who brings them out of their shell? 243 introverts responded, and the results may surprise you. The average happiness score for introverts in a relationship with another introvert, 3.8 out of 5. The average happiness score for introverts in a relationship with an extrovert, 3.7 out of 5. Wow! The happiness scores for introverts and extroverts were so close, there was only one-tenth of a difference. It suggests that introverts can be happy being with either an introvert or an extrovert. Finally, I wondered about who we think we'll be happier with. To find out, I asked single introverts, what personality would you prefer your next partner to have? The choices were introvert, extrovert, and no preference. 212 introverts responded. Here's when things got really interesting. Introverts who would prefer to be in a relationship with another introvert 46%. Introverts who would prefer to be in a relationship with an extrovert, 24%. No preference, 19%. And 11% of respondents chose other, 
and explained by saying they wanted a partner who is a mix of both introversion and extroversion, an ambivert. Someone who is mature, someone who understands me, etc. What do these numbers suggest? Introverts may think they'll be happier with someone like them, temperament-wise, but taken with the data on happiness scores, it suggests that we don't always accurately predict what will actually make us happy. It means, if you're looking for a partner, you shouldn't automatically rule out someone because of their temperament. If you're in a relationship and you're wondering if the grass is greener on the other side when it comes to introversion or extroversion, that may not be the case. A partner who understands. The introvert-introvert advantage. The numbers show that introverts can be happy with a partner of either temperament. But a relationship with a fellow introvert is going to look very different from a relationship with an extrovert. Let's take a look at the perks and challenges of being with either temperament, starting with the advantages of being with an introvert. Amy is a 30-something-year-old introvert engaged to another introvert, Eric. There are just so many great things about our relationship, she tells me. For example, when they first met and were falling in love, she noticed that she didn't feel drained by spending time with Eric. I slowly realized it was because we were both giving each other space, even though we were often in the same room. When they moved in together, this easy way of interacting continued. When we'd get home from work, we'd both just relax into our introvert time for a while. I would read, watch TV, be mellow and Eric would put on headphones and check stuff on his computer. Giving each other space wasn't something they ever talked about. As introverts, they were automatically on the same page. After some alone time, they would get up and make dinner and socialize with their roommate for a short time. Eventually, they would go back to giving each other their respective space. I love that dating a fellow introvert means never having to explain when you need alone time or closing the door to the bedroom and kind of shutting the world out, Amy says. Brandon and Rachel are two introverts who have been married for over five years. They're happy they found each other because they match each other's energy levels and interests for the most part. We both respect each other's time to decompress after a social gathering, Rachel says. Brandon adds, our activity interests often coincide. There isn't one person who's ready to read in bed and the other raring to go clubbing. They recently went on vacation to Puerto Rico. It was nice because, as Brandon says, we both were fine with hanging out and chilling a lot rather than buzzing about and meeting people and seeing stuff. There are other advantages, too. If you're dating an introvert, there's no running commentary, meaning your home may be a calmer space. Also, your quiet honey probably won't pressure you to socialize as much as an extrovert would. Instead, you'll have a companion for quiet fun. Think long hikes, interesting philosophical discussions, or long nights on the couch binge-watching a favorite show. Extroverts may enjoy these types of activities, too, but their appetite for them tends to be quickly satiated. After a night in, they're likely to want to get out and get social. Challenges of Being an Introvert-Introvert Couple being in a relationship with another introvert isn't all Chinese takeout and your favorite Netflix shows. There are challenges, too. For one, your alone time needs don't always line up. I often forget that just because I'm done recharging and focusing on myself doesn't mean that Eric is, Amy tells me. I will just walk into his office and start talking, asking questions, etc., without recognizing that he might still need alone time. Also, Introvert-introvert couples may also risk isolation. The more difficult one is a problem I think many introvert relationships have, which is that we very rarely go anywhere or do anything, Amy says. We both enjoy being home and alone so much that we have to remind ourselves to go out and be good friends to others or be good partners to each other. For example, on more than one occasion, Amy and Eric bought tickets to a concert they had both wanted to see. But when the day came, they quickly talked each other into skipping it and staying home. They just didn't feel like dealing with the noise, people, and traffic. We very rarely go to parties or game nights, 
because we'd rather get our energy back from our long weeks by spending time alone, Amy says. We make lots of plans to go on dates and outings that we cancel if we've had particularly rough days as introverts. Like Amy and Eric, it may be all too easy for you to blow off friends and stay in if there's already someone at home you can snuggle up to. But be wary of losing touch with your social circle. A partner can't fulfill all your social and emotional needs. That's why we also have friends. If nothing else, if your relationship doesn't work out, you'll want to have friends you can lean on. And, especially at the beginning of a relationship, it's important to bring your significant other around your friends. They'll have an objective view of your new beloved and may spot potential problems that you miss. One way you can combat social isolation in an introvert-introvert relationship is to take turns playing the extrovert. One of you takes charge, plans a date, and motivates the other person to go. Likewise, in introvert-introvert couples, you may have to work harder to spend time together. Introverts tend to be independent. We pursue our own individual interests and make our own fun. This can backfire if you and your partner become so independent that your lives drift in opposite directions. One of you may have to step up and, once again, play the extrovert, drawing your partner back into your world. Brandon and Rachel have challenges, too. We sometimes need to go out of our way to give the other alone time, Brandon says. I will sometimes go to the coffee shop for a weekend morning or afternoon, even if I wouldn't have otherwise done so, so that Rachel can have some alone time. Same goes for me getting my alone time, too. Brandon can be charming and fun, but in typical introverted fashion, he's more subdued in groups. Rachel says, It used to bother me how my older sister perceived my husband. At home, when it's just the two of us, we can be ourselves because we don't feel like we're being observed. However, at family gatherings, I can sense that my sister doesn't get him because he comes across as quiet and serious. Turns out he doesn't get her either. It bums me that she can't see the way he is at home. But perhaps the biggest problem with an introvert-introvert relationship is they have a hard time getting off the ground. Jeff, an introvert who is engaged to an extrovert, says he's never dated another introvert, at least not more than one or two dates. Maybe it's because I wouldn't know how to start a relationship with an introvert, he tells me. If I'm happily enjoying myself and my time, why would I approach an introvert who is happily enjoying herself and her time? Energy to spare. The introvert-extrovert advantage. Deirdre, an introvert, dated an extrovert named Jason for about a year. The great thing about dating him was that he was always up for an adventure, she tells me. All I had to do was suggest that we go do something, and boom, we'd go do it. For example, Deirdre loves ghost stories and pop culture. The History Channel had a documentary about the best Halloween hangouts in the country, and one of them was a massive Halloween store in Worcester, Massachusetts. She had always wanted to visit it, and when she told Jason, they jumped in his car and just drove down. No convincing or cajoling needed. And there are more advantages to being with an extrovert. For one, your extrovert will likely come with a built-in social circle. This means there will always be plenty of friends to hang out with, and some to spare. And of course, being around an extrovert means things will happen, because extroverts tend to be action-oriented. They have ideas, energy, and a strong need to get out and be around people. You may find that your extrovert stirs you from your cozy introvert cocoon at home and gets you to experience life in a way you may never have experienced on your own. Jeff, the introvert who is engaged to an extrovert, says the best part of his relationship is that it keeps him from living in his own little bubble and becoming a full-on hermit. It's nice to have someone at your side who's always willing, eager, really, to start a conversation and keep it going, he tells me. Take work events, something that I'd normally dread. My fiancé will always be the person who gets people talking and keeps the conversation going. I learn more about other people from listening to her conversations with others than I would otherwise. Christy, who is in a relationship with an extrovert, told me something similar. 
Extroverts compliment introverts, she says. They not only pull us out of spending too much introvert hermit time, but when we do go out in public with them, they can do more of the talking for us if we don't feel like it. So they can protect our energy some. Finally, your extrovert probably won't be afraid to let you know what's on their mind. Extroverts excel at articulating their thoughts. Sometimes every thought that crosses their mind to the chagrin of their introverted partners. The good news is, with extroverts, there aren't guessing games. They don't expect their partner to read their mind, and they don't bottle up their feelings like introverts sometimes do. If your extrovert wants something or is upset, you'll know. Challenges of being an introvert-extrovert couple There was a downside to dating Jason, Deirdre tells me and you can probably guess what it was. He loved parties, she says. Of course, I never wanted to stay long at all. I always couldn't wait to get back to his place so we could snuggle and watch a movie. Jeff says something similar. A challenge is negotiating alone time. I'm sure that if she had full control, our calendar would consist of back-to-back -back social events every night of the week, dinner with so-and-so on Monday, happy hour with friends on Tuesday, etc., etc. Over the past year, she's agreed that Sundays are off-limits. They are my day to shut down and read the newspaper, make dinner, and not have anything planned. The plans are the challenge. If I'm going to be social, I prefer that it just happens. A pleasant surprise visit, not a planned, on this Saturday we're going to do X with these people. All that planning just leads to me trying to find some excuse not to take part in the event. And extroverts don't just go out to meet friends. They often bring the social event right to your living room. They may invite random people over and not tell you, because they don't think it's a big deal, Christy says, which is kind of scary when you need alone time and have stuff to do at home, and you live together. This need for alone time may look lazy and boring to them. Unfortunately, an extroverted partner won't inherently understand your need for alone time. They may even take your solitude as a rejection of them. And if your solitude is hurting them, you may feel your only option is to cut back on it. But this isn't a good idea either, because you'll eventually become resentful of your partner. Without enough downtime, you'll become tired, worn out, grumpy and foggy-headed too. You may find yourself snapping at your partner, children, or others unexpectedly. Thankfully, to recharge your introvert energy and your positive feelings for your partner, sometimes all it takes is an evening to yourself. Having a room of your own can help, too, especially if you feel comfortable closing the door. Another challenge of being in a relationship with an extrovert is you may have to force yourself to speak up more. We introverts can be guilty of leaving others to read our minds and guess what we want. It's important that you articulate your needs, especially when you're in a relationship with an extrovert who may not intuitively understand why you need certain things. Find a way to speak up that is clear yet loving. For extroverts, what you should know about loving an introvert. She was the one at the party hanging back from the crowd but she wasn't doing nothing. From the look in her eyes, you could tell she was watching the scene and not missing a thing. When you talked to her, she didn't bore you with superficial chatter about her weekend. She actually had something meaningful to say. Or maybe he was the quiet guy in the cubicle next to you. You almost always had to start the conversation. But when you did, it was worth it. He was witty and smart, a little unconventional, and you knew right away there was something different about him. Regardless of how you met your introvert, one thing's for sure. His or her quiet strength drew you in, and now you're here to stay. Whether you and your introvert have been on one date or hundreds, here are some things you should know about being in a relationship with an introvert. Introverts don't like being the center of attention. So don't propose live on a jumbotron during the big game or ask the servers to sing Happy Birthday in a crowded restaurant. You may look around only to find your introvert hiding under their seat. 
We won't go to every single party, happy hour, or family get-together. If you're an extrovert who loves a party, this is something you'll have to accept and respect about us, because it's probably not something that will change. Of course, as a partner who cares about you, we will go to some social events, but we may want to leave early because we're peopled out. Remember, large crowds, busy environments, and socializing drain us because we have a less active dopamine reward system than you. Look for ways to compromise. We may be sensitive to conflict. In fact, many introverts struggle to meet conflict head-on because arguing can be overstimulating and stressful. We may bottle up our feelings and revert to people-pleasing behaviors to avoid disagreements. Or we may shut down when an argument does erupt. Tread gently. Some introverts find it helpful to write about their feelings or to step away from the conflict for a bit to process things. Don't take it personally if we need a brief time out. A busy schedule with no downtime will poison us. A weekend full of activities is what dopamine-loving extroverts crave, but for us it's often too much. Our internal resources get depleted, and we feel the need to retreat alone to a quiet space to recharge. Sometimes we'll want to be completely alone, while other times we may enjoy having you join us in quiet solidarity. Know that introversion and extroversion aren't all-or-nothing traits. In other words, most people don't fit perfectly into one category or the other. Just like you can have your quiet moments, introverts can also enjoy socializing. It's really just a matter of dosage. So don't intentionally leave your introvert at home while you go to gatherings because you think they won't enjoy them. Likewise, don't be surprised if your introvert wants to host a party. Introverts get lonely, too, and being the host of a party is a way we can socialize on our own terms. We want time with you. This means time with you and you only. No friends, family members, or kids around for a while. We may be quiet in groups, but we can be masterful at connecting one-on-one. -on -one. We'll use this time to try to reconnect with you authentically. Look for pastimes that feed both of our energy levels. Your introvert may not enjoy dancing in the club after a certain time, just like you might get bored after a low-key night at home. Find a happy medium. Browse stores, go on walks, travel together, play video games, or pursue different interests while physically in the same space. Discover activities that make both of you feel good. When love doesn't work out. Whether you're in a relationship with an introvert or an extrovert, sometimes love doesn't work out. And this can be excruciating. We relentlessly question everything about ourselves, and these questions can often be negative and purposeless, writes Aute Porter in an Introvert Dear article. Am I destined to be alone forever? Am I too shy? Was I boring? Am I too awkward? If we're the one who got rejected, the dumpy, not the dumper, self-esteem plummets to the deepest lengths. Usually we try to justify the situation as a way to get over the person once and for all, which never works. Inevitably, our negative questions reach a new low. Oh man, what is wrong with me? Introverts and extroverts often react to situations differently, and breakups are no exception. While extroverts may distract themselves from heartache by going out and being with friends, we may find ourselves withdrawing from others and spending more time alone in an effort to make sense of what happened. Also, we may take longer than extroverts to get back into a relationship. Research published in the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships found that divorced extroverts were more likely than introverts to quickly remarry. Did you just go through a breakup or divorce? Things may feel awful right now, and maybe you can't imagine life ever getting better. But take heart. Eventually, things will get better with time. It sounds cliched, but it's true. Time really is the ultimate healer. According to a study published in the Journal of Positive Psychology, 71% of young adults took about 11 weeks to see the positive aspects of their breakup. In other words, People started to get over the breakup in a little under three months. Of course, it's a little different when it comes to the end of a marriage. 
a poll conducted by a dating website for people over the age of 50, found that it took an average of 18 months for a divorcee to feel over the split. Other studies indicate that it takes about a year to get through the really painful negative stage that follows a divorce, and another three to five years to fully recover. Keep in mind that there are a lot of factors that influence the healing process, so your time frame may be similar or different, and that's okay. The important thing is to start moving toward your healing in a way that honors your introversion. Here are some things to keep in mind. It's okay to cry. Your feelings are natural and completely normal. If need be, cry until you run out of Kleenex. Crying can actually make you feel better after a while. One study from the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands found that although participants didn't feel immediate relief, about 90 minutes after crying, they reported feeling better than before they had cried. It's not clear yet why the body works this way, but it could be because tears release endorphins, which are our body's natural painkiller. Also, tears that are the result of intense emotion release hormones that allow your body to clear stored toxins. When you feel ready, talk to someone in your inner circle about what happened. We introverts tend to keep our feelings and experiences to ourselves, but now is not the time to bottle up your pain. Researcher Matthew Lieberman and his colleagues found that even though it may not seem like we discover any new brilliant insights when talking to someone, simply naming your feelings with words like angry or sad can help. That's because talking about negative feelings activates the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex which is a part of the brain that governs impulse control. According to Lieberman, this seems to dampen down the response in the amygdala, which is the area of the brain responsible for fear, panic, and other strong emotions. The conversation doesn't even have to be deep and substantive, although that's a bonus. Simply voicing your feelings and labeling them has this positive effect. Wallow, but only for so long. Set a time limit. Conventional wisdom says the mourning period should be half the length of the relationship. So if you dated someone for six months, you should take three months to heal. This time frame may not work for you, though, so choose one that's right. The important thing is committing to making positive changes in your life after the grieving period, even if you don't feel like it. Resist the temptation to check in on your ex virtually. Pulling up your ex's Facebook profile may seem innocent. You tell yourself you just want to see how they're doing. But it will probably do more damage than you think, especially if you see they've already changed their status from in a relationship to single faster than it took for you to get another box of Kleenex. Consider blocking or unfollowing your ex on all forms of social media so their updates don't show up in your feed. Even months later, when you've mostly gotten over it, Coming across a picture of your ex looking cute and recoupled may be enough to ruin your day, or days. This has happened to me. The innocent update will likely launch you right back into tears, grief, and self-loathing. Some alone time will be good for you. It will help you process your thoughts and feelings, so take this time. But resist the urge to hole up at home for days or weeks on end. This doesn't mean you have to hit the bars and clubs like your extroverted friends may be urging you to do. Instead, try getting outside. Walk your dog, hike, or bike. Take photos of the changing fall leaves or glittering snow. Find a park bench in the sun and read a book. Being in nature can help reduce stress, and sunlight and exercise are instant mood boosters. Being single can be awesome, too. What happens when you don't want to be in a relationship? For many introverts, being single is a deliberate choice. Some can't imagine sharing a home with someone else. Others don't want a relationship to encroach on their work, hobbies, or alone time. Still others have met their soulmate, married, and even raised children with them until they passed away, and they're not looking to replace what they once had. Choosing the single life can actually be pretty awesome, and a lot of people do, according to Eric Kleinenberg author of Going Solo. 
Nearly 50% of adults in the U.S. are single, and 32.7 million, roughly one out of every seven adults, live alone. Although there are no statistics on this, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of single adults are introverts. That's because there are pretty great benefits of being a single introvert. There is a lot more independence when you're single as you rely more on yourself than you would if you were in a relationship, Dean, an introvert, tells me. There is also less chance of drama and conflict. For Lance, it's about freedom. You can do what you want, when you want, he says. Renato says the best part of being single is not having someone expecting your attention when you just want to be alone. For Laura, my house is a quiet, drama-free zone. I guess it boils down to being able to be me and not having to apologize to anyone for loving my life as it is. Finally, Kashia says what's great about it is not having to put in the effort to be on all the time. Research shows that the benefits of being single are real. According to Kleinenberg, singles have been found to volunteer more, have more friends, go out more in their neighborhoods, and even have the potential to go much further in their careers than people who are married. So whether you're choosing to go solo as a permanent lifestyle or as a temporary measure, take heart. Being single can bring good things your way. If you're single, you likely have plenty of time and energy to focus on yourself. If you haven't already, reach out to interesting people in your life and cultivate more friendships. Having strong, close, platonic relationships will remind you that you're never truly alone. Also, spend your free time doing things that you enjoy. Whatever it is you love doing, go do it, writes Amelia Brown in an Introvert Dear article about being single. Being in a relationship can sometimes prevent us from spending our free time the way we want because we make compromises for the person we love. Being single gives you the freedom to do whatever you want. Take advantage of your free time. When you do get into a relationship again, you'll be glad you went on that road trip or took that cooking class. You'll have more confidence in your own abilities and have new exciting experiences to talk about. In closing, introverts can make incredible partners. When we do fall in love, it's intense because finding true connection doesn't happen often for us. But as much as we love our partners, we probably won't show our feelings in the typical extroverted way. We probably won't gush, cry tears of happiness, or tell everyone we know about our new S.O. You'll see our love in other ways. An understanding glance, a thoughtful love note, or a compliment whispered in your ear before you fall asleep. Or something less romantic but extremely useful. Something that will make our partner's life a little bit easier. For example, one morning, my introverted boyfriend proudly announced that he had mapped out a route that would shave three minutes off my commute to work. When I responded with nonchalance, he gently reminded me, This is how I show my love. Chapter 9. Troubleshooting Your Relationship He tentatively reaches across the bed with a warm, gentle hand, and Brenda Knowles recoils. I just need a few more delicious moments of morning mind. I need that gauzy, thought-weaving space of nourishing idea play, where I breathe fully and smile involuntarily. I need that space where I belong solely to myself. She writes on her blog in a post called, I'm sorry I hurt you in order to save myself. What introverts feel, but don't always say. He rolls away from Brenda, stares at the ceiling, and blinks back rejection. With a sigh, he heaves himself out of bed and walks away. I am so sorry, Brenda says in her mind. I can't give to you right now. I'm so sorry. The above scene is from the end of Brenda's marriage. I appear selfish and cold. But what you don't know is that at that point I was so raw and overstimulated from years of exposing my introverted nature to the harried competitive demands of externally driven living that I couldn't bear the softest touch of a lover's hand, she writes. I spent my days tending to the intermittent needs of three children, a house with never-ending upkeep, 
and the demands that come with integrating into a community. Brenda felt like she could never slow down, because no one else did. I had to thoroughly care for everyone and everything, she writes. I was desperate for permission to go internal, to slough off the scabs and injuries from unnatural striving, and become smooth again. Brenda felt numb and anxious all the time. She had trouble getting out of bed. Her husband didn't know how to fix things, and neither did she. Eventually, the tension between Brenda and her husband reached a breaking point, and they divorced. Today, things are a lot better for Brenda. She's writing, raising her children, and helping introverts through the personal coaching business she started. She spends a lot of quiet alone time in her favorite room of the house, her home office, which she calls her sanctuary. And she's dating again, too. I've learned a lot about myself and how to love and be loved, she writes on her blog. I love the relationship adventure. Like Brenda, if you've ever felt the tug between your partner's need for togetherness and your need for space, you're not alone. In this chapter, we'll explore and troubleshoot some of the problems introverts experience in relationships. My hope is that if you're currently in a relationship, you'll deepen and improve it after listening to this chapter. If you're not currently with someone, and you eventually want to be, I hope this chapter will help prepare you for when that day comes. Why Relationships Can Be Hard for Introverts Unfortunately, romantic relationships aren't all deep conversations over wine. If you're an introvert, you know that relationships can be really tough, extremely painful even. I asked introverts how being in a relationship challenges them. Here's what they said. It can be hard to express yourself to your partner, share your feelings, and communicate what's going on in your mind. Jennifer tells me, I don't share my feelings as openly as is expected. My feelings are private and mine to battle. This comes across as not caring. I handle aggression slash anger differently. I don't talk about it. I shut down and reflect until I work it out in my head. Yareen sums up his struggles. I have trouble letting her in. You sacrifice alone time. And just because you're in an introvert-introvert relationship doesn't mean solitude is guaranteed or easy to manage. Eric, an introvert who is married to another introvert, tells me, We both need quiet time and a little bit of interaction, but rarely the same one at the same time. I'm more introverted than she is, so I need more solitude, and she needs more interaction. Coordinating things to fulfill both our needs without draining us can be a challenge. You may be conflict avoidant. Many introverts are non-confrontational. We just don't like to rock the boat. Nina tells me, even when I should be arguing or at least talking about it, I don't. Sometimes I just say, okay. You worry that your introverted ways will bore your partner, especially if your partner is an extrovert. Faye says, I feel like I'm boring because I don't want to go out much. Your need for quality one-on-one -on -one time with your SO may be seen as rude or clingy. Kristen describes a difficult scenario with a boyfriend she had in college. I had a boyfriend who lived with roommates. I lived in Rhode Island, and he lived in Boston for school. So on the weekends, I would head up there to stay with him. His roommate thought I was such a bitch because I didn't want to sit in the living room with them. I wanted to stay in my boyfriend's room. I would tell my boyfriend, I'm not here for your roommate, I'm here for you. I want private time with you because I don't see you all week. Thankfully, that relationship didn't work out. Your partner mistakes your quietness for anger or unhappiness. Snow says, My partner often thinks I'm angry when I'm just quietly contemplating things and I forget to correct my resting bitch face. Choosing the right partner Perhaps one of the biggest problems introverts face regarding relationships is choosing the right partner. How do you know when someone is right for you? Better yet, can you know early on if someone is wrong for you? 
Andre Salo had the habit of getting involved with all the wrong people. Some of my early relationships were with people who shouldn't have made it past the second date, he writes in an Introvert Dear article. Even when these relationships became toxic, I held out hope far too long. I wanted to believe they were the right person for me, at least partly because I didn't really know who else I could find. Growing up, he had been socially awkward, so when it came to dating, he figured beggars couldn't be choosers. I grew up as your stereotypical nerd, and I didn't think of myself as handsome, he writes. My self-esteem in my early 20s was somewhere between low and rock bottom. It should be no surprise that I wrote off the very idea of talking to the women I found physically attractive. Instead, I was eager to get into any relationship that might come my way. And if I didn't really feel chemistry with the person, who was I to complain? One summer, he had a fling with a charismatic extrovert. We had common interests and a shared sense of adventure, but a very different level of stamina, Andre writes. His social butterfly partner planned an event for the two of them almost every night of the week. She never seemed to wear out, but for me, even just three nights of this was too much. I'd find any excuse to sneak off on my own. By the middle of the summer, I was so drained I felt like I'd been drugged. After several experiences like these, Andre eventually learned what a healthy relationship looks like. He recognized patterns in how he had settled in the past. Today, he's in a relationship that's right for him. Look for red flags early. No one shows up to a first date with a warning label adhered to their chest. But if you're an introvert who is beginning a new relationship, you can look for red flags. Red flags mean you should proceed with caution. They don't necessarily mean you have to break up. But the bigger and brighter the red flag, the more of a clue it is that there may be trouble between you and your beloved down the road. I repeat, it's crucial to look for red flags at the beginning of a relationship. That's because the longer you're in a relationship, the harder it is for you to leave when it becomes emotionally unfulfilling, or perhaps even dangerous, explains psychologist Susan Krauss Whitbourne, author of The Search for Fulfillment in a Psychology Today blog post. Think about it. Breaking up always sucks, but it's easier to leave someone you've dated for only a few months than it is to say goodbye to someone you've been committed to for years. If you have a house and kids together, it's even harder to disentangle yourself. Plus, it may be more difficult for introverts to leave a relationship than it is for extroverts. We may hesitate to act. Getting stuck in analysis paralysis, spending weeks or years analyzing our situation. Because we tend to go out less and meet fewer people, we may worry that we'll never find someone else to love us again. This fear can trap us. And when you look for red flags, it forces you to make a conscious choice to enter a new relationship. The more effort you put into the decision to get involved with someone in the first place, the harder you'll work to keep the relationship strong, according to Whitbourne. Even if you decide to ignore red flags and enter a relationship with someone new who might be risky, you'll still be better prepared to deal with future problems. For example, think about how you would make the decision to buy a house. You may realize that it has some weaknesses. Only one bathroom needs a paint job. But you decide to purchase it anyway, accepting it for the trade-offs it brings. You may find that you work even harder to make it a space you truly enjoy especially if you decide you're happy with it. It's the same with relationships. The fact that you commit to putting the effort in, despite your partner's imperfections, can make all the difference. Red flags introverts should watch out for. This is not a comprehensive list, but here are some crucial red flags introverts should watch out for. Your family or friends don't like your new boyfriend or girlfriend. Other people are often able to see your new special someone more objectively. If you're getting lots of negative reactions from people whose opinion you trust, consider listening to them. The relationship is moving too fast. Your sweetheart wants to make commitments before you're ready and pressures you to respond in kind. Lasting relationships start out more slowly. 
the object of your affection has few or no friends. Introverts tend to have small social circles, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about someone who doesn't seem to be able to tolerate other people in their life or get close to them. This could signal that your partner lacks the capacity for true intimacy. Your SO doesn't respect your need for alone time. It's a constant battle to get a few hours to yourself. A partner who is clingy or needs constant attention will not be a good fit for an introvert in the long term. You often find yourself giving in to your partner's demands in order to avoid a fight. Another night out with friends, even though you don't have the energy for it? Oh, okay. This dynamic will lead to a life of perpetual exhaustion and resentment. You don't get enough one-on-one -on -one time with your partner. Friends and family are always coming along for the ride. When you raise this concern to your partner, they accuse you of being needy. You find yourself frequently saying, everything's fine, when it's not. You walk on eggshells and don't feel like you can express your concerns to your partner. You worry that speaking up will erupt in a nasty fight. Your SO does not make contact with your inner world. You don't feel comfortable opening up to them, so you keep your most authentic thoughts and feelings to yourself. As a result, they don't know the true you. If they could see inside your mind, they'd be shocked. You frequently feel lonely, even though there's another person around. This means the relationship is not serving your emotional needs. People feel lonely when they want to connect with someone, but no one is available or willing to connect. You will eventually look elsewhere to get your emotional needs met. Your beloved is super secretive about your relationship on social media. Introverts tend to be private. We may not share all the details of our personal lives online. But if your partner posts with the frequency of a Kardashian and doesn't say a word about your relationship, it raises a red flag. If the two of you are committed to each other and they're still hiding their relationship status or never posting couples photos, they may want to appear to be unattached. Couples who are excited about their relationship usually want to share their happiness with family and friends, at least on some level. Your partner is your harshest critic. It's one thing to tolerate playful jokes and teasing, but if moral support is in short supply, or if nitpicking and criticism are around the clock, it's a sign of trouble. Your partner is a heavy substance or alcohol user. A pattern of getting drunk or high suggests that your new love may be dealing with deeper psychological issues that may continue or get worse with time. Remember, None of these red flags alone are deal-breakers. Just because you see a red flag doesn't mean you have to leave the relationship. But you should think carefully before proceeding. Signs you're in the right relationship. How do you know when you found the right relationship? It took Andre years to figure this out. Here are five signs you're in the right relationship from his Introvert Dear article. One, you're physically attracted to the other person. It might seem strange to start off with something that's only skin deep, but physical attraction is an important part of a healthy romantic relationship, and it may get overlooked by introverts. Introverts tend to be deep thinking and creative, so we may look for a partner who checks our intellectual boxes. This is great, but love can't survive on a shared reading list alone. Physical chemistry is part of what keeps couples together. If you don't feel physical attraction from the beginning of a relationship, psychologists say you're unlikely to ever develop it. Sadly, this can cause a relationship to fail because a lack of chemistry will likely carry over to the bedroom. Sexual dissatisfaction with a partner translates to higher divorce rates for married couples and even higher breakup rates for unmarried couples that live together. Physical attraction means something different for everybody. Neither you nor your partner have to conform to society's standard of beauty to be happy. But if you are beautiful to each other, it's going to make your relationship happier and longer lasting. 2. In general, you feel energized being around them. This is a common plight for introverts. People wear us out, 
some people more than others. But every introvert has met a rare individual who actually left you feeling energized. This is often someone who understands you, gives you time to express yourself, and is happy to meet for low-key one-on-one activities. This kind of person can be an introvert or an extrovert. When you first start dating someone, ask yourself, how do you feel after you see them? If you feel energized and wish you had more time together, it's a good sign. 3. Your relationship is rich with meaningful interaction. Introverts don't like small talk. Unfortunately, that's what counts as conversation in some relationships. Every relationship will have some amount of it, from first-date chit-chat like, where do you work, to routine prattle like, how was your day? The problem is, when that's the majority of the communication between you and your partner. If deeper, more meaningful conversations don't interest them, you may find your relationship unfulfilling. That's not to say that every meaningful interaction has to be spoken. Couples bond and connect in many ways, from playing video games together to cooking dinner for each other or creating special outings or date nights. Strong couples develop their own unique traditions and private jokes together. These are especially important for introverts because we tend to make a few deep connections, not lots of shallow ones, and we count on our partner to be one of them. 4. You have a sense of mutual respect. Respect is a bedrock of all relationships, but it's rarely mentioned when people describe their dream partner. Respect is very different from love. Both are positive sentiments, but respect means admiring the person for their qualities and abilities. You can respect someone even when you're not happy with them. And the power of that respect can get a couple through the most difficult fights. Psychologists say that in some cases, Respect may be even more important than love for a relationship to survive. There's a lot of power in checking whether you feel respected in a relationship. There's also power in only dating people that you deeply respect. Ask yourself, would I look at my partner with admiration even if I wasn't romantically involved with them? If the answer is yes, then you likely have a very healthy foundation for your relationship. Five. Your partner doesn't make you feel guilty about spending time by yourself. This one is huge. There's simply no substitute for having good, healthy alone time to recharge yourself as an introvert. Some partners get that, but others don't. And this isn't necessarily an introvert-extrovert divide. Some introverts are more social than others, and some extroverts will understand your needs, or they'll learn with time but not everyone is adaptable. Conflict is normal. Conflict in a relationship is inevitable. Normal, really. Chances are, if you and your SO aren't arguing occasionally, either one or both of you are avoiding conflict. This tends to happen with introvert-introvert couples. Rather than making a big deal out of an issue, introverts might sweep it under the rug. But this can lead to resentment, passive aggressiveness, and worst of all, a deterioration of intimacy. Eventually, you just don't enjoy being with your partner anymore. Arguments don't have to jeopardize a relationship. In fact, conflict can actually bring you closer together as a couple. It's all about how you and your SO decide to handle disagreements when they arise. Psychologist John Gottman, a leading researcher into why marriages succeed or fail, found that how a couple handles conflict is a good predictor of the relationship's long-term potential. If you can figure out how to fight fairly, you and your beloved have a good chance of sticking together. Couples who have poor conflict management skills typically fall into the pattern of fight, flight, or freeze behaviors, according to Preston Nee, author of Seven Keys to Long-Term Relationship Success. When they fight, they remain hurt and angry, sometimes holding grudges for years. When they take off in flight, the couple flees from addressing important issues. They ignore problems, hoping they'll resolve themselves on their own. Or, after countless arguments with no ceasefire in sight, they freeze emotionally and shut down. This is when things get really bad. Someone who freezes in a relationship may go through the motions on the outside, but they no longer care on the inside. 
Has something like this ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Successful couples have the ability to solve problems and let the issue go. Instead of attacking the other person, they focus on taking care of the problem. Even when they're mad at their partner, they find ways to stay close, like seeing humor in the situation. When the fight is over, they forgive and forget. Most important, they use conflict to learn more about themselves and their partner and grow the relationship. Introverts fight differently than extroverts. Introverts tend to approach conflict differently than extroverts. An extrovert may want to deal with an issue immediately and head-on, outspews a torrent of words and emotion. Introverts, on the other hand, may need time to process when they're hurt. They may withdraw initially rather than fight. They need time and space to think about what happened. Neither style is better than the other. But problems can happen when partners don't understand each other's conflict styles. For one, in an introvert-extrovert relationship, the introvert might be overwhelmed by the extrovert's intense and sudden venting. Like a deer in headlights, the introvert may shut down. To make it all just go away, they may give in to whatever their partner wants. Okay, okay, I'll come to the birthday party with you. Can we just let it drop? The extrovert goes ignorantly on their way, thinking they've won. Little do they know that their victory was false, and they've planted the seeds of resentment in their partner's heart. Another thing that might happen is the introvert internalizes their pain. They never bring it up instead turning to secret brooding and stewing. I'm often guilty of this. Their partner has no idea they've crossed a boundary, so they ignorantly do it again and again. Eventually, the introvert snaps. I hate how you immediately point out everything that's wrong with my idea when I'm excited about it. What's wrong with you? Their partner is taken aback because they had no idea that the introvert felt this way. But to the introvert, the pain is very real. It's been festering for days, weeks, or even years. Finally, partners may resort to passive aggressiveness. No, I'm not mad. I just wish you could think about my needs for once. Like I said, this tends to happen with introvert-introvert couples. Because neither wants to talk about the issue, they ignore it, hoping it will somehow just go away. But relationship problems rarely just disappear. Rather, they rear their ugly heads again and again until the issues are addressed at their roots. How to handle conflict better. How do you avoid screaming at your partner and or shutting down? It's not easy and it takes practice. Here are some tips to help you handle conflict better. Discuss your conflict styles before you find yourself in the middle of a fight. Are you an introvert who needs time to reflect and cool off before you can have a productive conversation? Don't let conflict fester. It's okay if you need a timeout, but your timeout shouldn't be an excuse to never deal with the issue. When you're ready, you have to make an effort to resolve it. Problems, offenses, and hurt feelings usually grow bigger if they're left unattended. Make an appointment to talk. When you have an issue with your partner, first ask them if it's okay to talk about it. Don't just launch into it. This is especially important if your partner is an introvert. Introverts do better when they have time to mentally prepare for things. Try, is now a good time? Complain, don't blame, urges Gottman. No matter how at fault you think your partner is for leaving a mess in the kitchen, hurling accusations and criticisms is simply not productive. It's all about the approach. Instead of blaming your partner by barking something like, you said you would clean up the kitchen after baking cookies, but it's still a mess, try a simple complaint. Hey, there is still flour all over the counter and dirty dishes in the sink. We agreed you'd clean it up. I'm upset about this. When you avoid lashing out, your partner is more likely to consider your point of view, which ultimately means you'll have a better chance of getting the results you want. It's easy to become entrenched in your side of the argument. It's like you get blinders on and you become convinced that your way is the only right way. But your partner has their side of the story, too. To combat single-mindedness, try activating your empathy. You can do this by pretending to be your partner. 
Think about how they might be feeling right now and how the situation is affecting them. Then describe out loud how you think your partner is feeling. Your partner can respond by either agreeing or clarifying how they feel. Be specific about what you need or want. Ask for what you want in one or two sentences. Make it positive. Instead of, I wish you could be on time, try, the next time you're going to be late for dinner, I'd like to know that you'll call me and let me know. Show your appreciation for your partner. For example, you might say, thank you for listening to me, or compliment your partner. Focusing on each other's positive attributes will remind both of you why you fell in love in the first place. It also helps to bring healing after things have gotten nasty. Conflict is a normal part of relationships, but it shouldn't be the background music of your relationship. If you and your partner are constantly fighting, consider seeking professional counseling. A trained professional can teach you both to fight more fairly. About those pesky in-laws. If you're married or in a long-term committed relationship, you know there are more people involved than just the two of you. There are family members or in-laws, and sometimes those in-laws are not introvert-friendly. This can put a real strain on the relationship. Yvette is married to a man whose family is very extroverted. They are loud when they all get together, and between the loudness and the sheer numbers, it was, and can still be, kind of overwhelming, Yvette tells me. They are not shy about sharing their opinions and they enjoy talking much more than I do. They have often thought I am rude because I don't hang out and talk for hours and hours. It's not because I don't like them. I do. But I can only take so much togetherness before I need a break to recharge. And they don't understand this. During our engagement, my future mother-in-law told me I was the coldest person she had ever met. Ouch! That one still stings a bit. We've come a long way since then, but she has never really understood my personality. Sometimes Yvette feels bossed around by them. This started early in their relationship, at their wedding. In typical introverted fashion, Yvette wanted to keep the wedding small, but she felt railroaded into inviting all the relatives from her husband's side of the family, most of whom she didn't know. I did invite everyone to please them, and it was fine but it made me realize early on that I would have to put my foot down about things that are important to me, she says. Lori has had similar problems. Her husband's family is generally always talking all at the same time, she says. It's exhausting. She often worries that if she doesn't show up to every family gathering and look enthusiastic the whole time, they'll take offense. Sometimes she wears herself out trying to make them happy. Yvette has learned to take a firm stand on things that matter to her, even though she doesn't normally act that way. I've had to learn to be pretty blunt in my communications with them because otherwise they don't get how I feel, she says. And she's made peace with the fact that she'll have to skip a few family events or leave early for her own sanity. It's a healthy type of selfishness. If you have pesky extroverted in-laws, Remember that ultimately you don't need to get anyone else's approval to live your life the way you want. And you may have to be assertive when it comes to getting your needs met. Of course, your initial attempts to communicate with your in-laws should be courteous. However, the problem with being too polite, for fear of coming across as rude or domineering, is that you don't express how deep the problem is and how upset you are by it. This can lead to a lack of vital boundaries. In other words, it's okay to be kind, but don't let your desire for politeness dilute your message. In closing, for me, when my close relationships go well, my life goes well. But when something turns sour, a fight with my significant other, for example, I find myself quickly becoming unwell. I have trouble sleeping. Angry thoughts distract and poison me, stealing my happiness and productivity. My introverted nature tempts me to bottle up my thoughts, but I'm learning the keys to getting them out in a fair, productive way. And I'm learning to be more assertive about my own needs, like Yvette.
you can too. Chapter 10 Do I really have to do this again tomorrow? Introverts and Career Kayla Mueller, an introvert, was sitting at her desk at work, bent over papers spread across her desk. She was concentrating deeply, like introverts tend to do. When I focus on something, it's like my entire brain dives deep into whatever ocean I'm exploring, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. I can't multitask because to do that is to keep the brain only shallowly invested so that it can easily switch from one pool to another. My brain does not do this. It is all or nothing. As she sits there, her extremely extroverted co-worker walks into her office and fires a question at her. I drag my eyes up like molasses sliding from a can, and she stands there, staring at me and waiting for my answer. Kayla writes, My brain is still swimming back from the ocean, so I am not even sure what she asked yet. As my brain finally reaches the surface and takes a deep breath, her question hits me. It is simple, and I know the answer, but I'm not there yet. My brain is still in the water, eagerly searching for the dry land of another topic. Kayla's co-worker stands there, impatient. So Kayla tries to give her something. Yes, er, no, wait, yes. Her co-worker raises an eyebrow and snorts a small laugh. Eventually, Kayla is able to rattle off the full answer, and her co-worker leaves, giggling to herself. Because of her talkative, gossipy nature, she will probably tell everyone about what just happened, Kayla laments. How she asks such a simple question, and yet I stared at her, dumbfounded. Kayla has no disability or mental impairment. In fact, she received a scholarship to attend college and graduated with honors. The only thing that's wrong with her, she writes, is that she's an introvert. An introvert who needs time to think and reflect before answering. Why, then, do I constantly get these muffled giggles, pointed questions, and judging looks? Kayla wonders in her writing. My co-workers and others around me see something different. They do not see the thoughts running through my brain, the padlocks being opened to pull out old memories, or the little lightning bolts that send new information to my sensors while I wait to see what it all means. The only thing they see is me sitting there with a blank expression on my face. So nearly every time they jump to the wrong conclusions about Kayla. They assume I don't understand what they're talking about, or that I'm a little slow. Have you ever felt like your introvert skills are undervalued at work? If so, continue listening. In this chapter, we'll explore the strengths of introverts on the job, as well as how you can choose a job that plays to those strengths. Why more companies should hire introverts. Introverts can make seriously awesome employees and leaders, whether it's in the office, factory, store, boardroom, or classroom. For one, our penchant for working alone empowers us to solve problems and come up with unique ideas. We're the ones quietly sitting at our desks, turning ideas over and over in our mind, rather than clamoring to make our voice heard in a noisy conference room. And there's a benefit to this. When you're alone, you can clear your mind and focus your thoughts. And all this deep, concentrated thinking can lead to novel solutions and brilliant ideas. So forget the brainstorming session. They may be overrated anyway. According to Keith Sawyer, a psychologist at Washington University in St. Louis, research has consistently shown that brainstorming groups think of far fewer ideas than the same number of people who work by themselves and later combine their ideas, he tells the Washington Post. Speaking of problem-solving, we introverts are persistent. We tend to stick with problems longer, well past when everyone else has moved on to another topic or gone home for the day. Albert Einstein, the brilliant physicist who developed the theory of relativity, was probably an introvert. He's widely quoted as saying that while he didn't think of himself as a genius, the secret to his success was that he simply stayed with problems longer than other people did. And don't think that introverts can't work on a team. In fact, research shows that quiet, neurotic introverts make better team players than extroverts in the long run. 
Corinne Bendersky and Neha Parikh Shah found that while extroverts make great first impressions, they may disappoint us when they're part of a team. Bendersky and Shah conducted two studies, one that surveyed employee behavior toward extroverts and neurotic introverts, and another that noted MBA students' behavior. They found that the perceived value of extroverts' work and their reputation among their colleagues actually diminished over time. In other words, bosses often have high expectations for extroverts because they are enthusiastic, outgoing, and assertive. However, extroverts may not live up to these expectations. Plus, Bendersky told USA Today, the extroverts they studied were often poor listeners, and despite their drive to be social, they didn't collaborate well in practice. Introverts, on the other hand, particularly those who score high in neuroticism on the Big Five scale, may be the better employee in the long run. Although neuroticism is often associated with anxiety, negative emotions, and irritability, people who are neurotic also tend to care a lot about what others think of them. This means they may work harder on a team because they worry about how their colleagues perceive them, and they don't want to be seen as not pulling their weight. So while companies may be attracted to hiring extroverts because they interview well, bosses should remember to check their expectations. A gregarious personality doesn't necessarily equal better results. Also in the workplace, introverts are often the calm in the center of the storm. When everyone is losing their head over the company's latest policy change, huddling in outraged groups in the break room or spouting off their impassioned opinions in meetings, introverts are already thinking of new ways to adjust. Quietly. Finally, introverts really know their stuff. An introverted writer friend of mine is basically a walking encyclopedia of Celtic mythology. For example, if you ask him about the hero Cahulan, he can not only tell you how he died, but also what kind of chariot he drove around in. Listening to him talk, I found myself thinking, wow, he really knows his stuff. That's because introverts love learning and adding to their vast stores of specialty knowledge. It's no surprise that introverts often become experts in their field. Introverts and Job Happiness by the Numbers As I researched careers for introverts, I started to wonder, what makes introverts happy on the job? What makes them unhappy? Are there certain jobs that introverts default to? To find out, I once again surveyed people who self-identified as introverts, readers of Introvert Dear. 406 people responded. First, I asked them to rank how happy they were with their job on a scale of 1 to 5. Then I asked, what is your job? Jobs ranged from everything from a teacher to an aerospace engineer to a vegan baker. One person wrote that they worked at a worm and cricket farm. Their job was to raise giant mealworms. Shout out to you, worm master. You might imagine that the introverts who were happy with their jobs would report that they are librarians, writers, or truck drivers who spend a lot of time alone, typical introverted positions. But that wasn't the case. There was no clear trend about which jobs made introverts happy. Surprisingly, many introverts who were happy with their jobs had positions that were people-centric, such as being a psychotherapist, nurse, teacher, home health care worker, manager, etc. In fact, roughly half had jobs that were typical introvert jobs, like accountant, bookkeeper, or writer. The other half had jobs that involved a lot of direct interaction with other people. These are introverts who reported that their job was pretty great or amazing, it couldn't be better, a four or five on the happiness scale. I also asked introverts why they liked or disliked their job. Though I received a wide variety of answers, certain trends emerged. People who were happy with their job often said they liked it for the following reasons. I enjoy getting to help people and having the chance to make a difference in people's lives. There is just the right amount of people interaction, not too much or too little. I am often left alone, which allows me to concentrate for long periods of time. My boss respects me and does not micromanage me. My job gives me autonomy and flexibility. I get to be creative. 
I frequently get to learn new things. I love the people I work with. My company values its employees. I deal with clients mostly through email, not many face-to-face -face interactions. I have the option to work from home. What about the introverts who were unhappy with their jobs? Again, there was no clear overall trend as far as what type of career they had. In fact, some of the same jobs that made the happy list also made the unhappy list, such as teacher, writer, manager, IT consultant, librarian, etc. That's right. There is an introvert out there somewhere who is surrounded by books and who is not happy. This person said they dislike their job because they have to share an office with someone. They don't get to be creative, and they don't have much control over their time. Did that just kill one of your introvert job fantasies? However, there were some jobs that were clear losers. These jobs only appeared on the unhappy list, and respondents said these positions made them miserable or not very happy, a one or a two on the happiness scale. They were retail employee, call center agent, customer service representative. I suspect these jobs make introverts miserable because they have to interact with people frequently and not in a meaningful way. I have to act happy all the time, an introvert who works in retail writes. I have to talk on the phone and be nice, even when the other person is being abusive, a call center agent writes. I have to deal with people who don't care about you or others, for that matter, another retail worker laments. Other reasons introverts disliked their jobs, whether they worked in retail, customer service, or something else, included, My job is boring and repetitive. It doesn't pay well. I am stressed and overworked. I don't get enough freedom and autonomy. There is a lot of turnover in the office. There is a poisonous work culture and too much office drama. My boss micromanages me. It's not my passion. I don't get enough time off. I have to make too many phone calls. I constantly have to meet new people and push myself out of my comfort zone. My research isn't meant to be a comprehensive career guide, but I think it provides some important takeaways for introverts. The first is that introverts don't necessarily have to seek a solitary job. Some of the happiest introverts had jobs that put them in direct contact with people every day. Just make sure your job allows you to interact with people in a meaningful way. Troubleshooting angry customers' billing questions in a call center or telling people about the latest sale in a fake happy voice probably won't count as meaningful. It seemed like introverts who reported being happy with their jobs had stumbled into a type of Goldilocks scenario. You know, this porridge is too hot, this one is too cold, but oh, this one is just right. These introverts spend part of their workday interacting with people and part of the day alone. They can close their office door when they need some quiet or occasionally work from home. In other words, they have balance. They don't have to be on all the time, only some of the time. They can retreat before an introvert hangover threatens. Also, when considering a position, think about more than how much it pays and what your main duties are. Do you think you'll like and get along with your coworkers? Does your boss seem like the control freak type who will micromanage you? To get a sense of the company culture and what your coworkers are like, try to meet some of them during the interview process. Have a short conversation with them. What kind of feeling do you get from talking to them? Do you seem to click with them? Will your introverted work style jive with theirs? Also, ask questions during the interview about how much you'll be expected to work in groups and collaborate. You may even go so far as to ask about the personality of the organization. Do people make a lot of chit-chat during the workday and socialize outside of work frequently? Or do people mostly keep to themselves? Perhaps most important during the interview, make sure to ask how often you'll be expected to talk on the phone. Talking on the phone frequently was hands down the biggest complaint from introverts who dislike their job. If the job requires you to constantly make phone calls to people you don't know well, it's probably not for you.
when a job constantly exhausts you. Colleen Sweeney is an introvert who ended up in a job that wasn't right for her. She worked for a major housewares retailer during the busy holiday season. I knew from the moment I completed the first interview that this job was not going to be an enjoyable experience, based on the personality of the interviewing manager, she writes in an Introvert Dear article. She was what I would call a stereotypical extrovert, extremely outgoing, never took no for an answer, and just really did not understand introverts. As I got to know the other managers over the following weeks, I came to realize that my personality and theirs would not mesh. Working in retail meant she was required to push the store's credit card on every customer and to not stop until they basically became belligerent toward us. As an introvert, she had a hard time doing this. She hated having to push people to do things that she herself would not like having pushed on her. And it was hard to deal with the constant rejection from customers. But she would do it again and again all day long because she and the other employees were being watched by their boss on camera. She would usually take a single no for an answer and move on. Her boss eventually noticed that her credit card sales record was almost non-existent. And that led to another uncomfortable conversation for Colleen. The most anxiety-filled moment came when she had to walk around the store trying to sell gift cards to customers. I had to carry five on my person, along with some mints, and ask customers who appeared to be stuck on gift ideas if they wanted to purchase gift cards, she writes. We also had to do this when ringing up customers, but it was much easier doing it there than randomly walking up to strangers. I knew that several managers were on the floor and no doubt monitoring my every move. I did approach a few people, but was unsuccessful. At some point, my manager walked up to me and asked me how my sales were going. I did not lie. I told her the truth. At this point, she scolded me like a small child and insinuated that my job was on the line. Colleen broke down in tears in the break room that day. It wasn't because she was afraid of losing her job. She had already decided she was not going to accept their offer if they asked her to stay on after the holidays. It was because she was so uncomfortable in her job, she writes. She ended up leaving the job one week before her trial period was up. I honestly cannot say I regret leaving because my mental health immediately improved upon giving my notice, she writes. Today, she's moved on to a different job, but she still wishes some things in the retail industry would change. The retail industry does not really care if a person is introverted, she writes. They just want a person to make sales, and they do not really care if it makes a person uncomfortable. She understands that making sales is an important part of retail, but there are some things the industry could do to make this easier for everyone. For one, stores could create volunteer lists for employees to take on the undesirable jobs, like walking the sales floor, selling gift cards to customers. Also, they could take an employee's personality into question when assigning them tasks. The managers I had before the housewares store knew I was not comfortable working in the fitting room, so they took me off the roster for that zone, she writes. I am not saying to give employees preferential treatment, but to realize they are not working to their full potential if they are not comfortable. I would love for introverts to be seen as completely normal people and not be considered weird because they are quieter and sometimes do not want to socialize, she adds. I was ostracized because really rude customers deeply affected me and because I was quiet. Choosing the Right Field so, how do you choose a college major or career path that's right for you? To answer that question, I turned to Nancy Ankowitz, presentation and career coach and author of Self-Promotion for Introverts. First, Ankowitz tells me in an interview, do some self-reflection and think about what helps you thrive. Chances are, as an introvert, you prefer plenty of quiet time for activities like research, thinking, writing, and analyzing data as opposed to back-to-back -back large group meetings, she says. Then think about what type of role you'd like to play in an organization. Would you prefer being an individual contributor, a team member, 
or a people manager, or any combination of these positions. For example, an individual contributor might be a freelance writer, a team member might take the form of being a social media strategist, and a people manager might be a project manager or the manager of a retail store. Through self-reflection, paying attention to which activities give you energy and which drain you, you will discover what brings out the best in you, Ankowitz says. And if you're a student who has limited job experience, reflect on your experiences in school or volunteer work as starting points. Most important, consider which rewards fuel you. Do you like getting accolades from managers and clients? Money? Intellectual satisfaction? Do you like learning new skills, helping others, or making a contribution to a cause? Even if your position or work environment aren't ideal, if you have the right motivation, you may find yourself gaining the emotional energy you need to keep going. Finally, go on plenty of informational interviews to learn from pros in the fields you're interested in. If possible, job shadow. This way, you can find out what a day in their work life is like before you commit. You may be surprised to discover how much a librarian has to interact with others, or how much a journalist has to talk on the phone. 10 Best Jobs for Introverts, Ranked by Salary Tony Lee, publisher of CareerCast.com, has been writing about careers since the 1980s. Every year, he puts together lists of the best and worst jobs. Collaborating with two academics in 2014, he compiled a list of 10 jobs for introverts and shy people. Lee lumped shy individuals in with introverts because he figured they both wanted jobs that allowed them to avoid an overload of interactions with people each day. Lee and his colleagues thought about jobs that would play to introverts' strengths, as well as allow them to work quietly and independently at times. Here is Lee's list, ranked in order of salary. All salary information comes from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, according to Lee. Projected growth is how much this job field is expected to grow by the year 2020. 1. Astronomer. Salary, $96,460. Projected growth, 10%. 2. Geoscientist. Salary, $90,890. Projected growth, 16%. 3. Social media manager. Salary, $54,170. Projected growth, 12%. 4. Film video editor. Salary, $51,300. Projected growth, 3%. 5. Court reporter. Salary, $48,160. Projected growth, 10%. 6. Archivist. Salary, $47,340. Projected growth, 11%. 7. Industrial machine repairer. Salary, $46,920. Projected growth, 17%. 8. Financial clerk. Salary, $36,850. Projected growth, 11%. 9. Medical records technician. Salary, $34,160, projected growth, 22%. 10. Animal care and service workers, salary, $19,970, caretakers, $25,270, trainers, projected growth, 15%. Work at home in your pajamas. Really? Making a living doesn't necessarily mean you have to hold down a 9-to-5 job. Many introverts go the self-employed route, and this makes sense. We tend to be self-starters, we are independent, and we have big ideas. Furthermore, when you control how you work, you'll probably feel less drained at the end of the day. You're left with some energy and maybe even eagerness to socialize with your friends and loved ones. Here are some self-employment ideas for introverts. Graphic designer or web designer. Coder. Social media consultant. Writer, author, copywriter, technical writer or blogger. Resume writer. Photographer. Private music lessons instructor. 
Business or Life Coach Online Tutor The Introvert's Need for Meaningful Work Are you like me? You know that career advice is helpful, but reading about salaries, projected job growth, etc. can leave you feeling like something is missing. That's because many introverts don't just want a paycheck. They want a calling, too. They crave work that allows them to express their authentic selves, a career that embodies their interests, values, skills, and personality. In other words, they want to do what they are. Really, in all areas of life, introverts don't feel whole unless their outer life reflects their inner life. If people can't see them for who they really are, the secret world inside them, they are inclined to feel fragmented and discontent. It also comes down to a matter of time and energy. You likely spend a lot of time at your job. If you work full-time, you spend about 50% of your total waking hours on a workday, on the clock. You probably spend more time at your job on a workday than you do with your loved ones, alone, or doing meaningful hobbies, e.g. working on your novel. If you're going to clock this many hours doing something and put in this much energy, you want it to matter. Introverts tend to have a small circle of close friends, because when we invest our time and limited energy into something, we want it to be exceptionally good. It's the same with our nine-to-five efforts. As an introvert, finding a meaningful career is likely intertwined with finding yourself. You may feel like you can't build a career that reflects your identity until you figure out what that identity is. The downside is it can take a long time to discover who you really are years or decades. And you may feel like you can't take action until you have complete information. Introverts like to look before they leap. In the meantime, you may feel forced to settle for a day job to pay the bills. You hope to one day uncover your true self and with it your true calling. Unfortunately, settling for a day job is rarely satisfying. It may seem like your true talents and skills are being wasted on menial tasks. You feel meant for so much more. Likewise, introverts approach their careers differently than extroverts. When searching for direction for their lives, extroverts tend to look outside themselves. They may ask themselves, what careers are hot right now? How do my talents and skills fit with the existing landscape? What types of positions will earn me a good salary? Introverts, on the other hand, tend to turn inward for direction. We do what feels authentic to us. We're guided by our own inner compass, not the winds of the world. This means we may not consider what will bring us more money, a higher status, another car, and a bigger house. Remember, introverts are less motivated by rewards than extroverts. This applies to our careers, too. Often, introverts want their work to speak for itself. This is especially true when we're creating something, such as writing a book building a business, or making art. We may feel uncomfortable monetizing our creations. We make art or publish the blog post because we care deeply about the expression itself. Likewise, we may shrink from marketing our products or services because we loathe being the center of attention. We also want our work to speak for itself in the office or classroom. We rarely toot our own horn and shout, Look at me! We simply want to solve our client's problem thoroughly and quietly. We want to earn an A on the paper, even if no one except the teacher sees the quality of our work. When you find your calling As an introvert, it may not be easy to find your calling, but it can be done. Anne is an introvert who is a special education teacher. She's been teaching in some capacity for close to 40 years, and she believes she's found her calling. I love my students, she tells me. I love the challenge of finding how to support them in their learning. As an introvert, one strength she brings to the job is the ability to dive deep. I will go online or to the library or to a bookstore to find what I need, she says. Being a special education teacher is different than being a classroom teacher because she doesn't have to manage as many students. I get to target individuals or small groups, which is where I feel I am most effective. The days can get long. 
She can handle being on during the school day, but when she has to stay back after school for meetings, that's when she feels it and needs quiet. When I get home, there is no extra noise, not radio, not TV, not the computer, she says. Some days it can get exhausting, so I need to allow time on the weekend to recover, too. If I need to stop for groceries or another errand on the way home, I avoid large stores. Too much sensory overload. Even though the job can be tiring, Anne says there's nothing she'd rather do. It is a stimulating job, she says. I've been working in special education since 2001 and have not looked back. Her advice to fellow introverts looking for their calling? Don't be afraid to change jobs if your current one isn't meeting your needs. Also, use personality assessments and or career inventories to help you identify your strengths. Sometimes you can access a community college to take a preference inventory, she says. I did one in high school and again after I had been in education for a few years. I went back to school at a time when my peers were starting to think about how many years they had until an early retirement. I earned two special education licenses then. Three years after that, I tried graduate school, and a few years after that, I added two more licenses. Right now, I'm licensed in five areas. You can be shy or quiet, but you can still work towards your calling. Tina is the founder of a community for music lovers called The Daily Listening. She identifies her job as her calling because it is pretty much what she saw herself doing when she was a kid. While I had no idea about the role technology would play back then, I knew that I loved music and that I wanted to be closer to it, she tells me. The fact that I've built my career from the ground up really inspires me whenever I look back. I still have a long way to go, but just the notion of working towards a goal that I created on my own is my favorite part. There are a lot of things she loves about her job. Probably the best thing is that she gets to work from home. I don't have to worry about taking NYC's very crowded public transportation in the morning, she says. She also loves that she gets to combine her love for music with writing. Plus, there's that whole making your own rules and controlling your own schedule thing. As an introvert, flexibility is important to her. Her advice to fellow introverts looking for their calling is straightforward. Think about what makes you come alive and go follow it. Six questions to ask yourself to help you find your calling. Still trying to figure out what your life's calling might be? Here are six questions you can ask yourself that can help point you in the right direction. One, what message do you want to share with the world? Each of us has been shaped by a lifetime of experiences, and each of us has a unique message to share with the world. After learning about my introversion, my message became, it's okay to be an introvert. If you could rent a billboard in Times Square for just one day, what would you put on it? In other words, what is the one thing you wish the world knew and understood? Two, how do you want to be remembered when you're gone? No one likes to think about what will happen after they die, but looking at the bigger picture can help you put things in perspective. Let's say you lived a full, rich life, and you are now ready to leave something behind for the ones you love and for society. What would that legacy be? What qualities, ideas, or philosophies would you want others to have when you're gone? In what small or big way would you make the world a better place for others for years or decades to come? Three, what did you want to be when you grew up? What captured your imagination as a child? What careers fascinated you? How did you picture yourself when you daydreamed about your life as an adult? Many of our aspirations were born in childhood. 4. What kinds of tasks don't feel like work to you? Think about your current job or your experiences as a student if you're still in school. There are probably some tasks you do each day that feel like utter drudgery, but there are probably other tasks that don't feel like work at all. These tasks are a cakewalk to complete, and you get compliments from others about them. Build your calling around these energizing tasks. 5. 
What kind of work would you never do again, no matter how much you were paid? Figuring out what is definitely not your calling can help you narrow your options. What kind of work can you just not stand? 6. Who is doing your dream job, and what can you learn from them? Think about the people in your life. Who has a career that you envy? Don't limit yourself to just the people you know. Is there a famous person you have read or heard about who is doing a job you wish you had? Learn from them and the path they took. Do you need a license or a degree to do that job? More skills or certain contacts in the field? Figure out how they got to where they are today. In closing, I've had a lot of jobs in my life. My first job was keeping the showroom clean in a furniture store. I had to dust, vacuum, and worst of all, clean the toilets. Since then, I've worked as a tutor, journalist, editor, marketing assistant, teacher, and now author-slash-publisher. During some of my worst jobs, I went to bed thinking, do I have to get up and do this all over again tomorrow? When you have a job that makes you miserable, it becomes a slow-acting poison. It hurts not only in the moment, but also well after the fact. Because we introverts tend to think and ruminate so much. Jobs that sucked my energy left me with little desire to socialize, or do my cherished introvert hobbies like reading and writing. I was just too drained. The best job advice I can give you is this. Go where you're celebrated, not just tolerated. Does your job make use of your introvert talents? Do you get to do things that play to what you truly excel at? Do your coworkers and supervisors see value in you? Most important, do you feel proud of your work? There is no perfect job out there, and you'll always have to make trade-offs, whatever you do. But if your job leaves you continually exhausted, perhaps it's time to make a change. It's never too late to make positive changes in your life. You might just find that a different job makes other parts of your life better, too.